Hi, Rhonda, it's uh, Shayla again. May I please test the screen sharing? Yes, you may. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is the clerk with a courtesy announcement that this meeting is now being streamed live on the internet. Working well, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Good morning, Alan. Good morning and thank you. You are very welcome. Good morning, Zachary. Good morning, Rhonda. As always, a pleasure to have you here. Hi, Eureka. Hi, good morning. How are you? Wonderful. And yourself? Very good. Thank you. Have a great day. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning, Vice President Ellenberg. Good morning, Rhonda. How are you this morning? Wonderful. How are you? Best day ever. Perfect. Good morning, Supervisor Sumidian. Good morning. Let's do a mic check, Rhonda. I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me loud and clear? I certainly can. Wonderful to hear and see you today. Nice to see you. Any day we can serve the public is the day we're filled with successful enthusiasm for our work, ma'am. So thank you. Absolutely. Good morning, Good. President Wasserman. I almost beat you if I could found my mute button. <laughs> and I was just thinking, oh, every supervisor beat him in. <laughs> go. Good morning, Rhonda. Good morning. Your clerk today is going to be the wonderful Dave Leon. Wonderful. Thank you. Good morning, President Wasserman. How are you? Good morning, Mr. Leon. I'm all right. How about yourself? I'm well, thank you. Uh, looks like we still have a couple more minutes. I'll start the recording momentarily. Thank you. What I can't believe is in the seven day average starting next week, the weather in Las Gatas will be 94 degrees. The average in Morgan Hill will be 101 degrees, Mr. Turner. It's heating up down here, I'll tell you, Supervisor, it, uh, for, for, for numerous reasons. <laughs> yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah, a little more recording warmer. in progress. And Supervisor Smitty, and I'm going to be asking you to lead us in the pledge today. Thank you, sir. That's it.
All right, David, I've got 930. Let's get the show on the road. Good morning, Supervisor Lee. Good morning, me present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank you, David. Thank you. Now, with that, we'll move to item number two on our agenda, which is the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'm asking Supervisor Simidian to lead us in that today. All that can stand, please do so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. We now move on to item number three, which is the invocation. It's my honor today to be able to present our invocator. And I wanna share with everyone that it was 12 years ago, my very first, the very first person who did an invocation that was my choice was Mark Turner. I am, I started my career with Mark and this is my final uh, opportunity to pick an invocator for my career. And so I've chosen Mark to end it as well. Mark is a resident of Morgan Hill where he and his wife have raised their family over the last 30 years. In that time, Mark has been involved in community in the community in various capacities. Over the last seven years, as the director of South County's effort for wreaths across America, Mark raises more than $18,000 each year to place Christmas wreaths on all the graves of veterans buried in Morgan Hill and Gilroy. In Mark's fundraising efforts as a part-time auctioneer, he has helped raise more than $10 million for local organizations. Operation Freedom Pause, Morgan Hill Schools, and Ronald McDonald House, just to name a few. Mark is the president and CEO of the Gilroy Chamber of Commerce. He received the 2020 Chamber Executive Year of the Year Award from the Western Association of Chamber Executives, which is the largest state or regional association of Chambers of Commerce Executives in the United States. Mark is also the chair of Silicon Valley Chamber Coalition, consisting of 18 Chambers of Commerce in and around Silicon Valley. Excuse me while I swerp my dog. Prior to accepting his current role, he was an associate pastor at South Valley Community Church in Gilroy for 12 years, where he combined his talents as a stand-up comedian and inspirational speaker to motivate audiences of all ages. One of the highlights of his 12 years on the staff at SVCC came on May 21st, 2013, when he was invited to deliver the invocation at an opening session of Congress at the Capitol building in Washington, DC. Mark has been married to his wife, Sue, for 39 years. He has three daughters, two sons-in-law, and two grandchildren. Mark, I wanna welcome you as I did 12 years ago. Take it away. Thank you, Supervisor. The last time I did this, we actually were in person and uh, I, I was honored then and I'm honored now. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity. I know I've been, had a chance to interact, I believe with all of the supervisors over the last couple of years. And again, honored to be able to have this opportunity this morning. So with that, uh, let's bow our end. Uh, real quickly, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, I wanted to say how grateful we are to you in South County. You've always been a tremendous advocate and friend of the residents and businesses here. So thank you for that. You. So with that, uh, let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the sacrifice these individuals on the Board of Supervisors uh, that they make uh, that they and that they serve in this elected capacity. As they work through today's agenda, give them wisdom to determine what's right and best. Give them the strength to endure the long hours ahead of them and the understanding of their responsibility to serve their communities. We pray for your hand of protection upon our county's law enforcement officers and fire personnel. May our businesses be prosperous and that in that prosperity, may they be generous in their compassion toward those in need and those who are less fortunate. May each of us be more tolerant toward those whose opinions don't align with our own. And may we do more to build others up rather than tear them down. May our eyes be open to the need of others around us and may we be prompted to respond to those in need. Father, we pray for your continued blessing upon the people, the businesses and the organizations in our county. 
We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Mr. Turner. Um, appreciate that. Appreciate having you as a friend. And uh, please help lead the efforts in Morgan Hill and Gilroy when this heat wave comes, taking care of those who can to try and stay cool. Thank you very much, Mark. All the best. Thank you. With that, we move on to item number four, announce adjournments in memoriam. I'll just say, fortunately, we don't have any today. Commendations and proclamations, also none on today's agenda. With that, we're gonna to turn to public comment. Public comment is the opportunity for anyone to speak about anything they wish that comes under the purview of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. We ask that you register electronically and we will base the time allowed to each speaker based on the number of registrants. So I'll give uh, just a couple, a minute here or so for people to do that. I know we moved through the first part of our agenda rapidly today, so I might have caught a few of you unaware. Again, this is your opportunity to speak about anything not on today's agenda. All right, David, let's give three minutes. We're gonna just waver right there for a minute. Yeah, the number's fluctuating a little bit. Yes, yes it is. Let's give two minutes for each speaker. All right, one moment please while we get the timer up. Thank you. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Good morning to everyone. Thanks for almost making it three minutes for public comment time. Uh, but with two minutes, uh, I guess a first, a, uh, uh, I hope yourselves as, as the County of Santa Clara can prepare for uh, all the mining issues uh, that you're dealing with at this time and, and can really want to take on uh, a more responsible set of practices and, and really learn to invite the public more to the oversight process that I think can be a lot of help at this time. And uh, I hope that with the uh, geriastic site, mining site that's in question and planning right now that uh, uh, green alternative sites can be looked at possibly as a way to solve this issue and uh, keep the land sacred. Uh, good luck in, in, the, in your work on this issue. Uh, I'm not for mining in that area and good luck how to look for alternative sites to still work on your green issues that you're trying to do with such a site. Uh, I wanted to also quickly mention, uh, I think last week I, I, uh, I mentioned the idea, asked the question of what exactly, uh, how your closed session report reporting to the public works. And uh, Supervisor Wasserman nicely explained, uh, there's a certain set of items that you talked about that include uh, worker issues, uh, I guess worker comp issues maybe, uh, and health and human services kind of issues uh, is the kind of things you talk about at closed session. I think there's a real importance that a bit of a, a report out of exactly what were the cases involved needs to be a bit more explained in, to the public. And it's just a, a real important component, how to talk about the closed session process with the public so they can make understanding, uh, understandable good choices. Uh, thanks for your meeting today. Thank you, Blair. Next speaker is Delilah Polito. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hosp hospitals within Santa Clara County, state prisons throughout California, and counties that border Santa Clara County and beyond never put their workers on unpaid leave. Contra Costa and Marin, Marin County lifted the mandate for high-risk workers. The state health orders never included in the mandate unvaccinated workers in non-high-risk environments. But in order for Santa Clara County to target all of the unvaccinated workers, you came up with the risk tier system. You went beyond the state health order by creating this risk tier system and by putting the high risk workers on unpaid leave. The longer you keep treating workers differently and keeping the workers out on unpaid leave, the longer you keep discriminating and violating these workers' um, rights. Thank you. Next speaker is 
AH, I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, supervisors. I just want to um, thank those. I work in the emergency department at Valley Med. Uh, my name is Andrew. I have been on leave since November 1st. Um, and I just wanted to thank um, the supervisors and their representatives that have come through the hospital in the last month or so. And um, I hope that you guys are able to get a better picture of what's going on and hearing input from the staff that are continuing to work and are continuing to work short. Um, I believe we've compiled emails um, from the day-to-day -day emails that we get of the short staffing. Um, like Delilah said, and, and I'm sure you guys are aware, Contra, Car Contra Costa County, Marin County have all dropped any mandates that they had with um, hospitals and pre-hospital. Um, so we're just asking you guys and thanking you guys, uh, especially um, Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Ellenberg and Supervisor Lee to continue to inquire um, about the next steps and, and uh, please get us back to work. Um, I think the morale is getting lower and lower as I talk to my colleagues and uh, it's important uh, to take this next step and move on from this pandemic. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Lilia Jacobo. You have two minutes to speak, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Lilia, um, Senior HSR with Health and Hospital Systems. I'm here to speak on item number 90 and ask that the board remove this item until ESA has properly bargained with SEIU 521 on this matter. This is, this is work that our SEIU 521 members provide in our county. This amendment has never been notified properly to SEIU 521, and we have demanded to meet and confer as of August 28th 2022 when we saw this on the BOS agenda. ESA continues to, purpose, to purposefully avoid to properly notice us of an item that impacts our bargaining unit members. The continued contracting out of work across our county is increasing exponentially and ESA continues to mislead this board on matters that impact our county financially and with our bargaining unit work. We asked the board to remove this item off the agenda until such time that the county has respected our contract and bargaining, bargaining this item with us. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Christina. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name's Christina. Um, one of the nurses I also work with Andrew and the ER at Valley Med. And um, I just wanted to point out that everything he said is um, totally true. We're so understaffed that in the ER, I mean, we're getting emails sent every single day for every single shift. And we just need to have our nurses back, the unvaccinated nurses back um, working with us side by side. Um, at this point, it's been, you know, two years. <clears throat> and uh, even right now, the, the volunteer, or not the volunteers, the visitors are allowed to come in to the ER and the hospital with just a negative PCR test. So I'm just so wondering why um, we're not allowed to have our nurses with you know over 15 to 20 years of experience back working with us. Um, we need them. Um, our morale is very low. If you ask any staff member in the last 20 years, this is probably the lowest morale we've ever had. Um, we're all burnt out and we just need to have our nurses back. So. Um, Thanks for your time. Thanks for listening. And I hope you reconsider to align with the state and have those unvaccinated nurses come back and work with us. Thank you. Next speaker is Alan Kamara. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning, Board of Supervisor. This is Alan Kamara. I also work in the ER and I'm one of the board members of the Registered Nurses Union. Um, on top of what uh, Christina and Andrew have stated, um, we want to thank the board of supervisors who have come around just to visit and listen and hear our nurses concern. And Marine County and um, Contra Costa have already lifted the health mandate. This is affecting the community. Um, I'm in meeting with the firefighters as well. They are stretched thin. Um, so this is becoming a public health safety when you have a county as busy as our county is and we are understaffed and we can use the help 
of the unvaccine, allow them to come back. We are even willing to have them be tested regularly. So it would take the liability on the county just so we can staff the hospitals, staff the firefighter engine, staff the ambulances. I think this is about time now that you, you reconsider. The other thing I want to thank is I want to thank Supervisor Ellenbaugh for orderly for the items that are coming to address the mental health crisis in our county. We do not have inpatient mental, um, mental psych beds to accommodate uh, these mental issues. If Santa Clara have declared the mental health and drug abuse as a public health safety issue, we should address it. And Supervisor Samedian, thank you for pushing for making sure that we have the site building built. So these days we do not even have a contractor assigned to build this. This is not right. Um, so we wanna thank you, we wanna encourage you to push. This is becoming an issue and thank you all. Um, and we hope we can see a result soon. Thank you. Next speaker is Teresa. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. go ahead. Okay. Um, oh boy, some people left. Okay. So I just wanted to bring attention. I, we have been listening to the board meetings, I think since January, mm -hmm. and I've been listening to the public share their concerns and sharing even data from FOIA reports and some um, other information they've re gathered and received regarding, um, you know, the COVID-19 shots and, and side effects. And I don't see the members of this board addressing any of the adverse reactions. And I know that in January or February we had, or maybe March it was, somebody had mentioned about the Pfizer report. And I was just wondering if anybody who on the board actually read the report, the Pfizer report showing the adverse reactions. Can I see your hands who read it? Okay, for the record, nobody raised their hands. This is so sad to me because I am seeing firsthand um, within my, our family and extended family people passing away from this vaccine, from cardiac arrest, from myocarditis and some other issues. I also understand that those who have been vaccinated are highly more are, are more likely to continue getting COVID versus the unvaccinated. And so I don't understand what is going on with this board. I cannot trust the information that Sarah Cody and Jeff Smith bring forward. It, I don't know where they're getting this data. My daughter-in-law went to emergency and they had asked her um, if she had been COVID vaccinated. When she said no, they said good because we've noticed a 30% increase in hospital visits for those who have gotten the COVID-19 vaccines in particular heart issues and respiratory issues. This is a- Next speaker is Ruth. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Ruth and I'm an ER nurse at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. And I'm here to help uh, me to yeah, let our nurses come back. Noise, Ruth. There you go, continue Ruth. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So yes, I'm an ER nurse at Valley Medical Center. Uh, we've been working day in and out, burnt out, super busy and super short staff daily. And we really need our nurses back. Um, the county needs to align with the rest of the county. Why is it that they're still not? So many questions that are not answered. I do appreciate the support of the Board of Supervisors coming in and talking to us, but we need staff. We need our relief. If the county wants better care, they need to take care of us. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Next speaker is Sharon Luna. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Supervisor Wasserman, I would like to thank you first for all the uh, items and help that you've given to the San Martin community over the years. I, for one, really appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. 
My name again is Sharon Luna from San Martin, and I am a member of the San Martin Neighborhood Association. I have a story to tell, and I hope you will assist. I and others, since receiving an email from the Regional Water Board, asked um, asking Olin Flair Company to dig deeper in other areas of San Martin due to perchlorite issues, had our wells tested. We received a call from, by law from Valley Water that we are 2% higher in nitrates than the state, say, the state says is safe. I recognize that when I moved into the area that nitrates would be an issue. I asked, where is the perchlorite percentage? And was told by Valley Water Rep, unfortunately, they are instructed not to do this. I would need to pay. I was dumbfounded. The spillage was done by a company called Olin Flare Company. Valley Water received a settlement. We have still have two residents 20 years later being supplied water. There has been absolutely no follow-ups with residents over the years. Why is this? Thyroid issues are real. San Martin has requested, as I mentioned, follow-ups and testing. And this is a hundred year problem. You have 80 years to go. This is a prime example of words used today of racial, social, and environmental injustice. Please, I ask you to put this on next month's agenda. And also on March 22nd, 2022, the EPA will not recognizing um, has $11 billion for perchlorate issues. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Jimmy. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jimmy Lopez. I'm an ED nurse at Valley Medical Center. So we have some problems with short staffing. Uh, on night shift, I think the average experience is two to three years. Unfortunately, that doesn't make it very safe for our patients. And for a lot of our patients, we worry that they're not getting the care that they need. And uh, if you would allow our unvaccinated nurses to come back, it would actually help us to get that experience back into the department. So I'm here to plead on their behalf that you guys really look into the situation with Jeff Smith, align with the state, and get our nurses back. Thank you. The next speaker is Craig Harmon. Craig, I'm unmuting you. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Craig Harmon, and I'm a rehabilitation officer with the Custody Bureau of the Sheriff's Office. I'm here to speak about item 69 on today's agenda. Uh, the ESA submitted at the last board meeting for your second approval a salary alignment for sheriff deputies, which I believe is misleading to you as elected board members. We have merit system rules, contract language in our agreement for APT members, as well as the salary schedule, which guide how salaries are aligned with certain classifications. My position is one of the classifications tied to DSA salaries, and I do believe the ESA is misleading you by titling it as a differential when it is, in fact, based upon a salary study. This tactic is meant, in my opinion, to shirk the intention of the rules adopted by this county, and we are being denied and informal to try to resolve this matter, forcing us to file a group grievance. Lastly, uh, I and my coworkers stand in solidarity, <clears throat> EAIA, and ask that you direct ESA to respect our contract. Thank you. Thank you. And just, uh, Craig, just so you know, you spoke on item 69, which is on the agenda. So you won't be able to speak on item 69 when we get to consent in a little while. Thank you. The next speaker is Jessica Cuevas. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Jessica Cuevas and I'm currently a correctional cook at Elmwood Correctional Facility. The cook reclass already com was completed, but the impact of the reclass is not being resolved. During reclass, HR said it's not their responsibility to address the impact. We were told that this would be addressed through the side letters. As of now, nothing has been done and we previous cook twos are suffering. The department and the CSAs are not meeting with us to address the side letter. Working at Elmwood, I am still obligated to run the floor as if there is, as if I'm still the lead. All the other cooks are 
put on the same platform that we are, they're getting the same pay, but the cook twos didn't get anything in return. We're asking for ESA to respect us as the cook twos, even though our reclass, we reclass as cooks because our knowledge and our abilities are still being utilized as if we are leads to give us the seniority that we're asking for and address the lead pay. The department's requiring us to, like I said, to still act as if we are the leads, but we don't get anything in return. We're just asking for the respect that we deserve. We took tests to get into this position. We bid, we have the knowledge that most of the other cooks in our department don't have in order to do the lead position still. And yet we're looked as lesser than everybody else. We're just asking for ESA and our departments to finally work with the union and our staff to uh, work on these side letters. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Catherine Hedges. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Um, good morning, supervisors. Um, right now, I'm not speaking on behalf of Surge. I am speaking on behalf of the tenants in my apartment building. Um, I'd like to know why the you know the manager of building says that the county told him it is illegal to require contractors to wear masks in the tenants' buildings if someone comes out from pest control or a plumbing company or something and the tenants have to accept unmasked contractors coming into their buildings as well as unmasked staff of the build company. I've tried to confirm or deny this with public health. All I get is a run around and saying that you don't have to wear a mask in your apartment. Well, yeah, I know I don't have to wear a mask in my own apartment, but I am I would like people who come in my apartment to wear masks if I don't know them and they've been in everybody else's home and possibly catching COVID. We know that people are contagious before they have symptoms. So they could be spreading COVID in everybody's apartments and not know it. And, and the County Public Health Department will not confirm or deny if it's really illegal to prohibit someone from wearing a mask, the way our landlord says. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Karina Navarro. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Karina, are you there? I'm gonna ask you to unmute one more time. Hi, yes, I'm sorry. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. go ahead. Okay, hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Board of Supervisors, for taking the time to listen to us. My name is Karina Navarro. I've been a registered nurse in the emergency department at Valley Medical Center since 2003. Um, I just want to bring it to your attention that we are in severe distress in the emergency department. Um, we are constantly understaffed and we really need to bring back our unvaccinated nurses. Um, I want to bring it to your attention that I feel that the community, the community, including all of you on the board and everyone listening, is at risk. I feel that the community is in danger because we are short staffed, missing our most valuable experienced nurses in the department. I'm not sure if you all clearly understand what that means. The nurses that are missing in the department are charge nurses. They are trauma nurses. They are nurses that are trained to take care of a patient having a massive heart attack. Nurses that are trained to take care of patients that are having a massive stroke. I'm not sure if you understand that the staffing we have in the department right now does not equate to experienced nurses. If any of you come into the hospital after a car accident, getting hit when you're riding your bicycle, have a child that's near drowning, anything that would require trauma care, you're gonna be brought to our hospital, which is probably the cl closest in the vicinity for many of you. And the care that you're gonna receive is not the same as it would have been if it were staffed with our experienced nurses that are out on leave. So I'm, I, I feel that it's, the, the community is in danger and we need to bring those nurses back. The nurses that are there in the department working are few and far between that have experience that are able to take the most best care of those patients so that those patients have the best outcome. I myself would not want to go to the emergency department where I work and receive care and that has changed. I would have been the first in line to bring a loved one to that hospital to that emergency department because I and next speaker, David, excuse yes. me, David. Karina was our 15th speaker and people keep getting on, which I appreciate. Um, but as far as the numbers go, 
that's not what we originally uh, planned on. So after this speaker, please change the timers to one minute for uh, future speakers. Okay, we'll let the speaker go for two minutes. Is that correct? And then change it? Yes, okay. yes, it is. Thank you. Next speaker is Paula Maddox. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Paula Maddox, and I wanted to know what Santa Clara County's plan on ending COVID-19 vaccine mandates. No one in this county in the health department discusses this. Does this not make sense when Contra Costa County and Marin County just ended their vaccine mandates just recently? What is our plan? We need the first responders back. We need everyone at the hospitals, unvaccinated, vaccinated. We need everybody to work together to keep the community safe. CDC also had changed their guidelines two weeks ago. Why are we not listening and are following this? It's time Santa Clara County take action, follow in the footsteps of these other counties, hire employees back to their positions, end the vaccine mandates. Otherwise, we could be facing as a county lawsuits because people now have a right to say, hey, we're not following what we should be listening and doing. So I just want to say thank you, but we need to end the discrimination and keep looking at the science, as people say, but we need to look at the medical as well, keep people safe, but also move forward. Vaccine mandates is no longer necessary. Thank you. Right, one moment, please, while we change the timer to one minute. The next speaker is an email address ending in gmail.com. I believe the name is Jorge. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Jorge, Jorge. are you there? Go ahead. Yes. Oh, he hasn't unmuted yet. We'll ask to unmute one more time. Then we can come back. Yeah, they're not responding. Um, we'll ask you to raise your hand again. Next speaker is Marco Terral. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Marco, I'm going to ask you to unmute one more time. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Hello. Okay, hi. On August 16th, um, in the board supervisor's meeting, Supervisor Ellenberg and Chavez, and, and Chavez voiced their concern that the employees on admin leave had gone on for too long during Jeff Smith's executive uh, report. I, I could also see their disbelief to Dr. Smith's reasons for still continuing to, to insist on the bogus three tier system, three tier system. He said patients in the hospital need to be protected, but can you guys confirm that the vaccine is being offered to uh, patients? Also, he also said that inmates in the jails are against their, against their will, but they're, and they must be protected, but inmates are being offered the vaccine and boosters. I can understand that the vaccine wasn't being offered to them in placing his three tier system, but they have been offered the vaccine. And I encourage you both to ask Dr. Smith what the percentage of the vaccinated and unvaccinated population of inmates in the county and in the hospitals. Also, um, Dr. Smith, also uh, on August 18th, Dr. Sarah Cody was deposed by the Calvary Chapel. Next speaker is Chris. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, I just tuned into this uh, into this session just a few minutes ago. And when I'm hearing uh, professionals from the largest health care facility in the county, right, uh, county facility health care, uh, being concerned about their ability to provide essential life safety services to the broader community because of understaffing levels and uh, uh, that being caused by the county's position on uh, not allowing unvaccinated workers back into the hospital. That raises serious questions to me as to the county's own ability to provide these services and now possibly being on the wrong side of the COVID vaccination scenario, if people's lives are put at stake because the county refuses to reemploy unvaccinated workers, that's bad. We're gonna go back to Jorge. We'll try one more time. I'm unmuting you. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. 
Jorge, are you there? Um, okay, they are not unmuting. <clears throat> we'll go to the next person. Next speaker is Jennifer Hughes. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Jennifer Hughes. I'm a psychiatric nurse at Barbara Aaron's Pavilion. Um, I'm speaking on agenda item 26, the county's response of the declared mental health crisis. Um, I, I highly support the memo by Supervisor Ellenberg and Supervisor Lee concerning the pace and the progress of the county system and addressing the gaps. Um, I, you know, again, I'm a nurse working firsthand at VMC in the inpatient psych unit. And over the last couple of years, we have just, there's no places for our patients to go. So the discharging has been almost halted. So it's, it's a huge crisis. And when I read in a report that just since January 11th of this year, 106 people in our county have died by suicide, it's tragic. So um, I just implore Dr. Smith to please accelerate the action and, and activate any tools or resources necessary in the county to scale up our response to the county system and scale up our response to the capacity. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And David, before you go to our next speaker, uh, Jennifer, thank you for speaking on number 26. This is public comment about any items not on today's agenda. So Jennifer, you won't be able to speak on number 26. Anyone wishing to speak on an item on the agenda, please wait for that number to come up. Uh, anybody else, you're welcome to speak. Go ahead, David. Thank you. Next speaker is Isaac P. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Isaac, are you there? Hello? Go ahead, Isaac. Um, hi, I was planning on speaking on the uh, staff that had been let go due to the vaccination. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, that this is this has been a real sham, a real shame for the county um, that that the are so many of our staff have been like, oh, I personally was let go for two months, and now we're coming back around to find out that everybody is under the same vaccination status. I really think that, that the this should be something that leads Dr. Smith, Dr. Cody, and and uh, and Councilmember uh, Chavez all together because you guys have allowed this to go on and to continue to go on. Some of my fellow coworkers should have been already allowed to be, come back to work already. And the way that it's destroyed people's lives, it should be destroying Dr. Smith and Dr. Cody's lives that same way. I think that they don't want to take responsibility and accept the new CDC guidelines because they're too cowardly to, to acknowledge that they really blew it this time. And uh, that Dr. Frail, Mr. Mr. Frail Smith and, and Cody, the tyrant should be let go. Thank you. And we're going to try one more time with Jorge. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, go yes. ahead. Hi, my name is Jorge Alvarez. Good morning. Um, I am a father and a husband or wife. My, I have a wife, excuse me, sorry about that. Um, I work for FAF. I am one of the three roofers for Santa Clara County. Um, I have been working during the pandemic the whole time. I was put on administrative leave um, and without, oh, I did not get the vaccine. Half of the time, or not half, 99.9% .9 of the time, I work alone on the roof. Why I was put on a high risk is, doesn't make, I'm trying to figure with that one out. Um, I didn't come in contact with anybody. If throughout the day, at my eight hour shift, I would have maybe 20 minutes, maybe 10 in the morning, 10 after when I would do my time card. Other than that, I was always work, I always worked alone. And my access was always private. I always had a private access. And that concludes our public speakers. Thank you very much, James. We're now gonna move on to item number seven, approval of the consent calendar and change to the Board of Supervisors. Dave, if you'll please read the 14 requests already made on the consent calendar uh, update, which is a public document. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg and Supervisor Chavez to consider item numbers 10, 11, and 26 concurrently. Item number 10 is to receive a follow-up report on mental health and substance abuse, substance use as a public health crisis. Item number 11 is to receive a report from the Office of the County Executive relating to financial resources for expanding behavioral health system capacity. And item number 26 is to receive a report relating to use of the Don Lowe Pavilion and Barbara Aarons Pavilion on the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center Baskin Campus. 
We have a request from President Wasserman to add item number 12 to the consent calendar. Item number 12 is to approve a referral to administration, including input from County Council, the Chief Information Officer, the Chief Information Security Officer, and the Chief Privacy Officer to report to the board on October 18th, 2022, with options for consideration relating to the creation or acquisition of a unified, managed, auditable county information technology system that would allow constituents to securely submit digital files and other information to county departments, including information on best practices regarding the acquisition, implementation, and ongoing maintenance of such a system, and an estimate of associated costs. We have a request from President Wasserman, Vice President Ellenberg, and Supervisor Lee to add item number 13 to the consent calendar. Item number 13 is to approve county sponsorship of Healthier Kids Foundation in the amount of $1,000 from the Supervisorial District 1 allocation to support their annual fundraising dinner. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg and Supervisor Lee to add item numbers 14, 15, 16, and 17 to the consent calendar. Item number 14 is to approve county sponsorship of Little Italy San Jose in the amount of $2,500 from the Supervisorial District 2 allocation to support the 2022 Little Italy San Jose Street Festival. Item number 15 is to approve county sponsorship of the Next Door Solutions to Select Domestic Violence in the amount of $2,500 from the Supervisorial District 2 allocation in the Office of the Clerk of the Board Fiscal Year 2022-2023 Budget to support the Light of the Night Remembrance event. Item number 16 is to consider recommendations relating to sponsorship of the Vovinam Viet Do Dao America in the amount of $1,000 from the Supervisorial <clears throat> District 2 allocation to support the 31st Children's Moon Festival. Item number 17 is to approve county sponsorship of Somos Mayfair in the amount of $2,500 from the Supervisorial District 2 allocation to support the Gracias a la Vida 25th Annual Gala and Fundraiser. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to add item numbers 18, 19, and 20 to the consent calendar. Item number 18 is to approve county sponsorship of South Asian Cultural Association of Sunnyvale in the amount of $1,000 from the Supervisorial District 3 allocation to support the 2022 Sunnyvale Diwali celebration. Item number 19 is to consider recommendations relating to sponsorship of the Vovinam Viet Vo Dao America in the amount of $2,500 from the Supervisorial District 3 allocation to support the 31st Children's Moon Festival. Item number 20 is to approve county sponsorship of Sunny Hills Neighborhood Association in the amount of $500 from the Supervisorial District 3 allocation to support the annual Halloween celebration. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg and Supervisor Lee to add item number 21 to the consent calendar. Item number 21 is to approve county sponsorship of Los Altos Mountain View Community Foundation in the amount of $5,000 from the Supervisorial District 5 allocation to support the 10th anniversary of Compassion Week, October 17th through 23rd, 2022. We have a request from Supervisor Simidian to consider item numbers 25A and 25B separately. Item number 25 is to consider recommendations relating to workplace mental health and wellness and safety of the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center Enterprise. With possible action A, receive report relating to public safety officers training and the county response to workplace violence, including recommendations from the Workplace Violence Prevention Task Force. Possible action B, receive report relating to support resources for the mental health and well being of the healthcare workforce. We have a request from Supervisor Lee to consider item numbers 27 and 28 concurrently. Item number 27 is to receive a report relating to recommendations to strengthen compliance and enforcement of local regulations on the sale of tobacco and vape products and options to monitor and enforce state laws regulating online sales of tobacco and vape products in Santa Clara County. Item number 28 is the adoption of ordinance number NS-517.96, amending certain sections of chapter 22 of division B11 of the Santa Clara County Ordinance Code relating to enforcement and penalties for violations of tobacco retail requirements and prohibitions. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to add item number 29 to the consent calendar. Item number 29 is to receive a report relating to county and regional actions regarding infant formula shortage. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to hold item number 31 to September 13th, 2022. Item number 31 is to receive a report relating to the implementation of a Board of Supervisors constituent relationship management system and associated timelines, staffing needs, costs, and funding sources. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to consider item numbers 35 and 36 concurrently. Item number 35 is adoption of ordinance number NS-300.964, repealing division A16 of the County of Santa Clara Ordinance Code relating to information practices and individual privacy and repealing, repealing division B4 relating to privacy of financial information and adding new division A16 of the County of Santa Clara Ordinance Code relating to privacy protections. 
Item number 36 is to adopt a board policy resolution adding Board of Supervisors policy, policy manual section 3.73 relating to policy on the County Privacy Office. We have a request from administration to hold item number 37 to November 1st, 2022. Item number 37 is to receive a report relating to options for improving mental health parity for county residents. We have a request from administration to hold item number 38 to date uncertain. Item number 38 is to receive a report relating to salaries for advocates for survivors of gender-based violence. And finally, we have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to hold item number 73 to date uncertain. Item number 73 is to consider recommendations relating to the adoption of a convention of elimination of all forms of discrimination against women ordinance. That concludes the consent calendar update, and there is also um, oh, I, I, an oral summary I need to read into the record when you're ready. Oh, please go ahead. Okay. This is an oral summary of the uh, changes to compensation or benefits for certain local agency executives. Pursuant to Government Code Section 54953, the following is an oral summary of the proposed salary adjustments that are required to be disclosed. NS-20.22.01 and NS-20.22.02 were approved on first reading on August 16, 2000, 2022, but will not be finally approved until they are approved for a second reading, which is agendized to occur at today's meeting. NS-20.22.01, which is item number 135, increases the salary of the assessor, district attorney, and sheriff by 1.8%. NS-20.22.02, which is item number 136, provides that the chief operating officer, when appointed acting county executive, shall be compensated at a rate 10% above the employee's current rate of pay, and all other benefits associated with the county executive position shall be afforded to the acting county executive throughout the duration of the acting appointment. And that concludes my list. Thank you very much, David. And before we turn to the couple of speakers, I'll remind anybody wishing to speak, this is an opportunity to speak about any of the items on today's consent calendar. With that, I'm turning to Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. I do see that there's one issue that was mentioned earlier at public comment regarding item 90 uh, on the uh, uh, potential um, uh, item to do the agreement uh, on the sustainable landscaping maintenance. I'm going to check with the um, uh, administration. Uh, is there a problem if we hold this item for at least till the next meeting for some further discussion? Jeff. No, there's no problem holding it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Smith. And that, that's the case, uh, President Bossman, I would like to ask to hold this item to the next meeting, please, item 90. So we will add that as an item to the consent calendar. Is there a second for that request? Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Anything else, Supervisor Lee? Nope, that's all I have. Thank you. All right, now I'll turn to Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, um, colleagues. What I'd like to recommend is that item 30, this is the cost of gun violence report, be um, put on consent. It's an excellent report. And um, at, this was the report that when I made this referral in 2019, that I was really looking for. And colleagues, I know we're challenged every time we learn about a, a gun death, and especially when we experience mass shootings like we did with Gilroy and BTA. And so this kind of report demonstrates that we have an opportunity to do something about it, both in saving, uh, you know, obviously millions and millions of dollars and also human anguish. The recommendations provided by the administration along with the work plan give us very clear next steps and in particular, the creation of the task force. What I would like to ask the staff is to come back to us in October if there are any items that, uh, that are prioritized that will require additional funding so that we can both understand that for mid-year, but also for the uh, uh, upcoming budget, as I believe this is a priority. Um, and again, thanks to Rhonda McClinton-Brown and Dr. Cody. Um, with item, 33, this is the, um, the re rebid of the jails. I want to just say that I, I would like to put this on consent with an affirmation that no further action will be taken on this item prior to the um, prioritization setting session for capital programming. If so, then I'd like to leave it on consent. I'm sorry, Supervisor, you said item 33? That's you correct. To, add to consent? Correct. 
Okay, I have a statement to make about that before we take that vote. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, just a few more things. Thank you for your patience. Regarding items 67, 68, 76, and 78, I'd like to keep these items on consent. Um, these have to do with the expansion of our Office of Reentry Services. And I would like to request that a report at the October 19th Reentry Network come with the following information, the implications of the expansion, expected outcomes, and impacts on client and service providers. Uh, just two more. Supervisor Wasserman, President Wasserman. On item 73, these are recommendations relating to the adoption of the CEDA ordinance that Supervisor Ellenberg requested for a date uncertain. I'd like to request that in, a, in addition to that, we also refer to the, the Children's Family Seniors Committee for discussion in September prior to the consideration for the full board. And colleagues, this item was brought to us in February per the request of the Commission on the Status of Women we heard it again um, at the committee in June and directed council to report to the committee in September with the draft of the ordinance. Today's ledge file from council states that the referral to the county council to draft an ordinance must come from the board and not a policy committee. And therefore I'm requesting the board direction to refer this discussion to children's family seniors in September and to direct council to include a draft of the amended ordinance as they're recommending in their ledge file, only so that we can take a deeper dive in committee before it comes back to the full board. Um, and then my, here's my last one. Um, on items um, 83 through 89, I really wanna just acknowledge the work of Consuelo and Key and all the amazing staff who are working on the multiple items on today's agenda that really focus on supportive services to families and, and individuals who we've been able to house. These services are the cornerstone of the overall approach to housing first for these very high need um, individuals. And I know the supportive services are why we are able to keep so many people housed on time. I mean, for an extended period of time. And I, I know all of you know that this is really a, a life and death situation for folks that are unhoused. Um, the study was focused, you know, just anyway, I, I just wanted to say how really, um, really, really important I think this work was. And to pull out that this particular study found that for people who become homeless at the age of 50 or later, about 60% are more likely to die than those who became homeless earlier in life. But obviously being homeless is a risk for everyone. And so I, I just wanna say thank you to my colleagues for continuing to support the work and also to Key and Consuelo. Thank Anything you. further, Supervisor? No. And Dave, as we progress through here, the requests so far, besides those items being held, are to add 30 and 33 on the consent. Do you concur? I do concur. And we also have a request to hold item 90 from Supervisor Lee. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Ellenberg, your comments. Thank you very much, President Wasserman. Uh, first, item 70A notices my planned travel to Sacramento, but I'm not actually making that trip later this week. So I would ask that this item be deleted, please. Understood. On item 29, the response to the infant formula uh, shortage, happy to keep it on consent, um, but I'd, I'd really like to acknowledge our new chief children's officer, Sarah Duffy. The establishment of the Office of Children and Family Policy has been a high priority for me and for Supervisor Chavez, and I'm very glad to see our chief children's officer here and reporting on her work. The infant formula shortage, as an example of an issue cutting across multiple county departments, as well as uh, in collaboration with our external partners, and why having dedicated senior staff to support this type of coordination is really essential. I greatly appreciate the urgent response of local agencies in responding to this crisis, especially the leadership of First Five in activating the family resource centers as distribution hubs and the city of San Jose for allocating funding to meet the need. The distribution of over 9,000 cans of formula uh, by WIC and largely by First Five in less than three months is, is pretty astounding. Um, so just thank you very much to all of our partners and to county staff for that effort. Uh, next, I support the addition of uh, items. Sorry. It's Mike's dog, Susan. Oh, <laughs> I support the addition of, of item 30 on the gun study to the consent agenda. I want to thank staff for the very thorough report and for incorporating my direction in May. 
I'm looking forward to the future report on implementation strategies and how my office and our contacts with our neighborhoods and neighborhood associations can support this work. So please be in touch with us. Also glad to support the addition of item 33 on the, the jail uh, on consent. Uh, and just want to um, echo and emphasize uh, Supervisor Chavez's point that the solicitation process uh, should not begin before the board capital project uh, prioritization discussion happens. I'd also like to direct that updates on the mental health facilities not be included in future jail facility reports as those conversations are being developed in a separate report and that the county please refer to the new project as the new jail replacement facility so as not to conflate the jail with behavioral health uh, facility. On item 69, which is the differential pay uh, for CPOA, thank you to ESA for, for bringing it forward. Uh, while I, I certainly do not want to hold up an increase in pay for any employee group, and I will approve today, I, I, want, I am concerned about the broad use of differentials here. At the previous board meeting, we passed an item very similar to this one, which was a 10% differential pay increase for employees represented by the Deputy Sheriff's Association to perform patrol and administrative duties. What I didn't understand at that time is that there are negotiated salary ties between the Deputy Sheriff job code and six other jobs at the county, and the employees in those linked job codes are ineligible to receive the 10% increase because it's a differential and not a base salary adjustment. My understanding is that the item today is similar, but doesn't have any linked jobs. Um, again, I'm going to approve the item today to avoid any delays in increased compensation, uh, but I really wanted to sunshine my concern about the use of differentials because they they really circumvent labor negotiations um, and, and have the potential, if not the reality, to erode trust uh, with our labor partners. I want to request that an off-agenda report come back to the board within two weeks that addresses two questions. First, are the differentials in item 16 from this agenda and the similar item 141 from the last agenda designed to be temporary stopgap measures while we go through the process to implement permanent salary raises or are they designed to be permanent? And two, how are these responsibilities described in the ledge files substantially different from the regular duties of the job? So thank you for clarification and transparency there. Um, Dr. Smith, did you want to respond specifically to that item or do you want to wait until I go through um, the rest of my changes? Dr. Smith? Um, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we'll bring that memo back in closed session because it is negotiations. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Th thank you very much. Uh, on item 72, the quarterly COVID recovery report, uh, I'm glad to keep this on consent with, with a comment. At the June 7th meeting, I recommended shifting these reports to FGOC to streamline reporting, and that plan is reflected by administration in this ledge file. Thank you. I'm comfortable with keeping to a quarterly cycle of reports at FGOC, but I want to be sure that the reports continue to make connections between the financial recovery, community stakeholder engagement activities, and operational issues in the ongoing county response, such as scaling up or down of staffing levels, to see the connections between these response and recovery activities, as was done, I thought, really well for the June 7th report. Uh, I'm also looking forward to a discussion of the audit of the COVID financial recovery uh, coming to FGOC and then to the, the full board thereafter. Item, just a couple more. Item on item 73, um, I support Supervisor Chavez's uh, direction on the, the CDA ordinance going to CFSC. Um, and I want to request that when the report comes back, that County Council recommends a mechanism to formally incorporate the principles of CDA at the county. If Council's advice continues to be that CDA implementation should not be affected through an ordinance change, then please provide a recommendation regarding how the board can implement the CDOT principles through some other mechanism, such as a resolution or a board policy, and provide the technical mechanism, please, for CFSC to recommend that, um, that 
that format to the full board uh, for consideration and approval. Uh, and while, uh, of course, I understand that commissions are advisory and don't provide oversight, it is not clear to me that we have really truly encoded in our, in our county ordinances that gender parity uh, be studied on an ongoing or a regular basis. Uh, it is true that there's been significant work on gender parity within our public safety and justice systems. But in terms of equal pay, having a dashboard and doing a one-time engagement with a contractor doesn't, doesn't to me equate with regular and ongoing pay equity analysis. So I'd like to request that the report back include analysis of costs for staff and contractors to perform regular and ongoing pay equity analysis. And finally, I would like to abstain on item 135. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Leone, you certainly grabbed the uh, short straw for the uh, clerk for the consent calendar. <laughs> Supervisor Simidian, you're muted, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a couple of items, and then what I'd like to do, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, is have one more opportunity to uh, weigh in after we've heard from the public. But my initial reactions are as follows. Um, pleased to see my colleagues comfortable with uh, my referral on item number 12 uh, to just simply put it on consent. Uh, fine with that, happy, thank you all, good. I think um, the one thing I would just say uh, so it doesn't get lost in a very uh, crowded agenda today is that um it, you know the goal here of course is to uh identify a technology that would allow our constituents to uh submit digital files and other information to county departments in a secure fashion so we're not having confidential information personal uh, information uh simply uh, tossed online um and i think uh, I would just ask, and that's all it is, is an ask as staff is addressing this uh, direction from the board, assuming it passes in a minute on consent, that staff be mindful of the multiplicity of departments, uh, offices, and agencies in our county. It's always one of the challenges that we have such a wide-ranging portfolio, largely decentralized, and I just want to ask staff to sort of give that some thought as they're thinking about a system, one system, presumably, maybe more, that would uh, actually get the job done. Also want to ask staff to think about the fact that, um, as in so many other arenas, the pandemic has uh, generated change in the way we do business. And uh, people may be um, relying more and more on submitting the information uh, digitally rather than showing up at a county building, 70 West Heading Street in particular, but there are others. Um, so I want to ask staff to be sort of mindful of that as they're uh, looking at the response to item number 12 and uh, also changing patterns of transportation. Uh, I think, you know, more and more people are going to say, I want to do it digitally. I don't want to drive from Morgan Hill or Gilroy up to 70 West Heading Street just to turn over a piece of paper. So um, thank you for the consent calendar uh, status. I uh, wanted to make sure those items were uh, part of the deliberation by uh, our staff. And I appreciate the shout out from your dog supervisor. Uh, walk a minute in support of the item. Uh, on item 93, speaking of shout outs, uh, this uh, is an issue dealing with uh, mining practices here in our county. And I just, it's on consent, but I didn't want to let it go by without giving a shout out to Supervisor Lee for bringing this to us in the first place. Um, thank you. I, and then I wanted to give a shout out to staff, including County Council. I thought the response on this one to the initial referral was um, very well uh, done and, and thoughtful. And so just wanted to say so. Um, similarly, but with a twist on item 109, which deals with our banking relationship, in particular with Wells Fargo, uh, I, all, I'm good to go with that. But um, boy, has this been a lot of work over a long time. This seems like a conversation we continue to have. So uh, I understand the need for the action, but if we could uh, try and wrap this up uh, sooner rather than later, that would be um, desirable. And I too will be an abstention on item 135. And then, as I said, I'd like to hear from the public before I uh, weigh in on any other items. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, appreciate that. 
Thank you, Supervisor Committee. And, and Peach's first barking was she had wanted to be Chief Children's Officer. Okay. She thought that was a great title. Uh, Supervisor Chavez, your hand is raised. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to add for item 33, this is the TSS constituent management system. I would be interested in having that come back in November. I want to give staff time to do a little more research. I'm sorry, you're asking for 33 not to go into consent? 30, 31. 31, thank you. I misheard you. No problem. Let me just, just have that come back to November, in November. Not September 13th. Correct. Okay. Hold till November. David, did you get that? Yes, sir. We'll make a note of that in the minutes. All right. Thank you. Supervisor Smitting, your hand is still raised. Coming down, sir. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is still raised. Supervisor Lee, did you wish to speak? Uh, yes, actually, I do. Uh, on, Please, go uh, ahead. Item yes, thank you. Uh, on item number 31, uh, I just heard uh, Supervisor Chavez is trying to get it back uh, on November. Uh, I would ask if she might be amenable. We try to do in October because of the holidays and whatnot. I think by getting it a little sooner might might be good and not run into the holidays if that is possible. Supervisor Lee, I, I think it's fine. I, I had asked staff to um, do some follow up with all the offices and I believe they won't be able to complete it in October, but would be able to bring it back to the first office in November, I mean, first meeting in November. See, would you be amenable? We just do the second meeting of October and see where it's at. If, it's, if they still need more time, then we'll see in November. I just want to kind of keep it. Yes, that makes sense. Thank That's you, okay. Supervisor. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're muted, Mr. Thank President. You, super. Yep, thank you very much. I wish I could mute my dogs right now. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> now we're going to turn to the public. Two minutes each, David. All right, one moment, please, while we get the timer up. Thank you. And for those wishing to speak, this is about items on our consent calendar. And we're setting the timer for two minutes. Thank you. The next speaker is Irvish. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much to Board of Supervisors, as well as the, all the respective council staff. I wanted to emphasize on the efforts that have been put across uh, by the entire Board of Supervisors uh, for the ceremonial presentation, all the way ranging from public, uh, addressing the public issues, board rappels, board, as well as the appointments and the number of items that is being, being put up on the agenda for, uh, for providing the services to the citizen. It is, however, it is important that the county of Santa Clara is uh, is engaging and becoming the most diversified uh, county, and it is equally important to implement the laws which are also pertaining to the pertaining to the diplomacy. In terms of a diplomacy, it is important that the the notes of uh, the the notes of uh, different diplomatic channels that's already present in the county of Santa Clara. There are diplomat in residence within the every specific uh, city of the county and as well as they are working with the Department of State. So it is important that you know, they are being recognized and as well as you know, important, more importantly, the laws which is pertaining to the diploma, diplomacy being implemented such that the respective foreign offices being directly working with the county of Santa Clara be implemented. In that way, the county would be able to enable all the commissions. They are not just respectively working with the citizen, but working with the foreign services as well. More importantly, I also wanted to emphasize the fact about the different laws that is being implemented as part of a prevention of a gun violence within the county, and as well as as well as well making sure about the county is in line with executive orders as a part of federal advocacy that is being launched. For example, the American Rescue Plan and the, Infl and the Inflation Act. So I want to take this opportunity to thank and acknowledge the fact about what is being implemented within the county of Santa Clara and allow the opportunity to to let Board of Supervisor to consider the points. Thank you very much. Thank the you. Next speaker is MEC Investigator Bui. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, go yeah. ahead. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Barry Bui. I'm a MEC Investigator with the Santa Clara County Medical Examiner Coroner's Office. Uh, here to speak about item 69 on the agenda. Um, 
you know, as the med medical examiner, coroner, investigator, we put in countless hours of overtime or understaffed and helping our community during this historic pandemic. Um, I'm here to stand in solidarity with our union brothers and sisters from DAIA to ask the board to direct ESA uh, to align us with the disingenuous and misleading differential that disenfranchises classification whose salaries are tied to DSA per our contract. Um, we have initiated a grievance with which the county has refused to meet with us in the informal process, forcing us to proceed with group grievance for leaving us out um, the misleading uh, board with the quote, you know, unquote differential uh, that leaves several classifications out. Um, ESA's request is based on a salary study period. That means all should be equitable to continue with the salary alignment, which under ESA's request means all should receive it. Uh, we ask uh, for equity, parity, and to respect our contract and ask you direct ESA to do the same. And I'll yield the rest of my time. Next speaker is Leslie Zeger. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, um, uh, my name is Leslie Zeiger, and I'm actually uh, making a clarification or requesting a clarification on behalf of many of us members of the public um, who would like to understand if uh, by putting item 33 on the consent calendar today, does it mean that it will come back later as something that the board will need to vote on after the capital prioritization process, or does it mean that you are approving it today as written? Um, I, yeah, I would just appreciate an answer to that question um, so that we can, uh, like the public can participate in our democracy in a more meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you. And James, I'm gonna come back to you to answer that question when our public speakers are done that the, if the majority of people wish to approve item number 33, then that's exactly what it will be. Please continue, Dave. Thank you. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. I wanted to try to speak on items uh, 30 and 33. Uh, I guess uh, first, uh, uh, thank you for working on gun violence issues, uh, living in San Jose area. Uh, I think they're doing some really important work uh, that's included the help of the VTA with studies about uh, domestic violence issues and uh, just say neighborhood violence issues as well, that uh, to learn how to better address those things uh, is important. And I think it can be they're offering a fee process for their guns at this time to, to create, uh, you know, the studies needed uh, for counseling services. And it's under a bit of fire in San Jose, and I wish it wasn't. If, if there was just good oversight practices are done well, I think it can be a way to really uh, bring the whole community together towards a good common goal. And uh, that's, you know, working out uh, just our, our problems and uh, trying to answer our issues without the use of violence. Good luck how to do that and uh, what's before you in, in this sort of issue and, and, and how it can be a full community effort. Uh, with my remaining time uh, for item 33, uh, morning, ah, shoot, I just be really loud here. I am going to just quickly offer that. Uh, I hope that uh, for item 33, that there can be ways to, to uh, secure uh, as we try to as we try to work towards treatment for ourselves. That we involve we want to invite ourselves to our own health treatment. Uh, that's an important concept. I hope we can do with 33. That's Next speaker is Connie Ludewig. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. This is Connie Romo Ludwig. Um, I wanted to, I had my hand raised for items not on the agenda. And so I just wanted to briefly mention that um, I attended one of the uh, Reed Hillview uh, led um, contamination meetings. And I'm concerned that 
residents are not really um, receiving all the necessary information, um, such as uh, I go back to supervisor Simidian talking about always take care of your health. I'll never forget that is so important. And I really feel that um, that we need to that the county needs to ask Luna to be talking about also um, health and making sure your house is safe and and rather than people getting heated about it really led to closure of the airport more than the focus on the lead um, contamination. So, um, but back to um, my my comment on item number 34, I wanted to uh, ask that you please increase funding for um, CAL FIRE, um, especially with the uh, the low lakes we have down in, well, in, in the county, especially South County, um, it's becoming more and more important to ensure that they are adequately funded and provided what they need to keep the community safe. Thank you for all you do, and I appreciate you hearing me. Thank you. And 34 was not on consent, Connie, so you're not able to speak again, but thank you for your comments on 34. Next speaker is Kathy. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Kathy, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Yes, my name is Kathy Barth. I'm a member of SHHAC Sacred Heart Housing. I'm here because I want to urge the Board of Supervisors to support the creation of a task force that will address the needs for quality, abundant housing to support people with mental disabilities or illnesses. We need to ensure that peer support is central to independent living empowerment projects. Peer support has an effective component to helping consumers recover and heal while taking steps towards independence. It should also accurately reflect an initial application for the MHSA grant, which lists three to five peer supporters as a budget item. We urge the county to prioritize the formation of a task force that will help address capacity and quality issues that exist within the continuum of care in Santa Clara County. The consequences of inactions often lead to intercounting the legal system or ending up homeless because the support system was not adequate to meet the needs of the population in Santa Clara County, along with the members of SHHAC. Thank you so much for hearing me. Thank you. And David, before you continue, we've heard from six speakers. We have nine more in the queue. They'll all be entitled to two minutes each. After that, I want to switch to one. And to the speaker two prior, um, you asked about item number 33. If a majority of supervisors approve the, uh, that item, when we take that vote for consent, then yes, 33B will be approved as shown in the public agenda. David, Actually, please continue. Um, Supervisor, President Wasserman, I'm sorry to yes. interrupt, this is Cindy. Yes, um, Supervisor Chavez. The way that the motion that I put forward would, would reflect is that item A, we would receive the report from the Office of the County Executive relating to the rebidding and then item B, um, we would take no action on that item until we come back as part of the, um, the discussion on how we're prioritizing um, the uh, capital projects at a, at a meeting later in September. Thank you for that clarification. All right, David, please continue. Thank you. The next speaker is Walter Wilson. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning, President Wasserman and my supervisor um, to the board and morning, the administration. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Um, supervisor Chavez uh, effectively um, to, uh, said what I what I was going to say because I figured that um, um, in the way that um, the motion was made, it sounded like part of it was being passed and the other part wasn't. So thank you for that. Um, I want to say thank you for the to the administration and to the board for addressing this issue, which was um, somewhat messy to begin with, and that um, the opportunity for the community to be able to weigh in is huge in terms of um, you know creating solutions around this secure care facility. I think that um, the um, uh, wisdom and leadership to move this thing in a different direction uh, really. Um, gave us the opportunity the community to see that the the board the leadership in this uh, county is actually listening 
um, to what people have to say. I know that there's a um, you know a, a great number of people out there who don't think there should be any facility whatsoever. But from where I sit as the chair of the, um, the Community Corrections Law Enforcement Oversight Monitoring Committee, um, we have, uh, particularly I do, have a different perspective in terms of that. I think that it's very necessary to have uh, secured facilities because, there's my phone, uh, because, um, um, you know, it's uh, public safety is paramount, I believe. And uh, once again, thank you for your leadership. And um, we, CCLEM, looks forward to participating in this process of engaging the community and uh, what we plan on doing in the future around this matter. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you, Walter. Next speaker is Tila Pulliam. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Tila, are you there? Tila is not responding. Okay, we're going to lower their hand. Next speaker is Alan Kamara. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning again, Supervisor. This is Alan Kamara again. Um, I want to talk on agenda 25 and 25. I don't know if you all can hear me. Um, yes, we can. Agenda 25 in, in the hospital report that's coming to you, I think, on page 11 um, and um, page 10 and 11, it talks about the mental health and wellness of the staff. As you all aware, in, in many, many of the speakers' uh, comments, um, we are exhausted um, relative to short staffing, having few of the staff do work of many, and it is affecting our mental health. And in that report, you will find um, the hospital administration has done a good job uh, having some programs that will help. What we would encourage you all to ask the administration is to connect back with the bargaining unit at every step of the way to help come up with recommendations that is to the staff. Um, it is a very important agenda item and what at least from our point of view, what would have loved. Alan, you're breaking up. Can you get closer to your that speaker? Report coming independently from the mental health of our staff. Very, very, very. Uh, board of Supervisors, uh, the year, I think it's an if. Can you all hear me now? Is it better? Um, I think you know, the year uh, to make that referral. So we want the board to take it serious and look at the recommendation that we send you. And we thank the hospital administration for this. And Next Alan, oh. Alan, excuse me one second, David. Alan, you sure. just spoke on items, I believe it was 25. Yeah, item 25 and 25 to 26 are going to be heard, they're not on consent. So Alan, you're not able to speak again on those two items. Please continue, David. And Thank again, you. this is the consent item. Go ahead. Next speaker is Andre Thomas. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Andre Thomas, and I'm an assistant chief steward with SEIU. I'm speaking today in solidarity with our investigators at the medical examiner's office, the public defender's office, our rehabilitation officers, and our deputy fire marshal personnel. Much like agenda item number 142, which the board approved on August 16th, agenda item number 69 represents the misleading tactics by ESA to ensure that DSA and CPOA receive a salary increase, but disguise it as a salary differential. Agenda item number 69 is designed to mislead you and is meant to shirk SEIU represented workers including our brothers and sisters with the District Attorneys Investigators Association from obtaining a salary alignment. As we inch closer toward another contract bargaining cycle, ESA's willingness to work outside their guidelines and policies to effectively circumvent contract alignment language that has been in place for 40 years erodes trust and dismantles the relationships we've and other labor unions have developed with the county. I certainly appreciate and I'm very grateful for Supervisor Ellenberg's request for an off-agenda report and seeking clarity on this issue. 
thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Jose Valle. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Jose, are you there? Yes. Hey, uh, how you doing, everyone? I just had, wanted to have a confirmation. Is this item 33? 33 is included in this item, yes. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, hold on one second. Okay. My name is Jose Valle with Silicon Valley Debug. I'm speaking on item 33. Uh, we reject uh, agenda item 33A, report from the Office of the County Executive relating to the rebidding of the Secure Treatment Center project. Although the County Executive seems to ignore what led us to reconsider the J.E. Dunn's contract in the first place, it was never an issue of whether or not J.E. Dunn can fulfill the vision to build a new jail. And although J.E. Dunn may feel differently, their history of racial and gender discrimination is undeniable and does not reflect our county's policies, nor does it reflect the signed, in, the signed agreement between the county and J.E. Dunn contract, as stated in Section 8. And we support agenda item 33B, move forward with the solic solicitation of process for a consultant of uh, refresh the program requirements to conduct community engagement if a true restart of the process is facilitated. Nowhere in the consent decree does it state to build a new jail, yet the only clear action the PLO has recommended is instead to depopulate due to its staffing crisis. Frankly, if the county cannot successfully staff the jail now, how do they expect to staff the, the new jail? We re recommend starting the depopulation now. We cannot wait for the ATI. And lastly, if the county moves forward with another community engagement process, let it be a true process which is not ignored like we have had uh, experienced previously. Thank you. Jose and anybody else interested in item 33, what the motion is from Supervisor Chavez is to take no action on 33B until September. Go ahead, please, Dave. Thank you. The next speaker is Melissa Willett. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. My name is Melissa Willett. I am um, in the assessor's office and the first vice president of SEIU Local 521, speaking about item number 69 on the agenda. And I appreciate that this was addressed by Supervisor Ellenberg. And um, I want to just repeat the remarks of my union brethren about ESA's submission um, for the second reading of the last board meeting to have that differential approved. Um, disenfranchises our DAIA and SAU 521 workers whose salaries are aligned with DSA. And the basis for the differential are clearly a result of a salary study conducted by ESA in which they affirm in writing is necessary to have comparable salaries with neighboring jurisdictions and to recruit and retain deputies in the sheriff department. ESA chose to request a differential to purposely mislead the board in approving a differential for the sole purpose of leaving our district attorney investigators and SEIU 521 workers out of receiving the salary alignment. This is a tremendous impact to classifications aligned for the purpose of equity. And we asked the board to direct ESA to correct this and align 521 and DAIA classifications and submit the salary alignment for all the classifications that are tied pursuant to our memorandum of agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Tina Brown. You have two minutes Excuse to speak. Me. Please go ahead. Oh, Excuse sorry. Excuse me one moment, if I may. I see Dr. Smith's hand is raised. Dr. Smith, did you want to speak now or after the public comment was finished? I can speak after the public comment is finished. All right, thank you. Please continue, David. All right, Tina, I'm unmuting you. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Tina, Good morning. are you there? This is, oh, go ahead. Yes, I am. This is Tina Brown. I'm a system impacted family member from Debug and the Care First Jail Never Coalition. I'm speaking on item 33. We reject 33A, the JE Dunn bid and the process that allowed this contract to be considered in the first place. And we support 33B if it is a true restart of this conversation that will be responsive to the larger context of non carceral alternatives and actually reflects the findings and visions of the community engagement process. The county has embarked in a process to examine alternatives to incarceration, to demolish Main Jail North and parts of Elmwood, create a larger continuum of care process, and build a mental health facility. 
the discussion of a new jail should be within the context of those larger discussions that are taking place. Simultaneously to this restart, if one occurs, the county must work to reduce the jail population now. The county has heard from the public health community, those who are incarcerated and their loved ones, and even the litigators of the consent decree that said jail reduction is an urgent priority. Every single one of you have repeatedly spoke about the inhumane conditions inside the jails, but today there is 2,991 inside that are being subjected to those inhumane conditions. That's 92% pre-trial. You have not acted on the multiple calls on the crisis occurring inside right now, as you do have the authority to help push reduction efforts by using alternatives that already exist. An ATI work plan does not need to be completed to start depopulating. Next speaker is Melissa. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, thank you for your time. I want to reject the JE Dunn bid contract. Um, I am a system impacted family member. The county seems to prioritize public safety, yet the county itself is responsible for the increase in violence in our jails, which is more than twice the typical jail average triple the rate in California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation prisons with a 50% increase of use of force since 2019 due to staffing crisis. The jail increase does not reflect changes in crime rates. Our jail population leaped from about 2,000 to 2,900 from COVID times um, to now. This is due to changes in laws and policies, not changes in crime rates. Changes in our laws has been responsible, not um, increase in crime. This is a deep failure of morality of your own. So let's help um, depopulate and align with um, what the public Department of Public Health wants. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Annalisa Ruiz. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Annalisa Ruiz. I'm uh, with Young Women's Freedom Center, and I'm in calling in support of the Care First Jail Never Coalition. I'm speaking on agenda item 33A, the report from the Office of the County Executive relating to the rebidding of the Secure Treatment Center project. Although the county executive seems to ignore what led us to reconsider J.E. Dunn's contract, it was never an issue of whether or not J.E. Dunn can fulfill the vision to build a new jail. And although J.E. Dunn may feel differently, their history of racial and gender discrimination is undeniable and does not reflect our county's policies, nor does it reflect the signed agreement between the county and J.E. Dunn contract as stated in Section H. I know that it was already spoken to as far as uh, Item 33 not being addressed until September, but I also want to voice uh, my support for the de um, depopulation of the jail. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Cynthia Longs. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Cynthia Longs. I'm a District 1 registered voter, a system impacted family member, a debug organizer, and a Care First Jail Lads Coalition member. We reject agenda item 33A, report from the Office of the County Execs relating to the rebidding of the Secure Treatment Center. What led the county exec to reconsider J.E. Dunn's contract was not that J.D. Dunn could not, J.E. Dunn could not fulfill the vision to build a new jail, but that J.E. Dunn's history of racial and gender discrimination does not reflect our county's policies, nor the signed agreement between the county and J.E. Dunn's contract. In addition, nowhere in the county and the consent decree does it state to build a new jail, yet the only clear action the PLO has recommended is to depopulate the jail due to its staffing crisis. My concern is, if the county cannot successfully staff the jail now, how do they or you all expect to staff the new jail? And with that, I recommend stating or rather starting depopulation now. We cannot wait for the ATI. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. President, that was our 15th speaker. So give us just a moment while we change it. Oh, it looks like we don't have any more hands up. That last person put their hand down. So that concludes our public speakers. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, I'd like to clarify regarding 33 um, and state what I'm understanding is the motion 
Um, a was really just a report from staff to let the board know what we're recommending. Um, it's really quite simple. Um, yep. Boils down to the fact that the design that we currently have to work with is from 2016. There's been a lot of change and a lot of technology and desire to um, change the services that will be available in the new jail. Um, so we're not recommending that we um, move ahead with uh, approving any contracts. We're recommending B, which is to contract with a consultant to do uh, outreach and consider a design build. And what I understood from the motion is that we are committing not to, you know, actually move ahead with that until um, after the prioritization process. So um, if that's not correct, somebody should tell me. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, is that correct? That's accurate. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Smith, your hand is still up. Sorry, I'll get it down here. All right, thank you. We've heard from the public. I have a few comments I would like to make. Um, it was brought up, this is a procedural item and then I'll get to my comment regarding 33. Um, it was brought up to me about having all sponsorships go on consent initially, and then any supervisor that wishes to pull an item, a, con a sponsorship item from consent could do so. And that could help as far as streamlining our meeting. I would like to ask, does any supervisor disagree with that? And again, they would be on consent like, and like any item can be pulled. Supervisor Smitty. I don't disagree. I, I actually think that's a, a smart procedural move. I do think that um, we would need to ask someone in the county executive's office uh, or in the chain of command as designated by the county executive to do some basic review on the items uh, before they go on consent. In other words, we have a, uh, we have a policy uh, now on the books and um, uh, so first, first, first question might be, does, is it consistent with the policy? Uh, and if not, probably not appropriate for consent. Uh, and then I think, uh, I don't think it's in the policy, but I think we've sort of evolved into saying, let's check to make sure that if the funds are going to a nonprofit, it's a nonprofit no standing. One. And that's a relatively easy thing, I think, for either uh, county staff or county council to check. So I, I guess I would say, uh, as long as someone is doing that relatively modest bit of due diligence, before uh, we, anything goes on consent, I, I think streamlining it so we don't go through a dozen of these and make uh, poor David lose his voice uh, is probably a good idea. Thank you. And I ran it by county council. And if the supervisors agree with that, we can put all those items on consent. Um, that's number one. I'm seeing a nodding and shaking of heads. I thank Vice President Ellenberg for bringing the idea forward. And I'm certain county council, when they see those items, will make sure that it the donations going to a 501c3 and meets our other requirements. Is that true, Mr. Williams? Going to County Council. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, that's that. Um, my other comment is on number 33. I'm going to read my prepared remarks. Um, although Supervisor Chavez's motion is a little bit different. Uh, I think my, my prepared remarks still reflect where I'm at at this time. I'm troubled by the prospect of more delays. This jail project is now in its 14th year of planning. Current conditions in our jail necessitates that the facility be replaced as soon as possible. Community input does not absolve the board of the responsibility to make difficult decisions. The five members of our board were elected to listen and to lead, and that is what we are doing today. I am in favor of moving forward with the building of the jail. The status quo forces almost 3,000 people to live in a facility that is non-ADA and non-seismic compliant with limitations on programming capacity. 
and the costs will only continue to go up the more we delay. If we delay this project a few more years by sending out for um, RFP and, and going through the process that I think is what's forthcoming, we're talking about the potential of adding hundreds of millions of dollars to the already high cost. For instance, a 20% increase to a price tag like ours is about $120 million. A 20% increase to a small price tag isn't the same as a 20% increase to a large price tag as this facility certainly is. What happens if what we're doing causes delays for three more years? Again, this redesign rebuild was started 14 years ago. What good are plans that we, if we cannot afford to execute them three years from now? Because our justice involved clients deserve better now, I will not be supporting the recommendation regarding item 33 today. Um, and I understand Supervisor Chavez, it's simply pushing it back to September, but it, I need to be consistent in how I feel about any more pushbacks. I want us to build the jail, make things better for the 3000 people that are in there. That's it. Otherwise, I will be supporting all the motions, addendums, and changes that have been uh, spoken about in today's consent calendar. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. Uh, question for Dr. Smith, if he can make himself available, please. Dr. Smith. There he is. Um, Dr. Smith, uh, the original item of today's agenda is item 33. Uh, it had an A and a B, as we've clarified now. Um, it uh, came to us from uh, your Deputy County Executive, Ms. Wapensky, uh, and it came with recommended action. Presumably that means that the item uh, as presented, 33, came to us with a favorable recommendation from staff. You are recommending an I vote on this item, yes? Yes. But um, go ahead. Well, and then my question was, does that favorable recommendation stand now that the item has been continued to September pursuant to the motion? I'm trying to get a sense of what staff's take is on the motion now as it stands. My understanding is we did a very short staff presentation for 33A. Um, we were initially envisioning giving more detail, but I think I gave the basic headline version. And for part B, we were asking for authority to move ahead with uh, hiring a consultant and re-preparing an RFP uh, that was appropriate to go through a design bid process where based on public input and input from the board, we would modify the design and um, deal with other issues that came up. Um, my understanding is this is just being put off until September. Um, and uh, so we'll come back with uh, basically the same item on the agenda in September, unless the board would just want to take our word for it that we aren't starting until s September. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wasserman. Uh, colleagues, at the risk of stating the obvious, I feel like we're spinning our wheels here. Uh, and um, I'll be an I vote today as a process matter. Uh, but uh, when we get to September, uh, assuming the recommended action stands, um, my hope and expectation, whatever the will of the board may be, uh, is that we will actually um, make a decision uh, so that administration knows uh, the direction uh, of the board uh, as to what is today 33B. So I'll be an I vote. Uh, Mr. Chairman today, but with the understanding that that's essentially a process vote uh, to accommodate uh, the the motion and the request to 
take what I would call a more comprehensive look at capital issues uh, when we get to the broader discussion in September. Thank you. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg. I thought I was clear on my understanding, but um, my, but and maybe um, Supervisor Chavez correct me. I understood your motion to be an approval of B, an, a yes on both, but with the so that we don't have to bring it back in September, but with the understanding that no outreach and no beginning of process will begin before we have um, de determined our board prioritization, because however we prioritize the jail should reflect how quickly um, that engagement process begins. But I, I don't envision that this needs to come back in September. Well, as part of the, here, here was the goal that I had as part of the, um, once we set the priorities about what we're going to build in what order, mm -hmm. then it would determine whether or not you were putting, what kind of outreach plan you were right. even putting out. So that, that was one issue. Mm -hmm. um, but the other issue is that the, the, um, the outreach um, that, that I think your point about, well, anyway, just to make it simple. My objective was to have staff be able to give us a, a full complement of what we're moving forward, in what order, letting the board discuss that, and then any actions that would be taken would be attached to the board's priorities. So my, my assumption isn't that the, the direction the staff is giving is wrong or bad, it is that it may be premature based on the discussion we haven't yet had. So for B, um, the way I was looking at it today is we were taking no action on B until we okay. had that discussion with the and whole we'll have to with the whole board. board. Yeah, got it. Okay, thank you. I will be an I vote. Thank you. And we keep saying September. Are we talking nine September thirteenth or twenty seventh? There's a a um, Dr. Smith has a a report coming back to the full board on our prioritization of our our large capital projects and that's and I thought it was the second meeting in September I may be incorrect September 27th Dr. Smith that's when we're going to have the prioritization uh, opportunity for CIP um, I would suggest that we not try to combine the action today with that prioritization, but come back after that meeting. So the first meeting in October with this uh, report again. Um, Thank you, and Vice and President Ellenberg, you're agreeing with that? It, it, that pending, yes? pending the prioritization discussion, if for some reason the, you know, if the jail is 12th out of 13 priorities, then we wouldn't be rushing back on on the first meeting of August of of October to start an engagement process. Okay, so let's I, not, I think let's... we need to wait for the prioritization meeting to happen and then determine whether this is brought back at the first meeting in October or at some later point. Okay, let's. I'm going to try and manage this meeting professionally, supervised committee. And I'll recognize you in just one second, Vice President Ellenberg and Dr. Smith. We have the prioritization of the various projects that the county is looking at doing, going to do, et cetera. Dr. Smith's recommendation, and I agree, is not combine the jail discussion with the other half dozen projects. So Vice President Ellenberg, what I'm hearing is the projects and the jail. And I want to turn to, to Supervisor Simidian first for your understanding so that we're all on the same page here eventually. Well, thank you. Uh, again, uh, I would say uh, we're spinning our wheels a little bit, Yep. but we're having the conversation. Uh, it's a challenging conversation, but it's one we have to have. Um, and I think what I would say is uh, I actually very much appreciated the further clarification from Supervisor Ellenberg and Chavez of their understanding and intention because I was very close to saying uh, I was gonna have to abstain just because I, I was frankly finding it challenging to understand where we were headed with the revised motion on the floor. And um, so I appreciate the further efforts of clarification. However, uh, the exchange now that we just had with Dr. Smith and Supervisor Ellenberg, uh, it's 
sort of gets me a little bit anxious again because um, I, I heard Dr. Smith say, you know, let's let's wait until after you have that September discussion to bring uh, this item back. I think that does make sense. I agree. But then I heard Supervisor Ellenberg say, well, you know, we may not even bring the item back for a discussion at the first meeting in October, if I heard her correctly, depending on what our conversation was like at the meeting in September. And I think um, I, uh, that loses me because I think we need to wrestle this one to the ground. Yes, no, uh, but limbo is not a good place to be. And so I would say if there's a commitment from the maker in the, uh, of the or the proponent, I guess, of the revision to our consent calendar, Supervisor Chavez, that the item will come back no later than the first meeting in October, I will remain an I vote. If it's, we might never bring it back ever, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't support that kind of a motion based, right. on, based on a conversation we haven't yet had at a meeting that is yet to be held. Right. I, I think Thank that, you. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, let me let me just say this, that I, I, I would expect that there will be a discussion that comes back to the full board after our prioritization session. But I think Supervisor Simidian, the the concern I have, and let, let me not to make this fuzzier, I'm, I'm really trying to make it clearer. Um, James, do you want to jump in before I try to clarify myself? Is that why your hands up? I can recognize James, go ahead. I was just gonna suggest at this point that the item might as well maybe be heard to decide kind of next steps, uh, given the very extended conversation. Um, but maybe this is coalescing to a certain spot, but I'm-, I'm I got uh, you, James. I'm, well, let yeah. me let me see if I can, if, if this, just if we can, um, if this is okay, uh, appropriate, I get my, my objective would be that, um, you know, I, I'd like to have a unanimous vote today because I think we do want to um, accept the report on, on item A from staff because it essentially ends the, the current situation we're in. Yeah. What I would just recommend is that at the, the, um, the uh, priority setting session that that may impact timelines, um, Supervisor Simidian. And one issue that Supervisor Ellenberg raised that I just wanted to highlight is that the way this is listed on the agenda is as a secure treatment center. And I think that even that is a little bit confusing to the public in terms of what they're weighing in on. And so what I had hoped is that the, the, um, the capital priority setting session would actually help draw distinctions between what it is that we're talking about. And then what based on that action that whatever comes back to the board is really tied to um, with some clarity as to what project we're, and projects we're referring to that we would be referring to staff to move more quickly on. Thank so, you, Supervisor Sumidian. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would ask that the minutes reflect my earlier comments and I will now be an abstention. Thank you. Thank you. And your earlier comments, I believe were that the meeting the discussion regarding jails not be any later than the first meeting in October. Is that correct? Yes, and there were earlier comments as well about uh, sort of where we were and the decisions we needed to make. So um, Thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll abstain. I just uh, feel that there's a level of ambiguity here that makes it uh, almost impossible for me to know how we're planning to proceed. Understood, Dr. Smith. Um, I don't think the desires are mutually exclusive. Uh, what I would intend to do is put it on the agenda for the first meeting in, uh, in October. If the board during the September priority session tells us to take it off or during um, the consent modification, ask for it to be removed or modified, that certainly is, you know, within standard procedure. Um, okay. You don't really need to decide today whether it's going to be on October or not. Um, Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, you're the original motion maker. Are you okay with Dr. Smith's suggestion? 
which has the prioritization occurring September 27th. And uh, looking then at the jail discussion, likely being the first meeting in October, as long as that's what's stated in the 927 meeting. Yes, that, that's actually the intent. I mean, the, that okay. we would draw that, yes. Okay, I think we got there and I don't see any more hands. So David, I'm gonna ask for your roll call vote. All right, Mr. President, just to confirm, um, I had for the consent calendar as a whole, I had Supervisor Lee as the motion maker and Supervisor Chavez as a seconder, is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye, but an abstention on item 33 and on item 135 as previously announced. Noted, thank you. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes, with an abstention on 135. Noted, thank you. And President Wasserman. Yes, with a no on 33. Noted, thanks very much. All right, thank you. That passes. That brings us to public hearing under item number eight. And let me just flip my pages over to that. And any brevity by any staff members going forward would be appreciated. <laughs> but of course, anything that needs to be said, say so. Paul Lorenz, where are you? There you are. You're in my square number 10. Right. All right, Thank sir, public, public hearing. I'm yes. going to open this public hearing. Paul, do you have any comments you wish to make? Uh, thank you, uh, President Wasserman, members of the board. Uh, there are four changes in the naming within the healthcare system, uh, one of which is to change the Santa Clara Valley Health and Hospital System name uh, to County of Santa Clara Health System. The second, uh, which I'm pleased to bring forward is, as you well know, we acquired O'Connor Hospital, St. Louis Regional Hospital, um, and we've been known as, quote unquote, the enterprise for Santa Clara Valley Medical Center hospitals and clinics. We're recommending now that collectively the healthcare delivery system is called and named Santa Clara Valley Healthcare. Uh, the other two changes are uh, changes that you may be familiar with, but uh, in the acquisition of DePaul Health Center, we are now recommending that Valley Health Center Morgan Hill be the name, which is consistent with our brand architect. And then Valley Health Center Bascom be renamed to Valley Health Center San Jose. Gotcha. All right, thank you very much. Like I said, I've opened the public hearing. David, you concur we have no speakers? We do concur, sir. Thank you. Then I'm going to close the public hearing and look for a motion to adopt the resolution for the renaming of the aforementioned hospitals and locations. Do I have a motion to do so? Supervisor Simidian. You are muted, sir. You know, when you got Thank you. I'll go ahead and move approval. Uh, wait for a second, then I have just a brief comment. Thank you, okay. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, Thank you. My 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 brief comment is this, Miss Lorenz. I you know there's a a range of views, shall we say, about the importance or significance of uh, naming name changes, the value thereof, branding. Uh, I, I'm not going to second guess that today. I am, however, going to uh, urge, exhort uh, the team. Uh, not to change names uh, on a regular basis. Um, many of us who, uh, you know, work in the public arena are confronted and uh, confronted by, you know, organizations that seem to uh, uh, change names uh, almost every year or two or three. And, and ultimately, I think that gets in the way of identifying a brand identity and a set of relationships that are lasting, which I think is part of your goal. So I, I would just ask for some thoughtfulness and some um, uh, mindfulness about the importance of once you make a decision, uh, you know, not not thinking that this is uh, a change of fashion for every season of the year. Uh, I'll, I'll let it go at that. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a motion. We have a second. I don't see any other hands. We didn't have any members of the public. David, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Smidian. Aye. 
Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you. With that, we're going to turn to item number nine. Share your uh, report regarding the Narcan distribution and fentanyl prevention program report. And I'm going to tell you and every staff member as brief a report as you can possibly give on these would be appreciated. Sherry. Sure. Uh, good morning, President Mosterman, members of the Board of Supervisors, Sherry Terrell, Director with our Behavioral Health Services Department. Uh, you have a, a, an update on our report related to Narcan distribution and fentanyl prevention programming. This was a report that was brought to the August 16th Board of Supervisors, and there was some additional information requested as part of the report back. And um, so we provided um, some additional information in this report related to investments for treatment and prevention, as well as some planning that um, is happening in conjunction with our Santa Clara County Office of Education related to um, training for schools and school districts, as well as distribution of uh, Narcan and Naloxone. So um, we don't have a formal PowerPoint or presentation, but are open to answering any questions that um, any of the board members may have. Thank you. We appreciate your six page report, Director Terrell. Uh, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I would like to both, um, I, I have a lot of questions and I'd like to make a motion on this um, as this is a referral I brought forward and I'll speak a little bit to what my concerns are, but I see that we have speakers from the public and I'd rather take them first, Supervisor Wasserman, and then request you come back to me. All right, Supervisor Smitty, you want to hear from the public first as well? Sure. Thank you, David. Our speakers, please, two minutes each. One moment, please. Next speaker is Sean Cartwright. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, uh, you all know me. You all know the work that I do. I have been out there in all these camps. I've been passing out Narcan in these camps. Um, recently, there has been a call from the camps, hey, we need Narcan, because I ran out. It was so hard to get Narcan. It was like, it would have been easier for me to get any drug I wanted than it was to get Narcan. That's ridiculous. For people who've been out there, who've been passing out Narcan, it should be so easy for us to get. And it's also, it's even harder to get the meth test strips. We're trying to keep people alive out there. These things should be so easy to get for us. Please make it easy for us to get. It just fill out a form, say we picked up like X many of these and give it to us. And don't just give us like one little box of the meth test strips. We finish those at one camp. One small camp is the box of meth test strips. If you're serious about keeping people alive, help us do that. There is no greater feeling than going to a camp and talking to somebody who's alive because they used somebody used your Narcan on them, called 911, and did everything that you told them to do. And you're looking at somebody who's still alive because of like they followed your directions and used your Narcan. Please make it easier for us. The South side is begging for Narcan. When people who are addicts are like, please, we need Narcan. And it's like an entire area, there is a problem. And you can like help us stop people from dying. Make it easier, help us. I'm asking you, it is so simple. We need cases of meth test strips, not boxes. And we need a lot of Narcan, thank you. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, it's nice to hear uh, Sean Cart Cartwright on the last uh, speaking public comment. Uh, I wanted to offer good luck how we are addressing uh, fentanyl issues at this time. Uh, you know, that includes, you know, uh, people who, who use it to be aware of the cuts of fentanyl and the people who sell fentanyl learn to not not so harmful in their cuts. That's an important practice. And uh, so that takes education, you know, from, from the people who use it, they have to understand that uh, concept. And uh, it's important uh, learning process for ourselves at this time. Good luck on those efforts uh, of awareness issues. And to, you know, on uh, item 33 of the previous uh, consent calendar that I've muffed, <laughs> I couldn't get into fully. As we're trying to address these, these meth issues overall, and, and jail issues and alternatives to jail, uh, a, a future of having um, 
just a real involvement and, and love of, of wanting to heal ourselves, you know, and, and, and making the effort of creating that, that sort of environment, uh, you know, for counseling services and, and to really invite people to want to work towards their own healing. Um, that's, that's what I was trying to say in the last item uh, that I, I think can really address how we end our jail system and the need for jails and, and work towards uh, real concrete steps of uh, counseling services. And, that, and how, how do we, you know, really want to, how can those counseling services be a really, uh, a way that people really want to work on and, and be a part of and uh, make people, invite them to their own healing efforts. Uh, that takes uh, good luck in that sort of effort to learn how to do that. And if we do, that's a lot of love and care and, uh, Okay. David. And that concludes our public speakers. Okay, Supervisor Chavez, then Supervisor Smith. Yeah. So, um, so just a, you know, I, I, um, well, let me ask a few basic questions. Um, one is, is there any additional revenue or is the revenue that's described in this document revenue that's already in the budget? Director. Uh, what we've reported is um, what's uh, currently available and in the budget. So this was not new money. So, I, so what I, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So um, what I had been interested in was making sure that we were expanding the resource as we see that we have a, a real danger relative to fentanyl in our community. And it's unclear to me why not just start out by saying, no, Cindy, we're not responding to you versus frankly burying it and making it difficult for me to understand what is additive or what isn't. And really I'm not, Sherry, I'm not directing that to you. I'm really, frankly, I'm more directing this to Dr. Smith. Um, so, that, so that's actually concern number one. Concern number two, is um, I don't know based on this report um, and based on the fact that we're seeing an increase in fentanyl use, what the plan is to be more responsive to communities at risk. And I think both the group that Sean Cartwright talked about, but also recognizing that we have now a new fentanyl um, risk, which is rainbow fentanyl that's really geared toward kids. Um, and how we are prepared to be responsive to that in this new environment. Sure, I was gonna acknowledge um, Deputy County Executive Casey Halcone. I saw that she had yep. on her camera. Let me, let me jump in here. Doctor. Um, our plan would be to fund whatever was needed. Um, at this point, there are funds that are not being utilized yet. Um, and so if we get to a point where we need more, we'll come to the board and ask for an allocation for more. Um, but at this point, uh, that's a need that will be in the future. Well, I believe Dr. Smith, the need is, is now, and that's why I brought the referral forward. And the, again, what's unclear is that we, we have, um, efforts going on with scoop that are providing training and kits to, to residents but we don't have you know the exact days and locations and times um, are challenging and we wanted to make sure that we could get these out to schools that were open to having them and frankly to bars restaurants and other places especially in the downtown that may need them so the, the goal here was to actually create for the staff an opportunity to say, in the best of all possible worlds, how would we proceed, uh, both on the education side, but on making the, the um, Narcan available, and by the way, making it available in its easiest form, because one of the challenges is that the less expensive um, kits you have to put together versus the ones that are ready to go um, that you can use in an emergency. So, yeah, I'm not saying that none of that or any of that would not be done. I'm just saying we have sufficient money that's allocated in the budget to do that. Right. 
um, if the board, you know, wants to allocate more money, um, you know, that's certainly something we can come back with. But at this point, there's sufficient money to to do all the things that you're talking about. That's actually not clear in the staff report, and and I and I don't understand how that's being transpired based on what's in the staff report. And by the way, let me just say this: like I, I do want to just acknowledge that Scoop and these nonprofits that are helping us are all really trying. So this isn't a critique of them; it's really a question about how do we properly resource um, what what we see as a pretty urgent need. And I, I can't tell from the staff report how those resources are being dis distributed and, and how we're covering all the groups that I just said, Dr. Smith, because I, I don't think that we are. Well, why don't we get a uh, off agenda report <clears throat> from this request and we'll explain it to you and have it discussed by the board again at the next meeting um, with a better understanding of what is being done and what can be done. Does that work, Supervisor Chavez? Um, I, yeah, thank you, Dr. Smith. I'm, and I'm, I appreciate that if folks don't have the answers now. Um, so anyway, yes, let, let me just add a couple things that then I would want included. Um, I'd want included the identification of the um, the scope of work with the county office of education and with scoop um, with the folk and with the high need populations where we know that there are high need populations which would include colleges high schools um, bars and restaurants particularly in areas like downtown that attract a, a younger group of people and the homeless community as uh, Sean acknowledged um, and making sure that what we're purchasing are the sprays that are ready to go and they're they're slightly more expensive dr smith which is not slightly they're more expensive and some of them uh this exceeds the the resource that we currently get from the state the state does resource us some of this product and i i do also just want to emphasize that we're going to need some support to get more information out to these communities and to their parents and especially with the onslaught of the rainbow fentanyl that we're seeing um so i i will turn it over to my colleagues i see there's a lot of interest in this item and would be interested in taking uh coming back for a motion after my colleagues have spoken supervisor smitty thank you uh supervisor uh wasserman and thank you supervisor chavez I, um, through the chair, if I may, I want to share with Supervisor Chavez that um, I, I actually thought about um, a somewhat uh, simpler motion some months back uh, about the distribution of Narcan. And I paused in my thinking because what I discovered, what my office uh, and I discovered, which I'm guessing you've confronted as well, is that there's a certain uh, level of denial out there in some quarters that, uh, it, you know, in some schools, some school districts, when you say, wouldn't you like to have this resource available? Uh, the reaction is, uh, well, we don't have a problem. Uh, and maybe some places don't, but frankly, I'm inclined to think that uh, the problem's pretty pervasive. Uh, so uh, for staff who are trying to figure out where five members of the board are, uh, I just want to join Supervisor Chavez in her sense of urgency, uh, and um, I'll uh, put it this way, go, 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 go. That, that's, you know, what uh, I heard Supervisor Chavez saying, and I'm going to meet to uh, my colleague on that one. Uh, I do think, uh, both to colleagues and to staff, um, the distribution uh, of Narcan will, the successful distribution of Narcan will depend on acknowledging and managing that denial uh, that, I, that I do think is out there. So I want to encourage our, our team to, uh, to think that one through because I don't want the effort to be less successful than it can and should be simply because we think everybody's 
uh, got the same understanding and acknowledgement of the problem because I don't think that's the case. Um, I'm open to seconding a motion when one is forthcoming. Uh, thanks, Supervisor Chavez, for uh, staying on the issue. And uh, just so Supervisor Chavez knows it's really me in the chair, I am, of course, anxious that uh, these good efforts are countywide. Uh, we have young people in the North County and the West Valley. Uh, we have places where young people congregate in the North County and the West Valley. I certainly took that to be uh, her uh, expectation as well. And I just want to underscore that. Uh, the problem, as I say, is um, uh, regrettably pervasive. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you again, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I'm going to go to Supervisor Lee, then I'm going to go back to Supervisor Chavez for a motion. Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you, President Wasserman. First of all, I just want to thank Supervisor Chavez for your amazing leadership on this very serious problem. Um, and I, I really would like to learn a little bit more from the administration regarding the current procedures and allocation of NARCAN. So, for example, when somebody like Ms. Cartwright, who spoke earlier, uh, representing nonprofits, comes to pick up the Narcan for distribution uh, to camps or you know, places where we have users, um, can somebody explain to me what's the current procedure? As in, is there a limit of how many they can receive? And for me to understand why do we need to have some type of limits of how many boxes they can have, how many kids they can have. Oops, we can't hear you. Who is speaking? We're going to Casey, Sherry, Dr. Smith. Hi. Thank you, President Wasserman. Um, so in the off agenda memo, we'd be happy, I'll work closely with uh, Sherry and behavioral health, and we can address uh, this question that you have, that we have from Supervisor Lee, along with um, the additional information requested by Supervisor Chavez and uh, Supervisor Simidian. Okay, so my concern is that by the time another meeting comes in, it'll be another two weeks, and, and I would like to make sure that uh, we don't have these. Uh, many of you have heard about me. I'm, I'm very much a guy from Logistics 7, Serve and Navy for 28 years doing logistics. To me, this sounds less of a medical issue, but a logistical issue at this point of getting these, because it is a proven that Narcan saves lives, right? We know that. Uh, the question is, how much do we have? Do we have the resource to get them? And do we have the way to get them out as fast as possible to those who need it? So my concern is I, I, I'm definitely looking forward to the report. But in the meantime, if possible, from administration is that uh, folks who are coming in to try to pick up this Narcan, I really would like to have a concerted effort to push that out uh, faster and sooner because there's no point of them sitting in our warehouse. If we repurchase them, let's get them out to the people who need them because uh, with the life and death situation we're dealing with here, uh, and that I've you know, personally voiced that one of my cousins actually died from overdose a year ago. So this is really a, a issue that's very near and dear to my heart of how serious this problem is. Uh, and, and the fact that if, I'll admit, if we are not giving out as fast as we can, we have a problem. And folks like, you know, Ms. Cartwright, who has really, frankly proven to be a very active in the house community and knows the issues on the ground, uh, if they are coming and asking for help, I, I really do think that what are we talking about Narcan's, or their meth test strips. These are things that we know. We're not distributing drugs. We're distributing life savings uh, 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 things uh, that we have in inventory. And if we do, I really want to push harder to make sure that goes off faster. Did I make that clear? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. I just want Thanks. to make sure that that's the case. And then my follow-up question is regarding the um, the schools. Um, and the current data suggests that the homeless youth and youth adults ages from 15 to 29 are the most at risk population for opioid overdose. Uh, are there any other strategies and targeted distribution uh, to, to, for this age group um, other than just going to the usual places like colleges and high schools? Any answer? I was just going to say that we can certainly include that information in the report back supervisor Lee. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I will move to accept the report asking us to come back um, to the full board, but with the um, either off agenda report or having that off agenda rolled into the to the full board discussion. Thank and um, 
and with all the questions and requests that have been made. And then I just wanted to add, if I can make that as a motion and then I'll make a quick comment. I'll second. Thank you. Motion, second. Chavez and Smidian. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I do want to just, you know, reinforce something that um, both Supervisor Smidian and Supervisor Lee offered. I think that's right, Supervisor Lee, that your, your perspective on how the logistics of this work is pretty critical given the point that Supervisor Smidian raised, which is that we have large portions of our community that, um, you know, don't believe that they're at risk and don't believe their children are at risk. And um, and we know that sadly to be, uh, you know, very untrue. And I, I just wanna share with my colleagues that we did a focus group at San Jose State with some students and we had them meet with parents who had lost children to fentanyl. And one of the most striking things to me was to see um, college students completely unaware of the risks of fentanyl until this, um, a friend died from it. And so I think it's, you know, it's an information issue, it's a addressing denial, and it's also a distribution issue. And I, I do want to just say that um, one thing that I wanted to lift up that Sean also raised was just the test strips. You know, the test strips aren't foolproof and making sure that that folks like Sean and others have the training they need when they're explaining that to the community is going to be very important. Um, and so anyway, with that, I, that would be my motion and thank my colleagues for the discussion. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. We've heard from the public. I see no other hands raised. David, uh, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Members, it's 11.51. Uh, My plan is to get through 22, 23, and 24, and then adjourn for a 45-minute um, lunch break which the clerk is fine with. So I'm gonna to turn to, and then when we come back, we'll start with number 10. 22, County Executive Jeff Smith, your report. Yes, Mr. President, members of the board, um, a few things to talk about today. Um, one thing I wanted to make sure that I announced is that uh, Greta Hansen started as her first day as the uh, chief operating officer on Monday. Um, she will be heading the next meeting um, from the staff perspective because I will be out of town um, and we're jumping right into all the issues and she's got a lot on her plate already. Um, so welcome on board Greta. Thank you. And that concludes your report, Dr. Smith? No, I've got more. Oh, go ahead. The board has asked uh, for verbal reports about vaccine uh, uh, mandate. Um, we're at a point now where we have uh, only 85 county employees who are in the um, classification of being um, on administrative leave. Um, we have another 22 unclassified, which is per diem staff and extra help. So we've had significant progress in encouraging people to um, get vaccinated. Um, the nice thing about what's going on in COVID world is that Novavax is now currently available. So for those individuals, who have some objection to the new to the technology related to mRNA? Novavax is a vaccine that's built with the old style technology, similar to what um, is used to create the flu vaccine. <clears throat> so there's less impediment there uh, for individuals who don't, don't like uh, mRNA. Um, the um, process of offering um, help is in continuing. Uh, we are sending out a memo to all of the individuals that I mentioned about Novavax and trying to find ways to encourage them to get vaccinated. We also sent out um, referred the, the entire group to 
um, the openings of four, 349 jobs. Um, candidates have in general not been interested, but we continue to do that. Um, the um, vaccine mandate, um, I plan to reevaluate at the end of September when we have a better idea of the fall peak um, and we'll make decisions at that time about modifications. Uh, so that's all I have with regard to those two things. The other thing is that um, when we do get to item 10 on the agenda, um, I think that's related to a memo that was just added to the agenda by supervisors uh, Lee and Ellenberg. I do have a short presentation to try to address some of those questions, but that's better done on item 10. So Thank that's you. my the end of my presentation. Thank you. Oh, before we go to County Council, I see Supervisor Lee has raised his hand and then Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Smith, regarding uh, the report and also the uh, the your discussion, your your uh, comment regarding revisiting the vaccine mandate in September. Uh, certainly, as we have learned uh, from the beginning, initially the vaccine certainly was able to prevent the various earliest uh, variant uh, of uh, of the COVID. But certainly, uh, as we have learned now in the last uh, probably year almost that the uh, the vaccine does not uh, uh, prevent uh, getting uh, getting sick and I certainly yours truly uh, myself caught over the, the, the break uh, in July and uh, and certainly me and my whole family everybody has been uh, double boosted and all that uh, so certainly it's clear that the vaccine no longer technically prevents but it certainly it does it's still very important because it lowers the risk of serious illness uh, and we were our symptoms are very mild I'm sure it has a lot to do with the fact that we got our vaccines uh, and under that, those circumstances, I think the uh, review uh, certainly is, is, is apropos and also along with some of the comments, we have heard uh, the dire situation and the, uh, the hospital uh, uh, with the nursing staff, all that, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, so I just want to say thank you for, uh, for that, uh, that comment and hopefully we could get some uh, development on it. Thank you. Thank you for the thank you, Supervisor Chavez. So, um, Dr. Smith, I, I'm glad you're going to be looking at this for September. I, I do want to say that I, I'm hopeful that we're looking at this much sooner. And both for you and Dr. Cody, I, I think we have to just move forward. I am very concerned about the stress and strain of people's mental health. I, I think I think we just cannot ignore how how um, stressed everybody is, how, you know, really the tension that we have in our community and, and with our work community too. And um, I, I, I know that Dr. Cody makes decisions on, you know, that she thinks are best for the community. And I just want to weigh in that I think we have to be able to equally measure people's mental health. And, and I'm nervous that we're waiting till the end of September also because of you know, an ex a potentially extended fire season, which I hope we don't have. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that later today, but in these instances, every single person counts. Um, so I appreciate you you sunshining that for us. And I just wanna reinforce how, how um, you know, how concerned I am about our trajectory. Thank you. All right, we'll move now to 23, James. At the August 29th, 2022 closed session by unanimous vote with all members present, the board authorized the county to file or join amicus briefs in support of California's requirements for corporate boards to include underrepresented minorities and women. In Crest versus Padilla, California Court of Appeal case number B321726, and in Crest versus Padilla, California Court of Appeal case number B322276 and any other related cases. And that concludes my report. Thank you, James. And I don't see any hands raised, so we're going to move to item number 24. Thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, again, Paul Lorenz, Chief Executive Officer for Valley Medical Center. Um, there are just two items that I wanted to point out in our operations report. One is at the request from Supervisor Ellenberg, we did follow up on utilization of the Parisi House and the referral workflow. 
And again, I think we further improved upon that for clients, both in the inpatient and outpatient setting. So I'm pleased to report that. Uh, the other item is just uh, for your information that uh, we are asking your board's approval on the work plan for HRSA, for which we will be um, scheduling throughout the year a number of different updates to be compliant. Uh, with that being said, I'm happy to respond to any specific questions. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. And I'll look for emotions. Vice President Ellenberg. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to make a motion to accept the report. Uh, I second. There's a second. Thanks, Supervisor Lee. Um, just a couple of questions, Paul. Thank you so much um, for the report and for engaging uh, with Parisi House in the way that you did. With regard to Parisi House updates, um, can you keep us uh, informed about the referral process and how that's progressing on a semi-annual basis? Yes, Supervisor, we'll do that regularly in our operations report. Right, thank you so much. And with respect to transportation, I um, was wondering if social workers have access to bus passes that they can distribute directly to unhoused residents or to, the, or to residents need to connect in some other way to get a pass. So yes, uh, staff do have access to transportation vouchers, including bus and, and taxi. Is a voucher for a one-time use? Is that different? Are we, am I using, are we using different terms for the same thing? Well, um, so number one, vouchers is for a one-time use. Uh, bus passes, I will follow up whether or not it's uh, renewed and available to them on a regular basis. Okay, if, if you could get yeah. back to us then on, on and off agenda, but the primary concern, of course, is making sure that the patients have on or individuals have ongoing um, transportation support. And I think that transportation is covered under the community supports benefiting Cal AIM uh, for the priority populations defined by the by the state. And, and correct me here, um, Paul, if I'm making any any misstatements, but I. I think that all unhoused Medi-Cal members are eligible for community supports as of July 1st. And, and if I'm correct, can you talk about how we're making progress on, on reimbursement for the resources and how, how soon we might be able to make sure that getting uh, ongoing bus passes is part of our program? Supervisor, I, I would like to provide a, a written follow-up to this, um, okay. but you, you are correct. Medicare recipients are eligible for transportation coverage. Wonderful. Great. So I'll look forward to a, an off agenda on how we're going to put that into action. Thank you. Thank you. And Vice President Ellenberg, your motion was to approve items A through E as in Edward. Is that correct? Yes, it is, with the additional Thank direction you. on the report back. Thank you. Report back. Coming back, Supervisor Lee, you concur as the seconder? Yes. Okay. And we've got two members of the public looking to speak. Dave? One moment, please, while we get the timer up. Thank you. And for the public, we have a motion uh, to approve and a second to that already. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I just wanted to quickly uh, thank uh, Supervisor Simidian for offering on a previous item that uh, name changing uh, the future of uh, Valley Valley Med, uh, that takes some time to think about, and uh, hopefully it can be a bit more time and consideration uh, in any final changes. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Sean Cartwright. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Sean. Hey, it's nice to follow Blair. Hi, Blair. Um, I just wanted to, I don't know if it's in this. Uh, honestly, I'm a little frazzled this morning. Um, I just wanted to make sure and uh, just make a point of making sure that we're not releasing people in scrubs um, and things like that. Um, the other day I was out at, I was uh, near second in San Fernando and somebody walked right by in scrubs that looked very, very familiar. Um, and I thought, hmm, I wonder how that happened. So I just wanna make sure we're not doing that. Uh, we also had an incident recently where somebody was um, put out of the hospital, no bus pass, no anything. And it was uh, quite a big deal. I think some of you heard about that. So I just wanna make sure that we're not doing these things. I just, 
I just can't tell you enough how traumatizing it is to people just to be unhoused. And when you're in the hospital, there's that fear that you're not going to be treated decently, that nobody listens to you because you're just unhoused. And there's a mix of people who feel like, hey, I really got good care. And people who feel like they didn't care. I was unhoused. Nobody cares. And so then when you're put out and you're put out in scrubs or you're just not given a bus pass or you're just not given the care that you need, it just reinforces the and it re-entrenches for a lot of folks of they're going to stay unhoused. So at every moment, every touch point we have with unhoused people, if we treat them the way that they're, they deserve to be treated, you know, that's how we get people off the streets. But if we just reinforce the belief that they deserve to be there or there's something wrong with them, that's how we make sure that we keep them on the streets. So I just want to make sure that we're making sure that everything that they're treated great in the hospital, they're released like everybody else is released, you know, that would be great. Thank you. Next speaker is Walter Wilson. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, President, Board Member. Good afternoon, um, Administration. I want to speak just on the um, previous agenda regarding the Narcan. You know, uh, first of all, thanks, um, Supervisor Chavez, for your leadership on this. You know, it's interesting in that um, this stuff is across the county. It's pervasive. It's everywhere. And the sad part about it is that <clears throat> for a lot of kids who are aware of it. And I'm saying kids, you know, 18, 25, they're almost um, what, insensitive or numb to it when they talk about their friends who they just saw on Friday, who's no longer here to die from it. It's almost like just a matter of fact. And it, it really is sad because it's almost for that group of people, it's almost like a matter of acceptance. Like that uh, police officer, uh, the young police officer who was from San Jose State. Um, and, um, you know, he passed away as a matter of, of, of Narcan usage. So I want to thank you guys for really focusing on, because I think it's about to become a, a, a really a huge, huge issue here in the county. Um, and it's not just, listen, the, the training is very important, absolutely, but the distribution is too, and not just the one-time distribution, you, you set up your networks, but then how do you continue to fund that and continue to make sure that those, that this, um, now, medicine gets out here everywhere in all the schools and in all the agencies, community centers everywhere, churches, everybody should have access because you never know when you might need it. But uh, thank you for your leadership on this. Thank you, Walter. Next speaker is Sharon Luna. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, supervisors. Um, Sharon mm -hmm. Luna, and I am speaking as a mother who has had a son that was addicted to drugs. And I want to ask the Board of Supervisors, what are we doing to stop drugs coming into Santa Clara County or the United States? Um, it has been said that it is fentanyl is coming in from China and Mexico and even from Canada. And here we are, and I agree with offering the schools the test kits, but what stance are you taking to prevent drugs coming into the United States? This is very important to me because I saw my son start with marijuana, graduate to meth, then to heroin. It was a 10 year in and out of jail, prison, the whole gamut until he finally said, I've had enough. But I need support from my county supervisors not to always enable, but to take a stance and say, enough is enough. We have to do something to stop drugs coming in. Drug lords, drug dealers need to keep their supply in order to keep in business. And so I think it's important to discuss what you're going to do to stop drugs coming mm -hmm. to this country. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That concludes our public speakers. Thank you, David. Thank you, public speakers. We have a motion. We have a second. David, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. 
Yes. Thank you. All right, fellow board members, we are going to break for lunch. We are going to come back and resume at one o'clock sharp. And David, we're going to come back with 10, 11, and 26 all being heard together. Do you agree? Uh, I have that as next on my list as well. Yes. Thank you. All right, everyone. We'll see you and the public at one o'clock. Recording stopped.
Hello, Supervisor Simidian. They're tiling the wall in our little half bathroom. And they're using two different patterns. And each one contains about 25 different movie stars. So it's Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers and uh, Chaplin and all these different people. And I saw two different tiles, each with 65 different movie stars or the, uh, what do you call the front of the movie theater? where they put up the letters on the white. The marquee. Marquee, thank you, David, on the marquee. And I looked at the first two rows and I go, no, no, we got to intermix them. And he goes, what? So Recording I took in one, progress. turned it a quarter, turned it half, turned it three quarters. Now it looks like a, somebody drew a mural on the wall. It's beautiful. All right, we've got 12.59. The recording has started. David, when we get to one o'clock in about 45 seconds, if you'll take a roll call to reestablish the presence of a quorum. Will do. Thank you, sir. Three, two, one. Mr. Leone, you're on. Roll call, please. Good afternoon. Supervisor Lee. Present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. Present as well. Thank, Thank you, you very sir. much. You have a quorum. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. We are going to resume as mentioned previously with item number 10, which was the board's desire to hear 10, 11, and 26 together. So for anybody looking to speak on items 10, 11, or 26, your turn will be coming up after we have a staff presentation. And Sherry Trow, that would be 10. Let me see what else we're calling for here. And Greg Uturia in 11 and 26, I'll have to look it up. All right, Sherry. All right. Good afternoon, President Wasserman, members of the Board of Supervisors, Sherry Terrao, Director with our Behavioral Health Services Department. Um, we have a presentation in response to um, uh, item 10, which is a report back on our behavioral health um, response to the public health crisis uh, declared by um, the referral by Supervisors Ellenberg and Supervisor Lee. Um, we will be, um, if we could go ahead and advance the slide, please. Uh, we'll be briefly sharing some highlighted successes since our last report. Um, we will provide an update on uh, capacity expansion progress related to beds and housing and treatment. Um, we will provide an update um, around addressing workforce shortage and finally um, closing out with a, an update on uh, CalAIM. Next slide, please. Uh, we thought it would be really helpful to provide um, just a very brief summary of some highlighted successes since our last report. And while I will not read off all of these, I just wanted to call your attention to a few of the successes that we wanted to uh, note uh, publicly. One, uh, that we were able to successfully launch 988 and one, uh, one number non-crisis line. Uh, this really helps to consolidate the ways in which um, residents um, of our community can access uh, behavioral health services and supports. Uh, we've also been working very hard on reducing our call center screening and referral times and have been able to reduce those. Uh, we were able to um, increase our slots uh, for services for transition age youth and um, our outpatient uh, LGBTQ programs. Uh, we've received additional funding for our mobile response and stabilization program, which allows for um, increase and expansion. And finally, last month, we were able to successfully launch our behavioral health navigators program uh, for its first phase. Next slide, please. 
Uh, some of the other uh, highlights that we wanted to um, note are um, our ability to offer medication-assisted treatment for youth. Uh, we also launched our Youth Drop-In Wellness Center uh, last month and opened uh, up that program. Uh, we launched uh, assisted outpatient treatment um, after the board um, opted in to be able to provide that service in our county and community last summer. Uh, we've been able to launch the Independent Living Empowerment Project. Uh, we've added a sign-on bonus for newly hired clinicians and um, offered a new supervisory classification in our county-operated programs. Uh, we've added 271 adult and older adult outpatient and full service partnership slots. And finally, um, uh, we're able to implement the brief jail mental health system tool. Uh, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Deputy County Executive Key Lee, who is going to take you through the next part of the presentation. Thank you, uh, thank you Sherry. Uh, good afternoon, supervisors. I'll be going over the next few slides um, and really trying to share an update on our progress towards um, implementing, adding uh, temporary treatment, temporary uh, shelter and permanent housing options for uh, the system. Um, since we're trying to create a little bit of a framework for ongoing reporting, I might be spending a little bit of time on a, a couple of the slides uh, as a, let's try to lay a foundation for our discussions in the future. This first slide, though, is, is just uh, pulled from our previous reports and provides the board and members of the public um, a sort of a reference tool um, that discusses sort of the three levels of uh, acute, subacute, and residential treatment care. Next slide, please. One of our primary objectives is to increase by the end of 2025 um, acute, subacute residential treatment, supported shelter, and withdrawal management beds for a total of 500 um, by the end of 2025. And this chart shows the goals as distributed um, along the different levels of care. Uh, you saw in the previous slide, the acute subacute residential treatment. I uh, just wanna make a note that on supported shelter here, we mean some type of temporary shelter program that is uh, set aside for people uh, with a serious mental illness who are connected to outpatient services, but some services may be provided on site. Um, and then withdrawal management, uh, that includes uh, social detoxification, um, and potentially medical detoxification. Um, what this chart is trying to show is, you know, how many additional beds we've added uh, since our last report, um, which is six, and we have contracted for six crisis residential treatment beds. Um, and it also shows that we have several um, projects um, in progress. So here we have 103, um, opportunity to contract for 103 beds and are currently working on constructing or renovating facilities to add uh, 69 beds. Uh, and then we have plans or we need to create plans for uh, 322 beds. Um, just to, uh, by way of example, and also to highlight, um, uh, make one note under uh, in the acute row you see that we're working on um, executing a contract uh, for eight acute beds and we are currently um, developing uh, will be constructing a new acute uh, facility this is the child and adolescent psychiatric facility behavioral health services center um, as you know it is 77 beds um, but the 29, as indicated here, is sort of the net uh, if the 48 beds at Barbara Aarons closes. So um, we may be modifying these goals slightly, um, uh, distributing the numbers uh, in different areas as we develop plans, but this is uh, sort of the framework we've identified moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the next few slides sort of uh, zero in on some of the projects that are underway. Here, uh, we're talking about uh, two opportunities for acute beds. Um, the first one, um, as you know, is the Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Facility and Behavioral Health Services uh, Center. Um, uh, the one thing that I would note on this is that um, uh, we had an estimated ability by the end of 2025 at HHC, uh, uh, FAF, 
um, indicated February. So we're going to be working with them to sort of uh, get a better estimate on that so that uh, we can provide that to the board uh, next time. Um, next slide, please. Here we have um, uh, an opportunity to um, work with Crestwood. They have an IMD facility in San Jose, uh, and we're working to contract for um, 45 beds there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also have um, a couple opportunities to add residential treatment beds. One is at 650 South Bascom. This is a leased facility. Um, uh, we are working with the owner, Swenson, to renovate a part of the building to add 28 residential treatment beds. Um, and then a momentum would be the sort of service provider or the operator. And construction or renovation is expected to start uh, by the end of this week. Um, and then we're still looking at assessing the estimating the cost and scope of work to add 12 beds at 101 Jose Figueres. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here uh, we have two projects. One is associated with uh, mental health residential recovery homes. This is, uh, these would be shared homes, totaling um, could be four or five, uh, where individuals would uh, uh, live together with some on site support. Um, and they're supposed to uh, live there temporarily until sort of permanent housing is located. Um, and then we also um, are working on contracting for 20 detoxification beds. And as indicated in the report, we're doing an RFSQ for the adult beds and we're exploring uh, providers for the five uh, <coughs> beds. Next slide, please. Um, uh, this second component of our goal is around the permanent housing programs. And um, I'll be talking about a few of the programs. Um, so the first is the Behavioral Health Emergency Rental Assistance Program. We used to call it the uh, Housing Stabilization Program, but that sort of didn't resonate with a lot of folks. So, so what this program is, is to provide rental assistance and financial assistance to individuals who are participating in the special mental health system who are housed but are who are facing some type of crisis this is uh, temporary assistance and supports to um, make sure that they do not become homeless uh, we should have that program up and going um, at the start of the, uh, the of 2023 and, and hopefully sooner um, and the second program is we call it the reach housing support program this is for young adult and youth who are experiencing the onset of serious mental illness. This is augmenting their services with um, temporary um, rental assistance or long-term rental assistance um, to help them and their families uh, remain stably housed. Next slide, please. Um, and, and then finally, uh, we have our permanent supportive housing programs. And the intent of this uh, strategy is to provide some type of ongoing affordable housing with ongoing services to the participants of the special mental health systems intensive, out, uh, intensive outpatient programs like full service partnership, uh, ACT. And our goal is to provide 1,500 individuals with this type of service uh, by the end of 2025. And what this chart shows is the ways in which we plan to uh, provide the service. In the first row, we believe that some individuals will be able to secure permanent housing through a tenant-based rental assistance similar to like a Section 8 voucher. This is ongoing rental assistance that is provided uh, through them or to their landlords directly so that they can afford a unit somewhere in the community. This could be an apartment, this could be a room in a house, this could be a residential care facility, but we think about a third of the individuals, about 500 or so, could um, secure housing on an ongoing basis in this way. And if you see sort of in the in progress um, column, we think that um, about 325 or so of the individuals currently participating in the intensive outpatient programs could, and, and who are staying in some type of housing situation could actually live there uh, permanently, appropriately, and safely. Uh, so that's why we sort of have it marked as in progress. 
um, and we're uh, sort of assessing uh, that, that feasibility right now. Then in the other rows, uh, new or renovated apartments, shared housing, residential care facilities. Um, for the rest of this, we believe that we need to work on um, creating either through construct, cons uh, constructing new facilities or renovating existing facilities, um, new housing options, whether they be apartments, um, homes where people could cohabitate or residential care facilities. And what this chart shows is uh, that under the new renovated apartments, uh, we have about 219 in the pipeline and we need to develop uh, plans for 381 more. And then we also have 32 residential care facility beds uh, or three projects totaling 32 beds in progress. Next slide, please. Um, and then finally, I uh, just wanted to give an update on uh, two grant programs from the state that will be critical for um, our permanent housing and temporary uh, shelter and treatment um, goals. Uh, these are the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program, BHCIP, and the Community Care Expansion Program. Um, just a, a few updates. First, under mobile crisis, uh, we were uh, we received an addition of 500,000. So it, initially 2 million, we received an additional 500,000. Um, technical census, it's, uh, we've applied in the past and we're awarded. Uh, under the Adolescent Psychiatric Facility and Behavioral Health Services Center, we applied, um, I think in May, and were awarded and approved for $54 million. Uh, we have another opportunity to submit uh, an application as part of BHCIP round four, and we'll be doing that uh, no later than tomorrow, which is the deadline. Um, and then the other update that I wanted to, sh uh, two other updates on the slide. One is that we were awarded $6 million on a, non on, on a non competitive basis to provide capital uh, operating subsidies um, and sort of uh, renovation support for existing residential care facilities. Uh, this was just announced a few weeks ago. So we're working hard on implement, uh, developing and then we'll be implementing those plans. Uh, and then finally, uh, we will be submitting a BHCIP al uh, application for uh, Alcove San Jose by tomorrow. And with that, I'll turn it over to Darren. Thank you, Keith. Uh, good afternoon, members of the board. Um, as we all are aware, workforce shortages have been a challenge across the country, specifically in the field of behavioral health services. The department's strategy to tackle this crisis is to use a holistic approach to engage passion and provide creative and enticing opportunities for this profession, leveraging partnerships and enhancing collaboration with our network of community-based providers, stakeholders, and our employee services agency. Two key areas of focus that our partnerships have assessed are to improve the sourcing and interest of prospective candidates to this field and to strengthen and expand the career pipeline from entry level to upstream career development in the field of behavioral health services. Um, through the analysis of our recruitment efforts, one of the biggest challenges we have faced with reducing our vacancy rate is the interest level of prospective candidates that have yielded small numbers of submitted applications. Additionally, retaining the interest and commitment of students to this field has contributed to the challenge of sourcing a high number of candidates to pursue a career in this profession. Through the robust collaborative work we're currently engaged in with our partners, we are paving a more focused, intentional, and data-driven approach to tackle the workforce shortage throughout our entire network of services for the community. I, I'd, also, I'd also like to introduce Jan Morel, uh, manager overseeing our workforce education and training program, department systems initiatives, and our MHSA program, and also Lisa Kopkinsberg, executive director of the Behavioral Health Contractors Association, who will be co-facilitating -facil this segment of our presentation. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to Jan, who will discuss the initiatives developed through our MHSA and workforce education and training programs. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. Um, since my last reporting update in May, we have continued implementing the department's co-occurring certification program. And uh, one of our key goals, which I think you all know, is to be able to deploy integrated clinical teams in the county and community-based clinics when working with clients with both mental health and substance use issues. The co-occurring training plan includes three levels of practice informed, capable, and enhanced. And as you see here for informed, it was rolled out in April and serves as the foundational level 
that identifies core skills for treatment support. The next level is capable, which provides an integrated assessment and treatment for mild to moderate co-occurring disorders and went live last month. And lastly, the highest level of training enhanced is for our integrated treatment for moderate to severe co-occurring disorders and is set to go live later this year. Next slide, please. Um, workforce shortages are critical issues facing both county and contract providers. And to help address this issue in December of last year, my team convened a workforce development committee and invited county staff and county contracted providers to join this committee and help with this effort. The committee includes the participation of county staff, CCPs, including the Behavioral Health Contractors Association. The formation of this committee came from a recommendation provided by the MHSA Stakeholder Leadership Committee when a discussion took place last year regarding the critical workforce shortage in our county. And the group, our SLC, recommended the creation of this committee to be able to share ideas, discuss, develop, and recommend strategies to address the workforce shortage issues in our county. And at, at about the same time, the California Department of Healthcare Access and Information provided funding to address the severe workforce shortage experienced throughout the state. The state provided each county with a specific allocation and each county that opted to participate had to provide a local match to be able to use the funds. The MHSA SLC supported this funding opportunity and the use of the funds, MHSA funds for the local match. And we have these two programs that have been open to county staff and our CCPs. So the first program is our loan repayment program, which provides educational loan repayment assistance to staff in our public mental health system. The second one is the clinical master and doctoral graduate education stipend and eligible students will receive funding for postgraduate clinical master and doctoral education. In addition to developing a charter, the Workforce Development Committee has also achieved two accomplishments related to these programs. The committee established the eligibility criteria and determined the retention requirement, such as a two year work commitment working in our county's public mental health system. Like other participating counties, we have a third party entity, Cal Mesa, managing the review of the applications, verification of the employment of the applicants, and finalizing the participation agreements of qualified awardees. Cal Mesa plans to provide the department with a final list of awardees on September 1st. Next slide, please. Currently, we are also conducting the community planning process for the county's MHSA three-year plan covering fiscal years 2024 through 26, and the mid-year adjustment plan for this current fiscal year. As part of our MHSA three-year community planning process, in February, we administered a community-wide survey, a first of its kind for our department to find out the general state of our community's mental health and substance use needs. In addition, we held 25 virtual community conversations sessions to complement the survey. Three of these virtual sessions were focused on obtaining feedback directly from our behavioral health providers that specifically support one, children, youth, and family programs, two, adult and older adult programs, and third, access and unplanned services. In addition to the feedback we received through these activities, as we developed preliminary recommendations for the county's web plan, we also took into account the feedback we received through our WET survey the team administered throughout the year, the ideas and recommendations from the Workforce Development Committee, the inter-collaborative meetings with our CCPs, and the Behavioral Health Contractors Association. Two of the wet recommendations here include adjusting the county stipend rate to a competitive rate uh, from $13.85 to $18 per hour for county and CCP interns, and also adjusting the peer intern rate of $16 to $18 per hour. If we can continue to the next slide, please. Um, as you see here, our MHSA recommendations continue with the next one that is very significant as we are increasing the number of slots for our students from 32 to 66 and pair interns from 13 to 28. And as you can see, you can see the breakout between our county and our CCPs. Also, we are increasing the number of scholarships from 14 to 30 and then also developing a training team to support both county and the CCP workforce. Lastly, um, as you may have uh, probably heard from me, one of the things that we really wanna encourage is uh, early interest in entering this career. 
And so by developing a new program called our new peer mentoring program that will target high school and community college students, I, we hope that we can engage more youth to enter this field. This concludes my presentation and I pass this on to our next presenter. Thanks, Jan. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, so the department, uh, the next slide I'm, I'm going to talk about the internal partnership that we've had with ESA. Um, our department has established a strong relational partnership with our employee services agency who have supported and assisted us in developing creative new ways to enhance our recruitment efforts and to attract prospective candidates. Over the past year, several initiatives have been developed or established derived through the Center for Leadership and Transformations Rapid Transformation Initiative. The focus was to brainstorm strategies using out of the box ideas that would create unique and enticing opportunities with a goal of garnering interest in this profession. One of the highlights, and as Sherry mentioned previously, um, of our partnerships listed on this slide is the forthcoming offering of a sign on bonus for newly hired clinical staff projected to be launched next month. Additionally, creative, creative ways to better analyze and assess our recruitment efforts have been established. Since January of this year, we have offered a series of specialized recruitments for our psychiatric social worker and marriage and family therapist positions. Each recruitment concentrated on one of the three key deliveries of service the department provides. The intent of this effort is to provide better insight into what programs garnered interest at varying levels with the intention of using this data to better focus and prioritize recru recruitment efforts to highest areas of need. Several other initiatives are in the development pipeline and once implemented, the department will be able to assess how much of an impact these initiatives have made in addressing our workforce shortage. Next slide, please. And um, continuing to strengthen partnerships with our network of providers is paramount to ensuring appropriate levels of service to our community. In the summer of last year, the department and the Behavioral Health Contractors Association, as Jen mentioned, um, launched a workforce development committee with the goal of a collective and unified effort to tackle workforce shortages this entire field has incurred, and in an effort to establish new initiatives and various enhancements of current programs. In March of this year, we implemented two repayment programs to assist students with tuition and education loans. In June of this year, we also la launched the Strategic Workforce Development Workgroup that will provide strategic support to various committees established from this partnership. Next slide, please. Our partnership with the BHCA launched the following structure. Um, as previously mentioned, uh, establishing a strategic workforce development work group uh, consisting of members of the BHCA and the employees of, the, of our department. The goal of this work group is to coordinate, align, and prioritize countywide and network-wide strategies to address the public behavioral health workforce, workforce shortage and crisis. Additionally, expanding the workforce development co committee consisting of the BHCA, Santa Clara County Office of Education, our department, and other providers. This committee will translate priorities identified by the Strategic Workforce Development Workgroup into action with a feedback loop back to the workgroup. Um, and Alisa will now share insight into these priori prioritized strategies in the, in the next slide. Thank you, Darren. Good afternoon. Thank you, supervisors, for your emphasis on the workforce crisis and the opportunity to update you today. We're grateful to our colleagues at the county for entering into partnership with us and starting to collaborate on seven strategic priorities. Members of county and provider staff have volunteered to serve on work groups corresponding to the areas that you see on the slide. A few highlights. The work to develop a behavioral health profession public awareness campaign will build on the lessons learned from a San Jose City College pilot and draw on the expertise of those who've developed successful public awareness campaigns, such as the suicide prevention effort in our county. We anticipate planning will result in being able to launch some of this campaign in the fourth quarter of this fiscal year. Once joint venture Silicon Valley completes its assessment of education training programs in our region, we'll convene leaders from these institutions to strategize how to expand both the number of graduates and attract them to work in the safety net. The goal is for this to occur in quarter three in order to move on strategies that can impact the next entering cohort of students. In the area of recruitment, Jan described the loan repayment workforce tuition intern stipend program expansions underway. 
this joint work group is tasked with further building on these state funded programs. In regard to uh, staff retention and development, a group of county and provider quality assurance staff will review contracts to identify local requirements that exceed state requirements. The information from this review is projected to inform mid-year contract adjustments as appropriate. We're reaching out to the National Council for Wellbeing to identify the options for a middle management academy this is a training that is nationally known and could provide support and development to managers throughout the system. Finally, it's critical that the safety net remain competitive in regard to compensation and not fall behind other providers in the region. This work group is identifying a process for an annual regional compensation survey to inform contracts for services. The county and provider staff in this partnership bring diverse perspectives and resources to implement creative approaches to recruiting and retaining a strong workforce. We look forward to updating you as the work progresses. Thank you, Elisa. And um, the next slide is going to provide some updates on calling. Yeah, good afternoon, supervisors. Uh, our last subject here for us to cover is CalAIM and some updates on our tracking and progress towards uh, meeting those milestones and uh, deliverables. So uh, drawing your attention to the bottom of the slide first, uh, we have three phases. Phase one to be implemented by 9-30-22, phase two in March of 23, then phase three in uh, September of 23. And so we've given some um, updates here around payment reform, policy changes, and data exchange progress, deliverables, and milestones for phase one. Generally speaking, that's what we're tracking towards right now as we're just coming up on the 9-30-22 date. And then after that, we will be moving on to phase two. In terms of payment reform, uh, the implementation of the CPT codes in the EHR, both our legacy uh, EHR, Unicare, as well as our current uh, EHR, my avatar, have been uh, assured to be updated for the available CPT codes as those become more clear, which we expect to happen a little bit later this year. So they are prepared for that phase of our implementation. Um, in terms of policy changes, there's a lot of work underway. We have four different active work groups. Those include documentation redesign, DMCODS, peer support services, as well as a My Avatar specific group. And so those groups are tracking different changes in terms of policy. They are updating policies and uh, documentation standards, creating new audit tools, um, documentation manuals, et cetera, to reflect the changes that Kaleem represents. And then phase one for our data exchange, we are working to establish uh, you know, data sharing agreements. Some of those are already up and working with our managed care partners, and we'll continue to track towards assuring that all of our interoperability and other standards as uh, Kaleem continues are rolled out accordingly uh, with the, the milestones and deliverables set about by the Behavioral Health Quality Improvement Program, the BHQIP. So that's our current status and our update for Cal Um, Turn it back to either Darren or Sherry. Great, thank you so much, Brian, and thank you to all of our presenters. Um, that concludes our presentation and uh, we're open to any questions uh, from any of the board members. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry, Key, Darren, Jeannie, Elisa, and Brian. That was uh, quite a team you put on. Thank you for the uh, PowerPoint presentation you sent us in advance, which allowed us to go through it and digest it. Vice President Ellenberg. You might be heading this way, Supervisor Washman. I would be interested in hearing public comments and then uh, following up with my own. Yeah, we're doing 10, 11, and 26 together, then we'll have public comment um, on them. But if you've got a question prior, otherwise we'll turn to number 11. Nope, Think, thanks for explaining your, your procedure. Thank you very much. Greg. Yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon, President Wasserman, members of the board. This is Greg Etoria, County Budget Director. And item number 11 is a report on the funding options for behavioral health workforce development and behavioral health facility development. 
and include it in your packet or updates for uh, funding, uh, grant funding from the state and some of the opportunities that that affords, particularly with the success we've had so far in providing funding for behavioral health facility development. It also uh, notes the, the current reserve for future behavioral health operations and opportunities to, to grow that uh, to the extent the, the board uh, so directs. And it also describes other restricted funding sources that are restricted for behavior health uh, services, but how they could be leveraged and in support with uh, multiple funding sources to support behavior health workforce development and, and facility improvement. So at this point, I'll pause and see if there's questions either now or when we get through the rest of the presentations. Thank you, Greg. There's no hands up. As of now, we're going to turn to number 26 for Mr. Jeff Draper. Oh, I see David Berry. David, kick it off. Thank you. Good afternoon. Dave Berry here from Facilities and Fleet, uh, Chief of Facilities Planning Services. Uh, we were asked to report on the conditions assessments of the uh, Don Lowe and the Bar Barbara Aarons pavilions. Um, and basically, we're looking at approximately both buildings are about 30,000 square feet. They're uh, around over 30 years old each. They're one story buildings. And uh, if we were to uh, renovate to reuse them, we would basically be taking them down to the studs and spending quite a bit of money um, to renovate these buildings. Now, um, in the near future, we'll be uh, coming back or the administration will be coming back with the results of the VMC master plan, which will um, uh, give recommendations on uh, future possible reuse uh, of either the structures or, or um, the land beneath these structures. And that concludes my report. Here, happy to answer any questions about these facilities. Thank you very much, David. And with that, supervisors, if there's no objection, we'll turn to our speakers. Dave, we get one minute each. Certainly, one moment while we get the timer up. Next speaker is Andrew Siegler. Andrew, I'm unmuting you. You have, uh, please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Andrew Siegler. I am a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and the Sacred Heart Housing Action Committee. I'm a registered and active voter and taxpayer in Santa Clara County District 2. This county is in the midst of a major a, a major mental health crisis, and yet there's inadequate funding for helping our most vulnerable. The county needs strategic investments to improve the quality and capacity of boarding care homes. It's inexcusable that county contracted mental health providers need to resort to placing people with mental illness in homes that do not reflect the dignity and respect that human beings deserve. The county needs to both increase and the capacity of housing for people with mental disabilities and ways to improve the quality so the environment is conducive to the process of getting well. We urge the county to prioritize the formation of a task force that will help address capacity and quality issues that exist within the continuum of care in Santa Clara County. Take action. Take action now. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Brody Story. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Brody, we're going to ask you to unmute. Brody is not responding. We'll go to the next speaker. Next speaker is David Surluck. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. My name is David Surluck. I'm a member of Survivors of the Street. I'm here because I want to urge the Board of Supervisors to support the creation of a task force that will address the need for quality and abundant housing to support people with mental disabilities or illnesses. We need to ensure that peer support is central to independent living empowerment project. Peer support has been an effective component to helping consumers recover and heal while taking steps toward independence. It should also accurately reflect the initial application for the MHSA grant, which listed three to five peer supporters in a budget item. We urge the county to prioritize the formation of a task force that will help address capacity and quality issues that exist within the continuum of care in Santa Clara County. The consequences of inaction often lead to encountering the legal system or ending up homeless because the support system was not adequate to meet the needs of the population of Santa Clara County. Along with the members of SOS, we call on the county to take action and take action. Next speaker is Deborah Townley. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Deborah Townley. I'm a, I'm a member of Survivors of the Streets at Sacred Heart. 
I have experience with uh, caring for my community through child care licensing. The licensing process provides accountability and parameters such as space requirements, nutrition plans, daily activities, safety, and a clear expectation of excellence for serving those who depend on community for quality care. We urge the county to prioritize the formation of a task force that will help address the overcapacity and quality issues in room and board and independent living. As we speak, people living in these housing units suffer overcrowding, non-nutritious meals, plumbing and heating issues, bug infestations, and a lack of qualified staff support. People are reporting further deterioration of their health. Some would rather be homeless. A qualified task force to address these issues is urgent and imperative. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Jen Meyer. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Jen Meyer. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart, a D2 voter, taxpayer, and SEIU 521 worker. I support the Lee and Ellenberg memo and ask the board to prioritize investments in behavioral health. A friend working with on house folks shared that there is no same day detox in the county and as someone with addicts in my family I know that immediate help when they seek it is how addicts become sober. Also, instead of spending money on a new jail the county could prioritize pro providing housing for people with mental disabilities or illnesses. Nearly half of folks in our jails and of those who are in house have a serious mental illness there isn't enough quality boarding care for those who need it. I support survivors of the street when they ask for a seat at the table for directly affected folks. Our behavioral health health crisis has also overcrowded our jails and we need jail population reduction. It's actually safer overall if folks await trial at home instead of inside. According to the Civil Rights Corps, multiple rigorous studies show that people who are kept in jail pretrial are more likely to commit crimes than folks released to home. We need to treat behavioral health like the emergency it is and treat it holistically. Next speaker is Leslie Zeiger. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Leslie, I'm asking you to unmute. And Leslie is not responding. We'll go on to the next speaker. Next speaker is Lorraine Zeller. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Lorraine Zeller, and I'm a member of Survivors of the Streets. We urge you to support a task force, including consumers and providers at the decision-making tables to address the urgent need for quality and abundant housing, supporting people with mental health disabilities, and address continuing capacity and quality issues that exist within our continuum of care. As Supervisors Ellenberg and Lee pointed out in their memo, these issues are longstanding. As survivors of the streets, we are painfully aware of the critical lack of step-down beds for consumers discharging from inpatient hospitalizations. We are the ones who remain or are placed in settings that are, as the memo points out, inappropriate to recovery. So again, we urge formation of a task force and immediate action, uh, consequences of inaction too often lead to encounters with legal system, homelessness, rehospitalizations, and death because the support. Next speaker is Mary Helen Doherty. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Mary, are you there? Mary is not responding. We will move to the next speaker. Next speaker is Nancy Cavallones. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Nancy Cavallones. I live in District 5, and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart and the Care of Post Coalition. First and foremost, in the spirit of Care of Post, I would like to say that I support the Lee and Ellenberg memo. And as far as priorities go, a non-cultural mental health facility and alternative to incarceration must take priority over a new jail. Supporting alternatives to incarceration and reducing the jail population in the first place radically shifts the question of whether a new jail makes sense at all. Let's start with answering survivors of the streets call for community input and investment in quality care that is abundant enough to serve all who need it. Thank you. Next speaker is Rosemary McCarthy. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Oh, hi. This is Rosemary McCarthy. I've been a 
trial lawyer and a resident of this county for over 30 years. I have much experience with mentally ill people that have been arrested, that have been incarcerated, that have also been in 72 hour hold with EPS and also Don Lowe Pavilion, Barbara Aaron's Pavilion, even way back to Crestwood and Sart that this county had literally gave the beds away. A couple of years ago, I want uh, this county made a huge step. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wasserman and Cindy Chavez and the rest that you hired uh, telecare partners in wellness. That was a huge step in the right direction. One of my clients was in and out of police uh, units once a month. And when he was in the telecare partners and wellness, he didn't go to, he did not have any incarcerations or any dealings with cops, hospitals, or anything for two years. I support Lee and uh, 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 Ellenberg's uh, memo. Thank you. Next speaker is Chris Logan. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Yes, my name is Chris Logan. I'm an organizer for Survivors of the Streets, a committee of people who are unhoused or have unhoused experience. Uh, should go without saying that the intersection between mental health and homelessness is extremely clear. And in building relationships with these individuals, I have found that many of them have been touched by the injustice happening within our, our system of boarding care housing for people with mental disabilities or illness. Issues of habitability, harassment, um, lack of dignity and respect have been consistent complaints. The unavailability of quality life license boarding care has forced many people into unregulated forms of housing that are not conducive to their recovery and healing. We are appreciative of the memo issued by Supervisors Ellenberg and Lee, but the one thing that is clear from our conversations with people is that lived experience is really important to be a part of this process. Uh, we also appreciate the additional funds found for shared housing, uh, but we are calling on the board to create a task force that includes consumers and providers to help address these issues and uh, execute a plan the people believe in. Thank you. David? David, I can't hear you if you're speaking. Next. Oops, almost. Sorry, President Wasserman, can you hear me? I can now. Yes. Okay. I apologize. I had some issues with my Zoom. I, I think I may have gotten temporarily booted out of the meeting. Um, gotcha. Next speaker is uh, Sandra Asher. Sandra, you have one minute. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Sandra Asher. I'm a member of Safety for All Disability Justice Coalition, a board member of Community Solutions, and a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. I'm here today to support to voice my support for the changes mentioned in Supervisor Ellenberg and Lee's memo, I urge the Board of Supervisors to hold the county administration accountable for meeting the needs of people with mental disabilities, especially in the midst of a recognized mental health and substance use crisis. Many of our neighbors are still falling through the cracks. It's not enough, there is not enough licensed housing to support those who have mental illness. Our county resources and social workers resort to unregulated housing with deplorable conditions. I amplify the voice of our partner, Survivor of the Streets, who call for peer support as a critical part of this housing and central to the Independent Living Empowerment Project. The consequences of an action often lead to encountering the criminal legal system or ending up homeless because the support system was not adequate to meet the needs of the population, thus exacerbating these issues in our community. Fund our mental health system now and put care first. Thank you. Next speaker is Tila Pulliam. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Tila Pulliam, and I'm a District 5 resident and voter and member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart. As we've been hearing, Santa Clara County is in the midst of a mental health crisis. However, many of our neighbors are still falling through the cracks. There's not enough licensed housing to support those who have mental illness. Our partner, Survivors of the Streets, reports terrible conditions that exist in both licensed board and care, as well as unregulated types of housing that people with mental disabilities are referred to by caseworkers. I urge the Board of Supervisors to prioritize the formation of a task force to include community input that will help address capacity and quality issues that exist within the continuum of care in Santa Clara County. The consequences of inaction often lead to encountering the legal system, ending up in jail or homeless because the support system is not adequate. I call on the county to take action and take action now. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Julia M. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Julia Mangioni, and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice, Surge, at Sacred Heart Community Service. And I'm speaking today in solidarity with survivors of the streets. 
We believe that investing in a jail before investing in support systems to address our countywide behavioral health crisis is deplorable. People need to be supported as they recover, and investment in preventive care is imperative. Nothing in this system should be profit motivated, and it should be impossible for any of the, our partners in this system to be squeezing profit from a system that should be focused on care. Behavioral health services should be prioritizing the voices and demands of those most impacted and most at risk, including a greater focus on peer support. Care first with respect and dignity always. I see the rest of my time. Thank you. Next speaker is Christoph Raboa. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hey, Christoph. Christoph, are you there? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and Board of Supervisors. This is Chris Rabot, CEO for Rebecca Children's Services. And on behalf of the BHCA and my colleagues, I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity to provide an update on the pervasive concern regarding the current credentialing process for newly hired mental health staff across our system. We conducted a point in time study from a survey last week. The data indicated that providers reported that 60 staff recently hired have not been serving clients due to waiting to be credentialed. 52 of these staff went beyond the agreed upon 14 days to be credentialed. Critically, this equates to 537 clients not being served due to the 60 staff are waiting to be credentialed. We have been in ongoing collaborative discussions with Behavioral Health, and they have been responsive. However, the current credentialing process requires both short-term and long-term solutions so that all can be served. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Steve Eckert. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, supervisors and members of the county executive team. I'm Steve Eckert, CEO of Allen Rock Counseling Center. I'm also president this year of the Santa Clara County Behavioral Health Contract Association, BHCA, for actually the next two years. Uh, we recognized the collaboration between County Behavioral Health and BHCA last year in creatively providing rate increases to providers to retain our workforce. In a market where there's not enough candidates, I had staff who wanted to stay, but as our pay was nowhere near competitive, they were leaving for higher pay. This increase in pay will not solve the workforce emergency, but it helps for now. Mental health providers received rate increases and increased pay accordingly. Some of my colleagues who provide such substance use treatment services have not had rate increases yet, and they are at risk as their pay is not competitive. While behavioral health has begun meeting with uh, such providers, we urge immediately in this process to resolve parity issues. Thank you for this opportunity. Next speaker is Mary Gloner. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Gloner. I'm the CEO of Project Safety Net. And I also serve on the MHSA Stakeholder Leadership Committee. I'm also speaking with lived experience and witness my family immigrant um, navigating the Santa Clara County's behavioral health system, including 5150. I implore to continue to build on the momentum of the strength of integrating the leadership of all of five supervisors who have done significant work on building behavioral health systems that are community centered and with the commitment of um, county staff. I think it's important that we build on this momentum so that we live upon the legacy of what uh, we have done rather than um, being in the shadows of the pandemic and the racist uh, efforts of the past two years. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Tran Ho. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Tran and I am a member of the Sacred Heart Housing Action Committee. I wanna urge the Board of Supervisors to address the need for quality and abundant housing to support people with mental disabilities or illnesses. People who have experienced living in these housing units face issues of overcrowding and a lack of staff support. Instead of being a place to encourage recovery, people have reported their conditions getting worse. The county needs to focus on establishing more mental health and addiction recovery services instead of, instead of spending millions of dollars on a new jail. Along with the members of Sacred Heart, we call on the county to take action now. Thank you. Next speaker is Brody Story. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Brody Story. I am a employee at Covenant House California, a youth interim housing facility and a founding member of Hero Tent. People who have lived experience in housing facilities face issues of overcrowding, non-nutritious meals, plumbing and heating issues, as well as a lack of support from staff who are trained to deal with complexities of their mental illness. Instead of being placed in 
uh, encourage recovery. People have reported their conditions getting worse. The task force should it, uh, investigate if there are ways to improve living conditions, foster better coordination, better uh, between the county and the community care licensing and the and improve the environment in independent living room and board housing. Uh, on a personal note, at the facility I currently work at, there is not enough uh, care and support that we can provide. Uh, often cases and people fall through the cracks uh, when it comes to mental health. Thank you, Marty. Next speaker is Kylie Clark. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Kylie Clark and I'm the Public Policy Coordinator at West Valley Community Services. I'm here today to strongly urge the Board of Supervisors to support the creation of a task force that will address the need for quality and abundant housing to support people with mental disabilities or illnesses. We've heard it time and again directly from the individuals that our agency serves. The living conditions in these housing units are despicable and dehumanizing. The meals are non-nutritious, there are problems with heating and cooling, they're overcrowded, and there's a massive lack of staff support. This regularly leads to the issues that people are getting treated for becoming worse, not only wasting money and time, but also imposing an injustice upon those who need help. This task force will be a powerful mechanism for exploring ways to improve these conditions, foster better coordination between the county and community care licensing, and improve the environment. Assembling this task force is the least that the county can do to work to solve what we can all agree is a worsening crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Walter Wilson. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Walter. I'm sorry, I inadvertently raised my hand. Already? All right. Um, next speaker is Leslie Zeger. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Leslie Zeiger. As a member of Showing Up for Ra Racial Justice at Sacred Heart, I support the call from survivors of the streets asking you to create a task force that will address the need for quality and ab abundant housing to support people with me mental disabilities. I also support Supervisor Ellenberg and Supervisor Lee's memo requesting that you join them in holding county exec accountable to following the board's direction on approved and pending behavioral health items. Do those things instead of insisting on building a new jail. Updating jail plans is like sucking on breath mints to combat tooth decay. It might take away the bad breath of incarceration for a few minutes, but really our county needs to start flossing and brushing to improve safety and well-being for all. Flossing would be addressing the root causes that drive marginalization, like prioritizing quality and abundant housing for people with mental health disabilities. Thank you. Next speaker is a phone caller ending in 209. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. I'm going to ask you to hit star six on your phone to unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Amanda Cole, um, also with SOS and many other groups, and I'm also a mom. So um, I can't possibly do this in a minute. My daughter is stuck in all of the cracks and has been for about 14 years. She's at Elmwood right now, waiting for a ride to crisis residential, but her caseworker quit. So um, she's been there for three months. It was supposed to be two days, and there's been a bed available uh, the whole time. Uh, I also went, uh, visited a board and care slash room and board slash flop house yesterday. Uh, so there were cracks on the walls. Uh, the, the carpeting wasn't even recognizable as a carpet. A person was sleeping in the room when I uh, was shown the room. Uh, there's also a crack in the caseworker situation um, with the, the turnover is really disruptive. Um, her current caseworker also hasn't shown up to court. Next speaker is a phone caller ending in 694. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is John Betts. I'm also a member of SOS Survivors of the Street. I believe community oversight um, task force would really be a good idea, not just to oversee uh, the board and chairs and room and boards, but also to oversee 
behavioral health itself, because I feel like the top-down model isn't working that they seem to be providing now. We recently got my daughter placed in their behavioral health new AOP program. Um, but like um, they start out really great with 17 members meet us once or something. Uh, but then like um, three months later, we don't even know who her caseworker is because the first one quit. The second one they've appointed won't even talk to us when we're at the court next daughter's court meeting. And three months later, the daughter's still in jail. Next speaker is Kim Guptill. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Yes, I just have uh, several bullet points I'd like to hit. I, I, first of all, I encourage you to definitely put care first. I want to let you know we support, I support the Leon Ellenberg memo, and I uh, ask you to please prioritize the non-carceral mental health facility first. And um, I would add that we need abundant preventive mental health and addiction recovery services first. Mm -hmm. And I also support survivors of the street in their call for community input on improvements to board and care for investment in quality and abundant board and care. And um, what directly folks really directly effective folks really want is, is community input on board and care improvement. To, that is to have a seat at the table. Um, I hope that the stories of the SOS members keep you folks awake at night because you need to fix this mess. Thank you very much. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. Thank you. Next speaker is Mary Helen Doherty. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Mary Helen Doherty, are you there? I'm going to ask you to unmute one more time. And Mary Helen is not responding. We'll move on to the next speaker. Next speaker is Joe Cafaro. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, Joe. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, the hospital council members appreciate your commitment and continued focus and attention to the behavioral health system. We support all efforts to increase capacity, specifically with the step down facilities that are mentioned. We appreciate any type of way to increase capacity capacity and um, help with workforce challenges. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. Next speaker is Catherine Hedges. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Hedges. I'm a registered voter in District 2, a member of SURGE and Sacred Heart, Action, Sacred Heart Housing Action Committee supporting survivors of the streets. I support the Lee and Ellenberg memo. The jail is not a mental health facility. Although it houses so many of our mental health patients and moving mental health patients from the jail to a more appropriate environment would help reduce the jail population and overcrowding. We need to provide care first, jail never, for community members with mental health challenges. We must focus on alternatives to incarceration, which includes appropriate living conditions and peer support for people leaving the jails in inpatient mental health facilities. Living in overcrowded, unlicensed board and room facilities without peer mentorship exacerbates their problems. When they decompensate, this can lead to police involvement and even going back to jail. This is why we need to form a task force to reform the board and care system and ensure humane living conditions, peer support, and other needs are met. Thank you very much. Thank and you. that concludes our public speakers. Thank you, David. Great job, as always. Okay, board members, we've heard from 24 members of the public. We've heard from staff presentations on 10, 11, and 26. They are all received reports, but I see Vice President Ellenberg with her hand up. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you very much, President Wasserman. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge and thank all of the staff members that were involved in, in the reports for 10, 11, and 26. I really appreciate the efforts uh, that have been made to develop metrics for the five priorities and the collaborative work with providers on the process issues that were requested in this report, in this last report in May. It is really clear to me that progress is being made by the department in several areas. And I see and appreciate the effort of our behavioral health staff, leadership, contracted providers, and other system stakeholders. Regarding the metrics, I'd like to direct that those be vetted uh, with the expanded stakeholder leadership committee 
to refine and bring back to the board with the MHSA plan when it returns to the board in December. Back us up for a second. Um, on January 11th, this board unanimously approved a referral to declare mental health and substance use disorders a public health crisis in Santa Clara County. Since that date, January 11th, our medical examiner has reported that 188 people have died due to drug overdose and 106 people have died by suicide. So in just seven months, that's a loss of nearly 300 of our children, siblings, parents, friends, and neighbors, and they are preventable deaths. They also, of course, represent only a portion of the number of people that suffer the impacts of mental illness and addiction. This is a public health crisis because people are dying. Our current system of care is not equipped to meet the demands. We know that on any given day, our acute inpatient facilities, such as the Barbara Ahrens Pavilion, are full. Our contracted IMD beds are full. And we have patients who could step down to care in residential facilities or boarding care, but those facilities, as we heard numerous times today, are also not available. We have to move with the greatest urgency to meet these needs. I see the really hard work of our frontline clinicians, community-based providers, and behavioral health services department staff and leadership. And it seems to me that everyone is working very hard with great compassion within a system that is fundamentally broken. They're working with the resources that have been currently allocated to them and are providing the best care that they can. But we need to move beyond patching together what we have to focusing on what we need to fill all of the gaps and make this function, make the system function. We have critical gaps, as the reports noted, in our workforce and care facilities, including support of housing and residential settings, again, as illustrated by the speakers today. It's true that we have unspent MHSA funds, yet we cannot draw those step funds down. They're dedicated to programming if we don't have the people or the places to provide that programming and care. We see fund balances that accumulate in our restricted behavioral health funds and in numerous findings from our independent auditor. My colleagues and I have all pressed for this action in various ways through the approval of funds, new programs and facilities through the Board of Supervisors to county administration. I believe we need to show the same level of urgency that we exhibited so expertly during COVID to scale up a whole of county response cut any of the bureaucratic tape that slows down work between our program staff, facility planners, the budget office, and others. When the pandemic began, a driving force for the closure, um, for the, the shutdown closures, was the fear of not having hospital beds available for people who would need them. We've essentially tolerated a long-standing bed shortage for mental health and substance use disorder services and we've lost thousands of lives because of that shortage. We can't wait another minute and we must act as though lives depend on us because clearly they do. The memo that Supervisor Lee and I attached to today's agenda lists several items where we are calling for accelerated action by our administration, in many cases where the board has already given direction and allocated funds. So with that, I'd like to offer a motion that the county executive report to the Board of Supervisors during a public meeting on December 6, 2022, on progress against the specific performance charges listed in the attached men, uh, memo. And I will hope to have a second. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Happy to second. Vice, and like to give a friendly Supervisor, Supervisor Lee, go right ahead. You seconded the motion. Yes, thank you, President Wasserman. I'd Oops. like to uh, certainly second it uh, strongly and uh, want to also offer a friendly amendment to uh, also request off a general report uh, within the 90 days uh, that will be presented uh, to us and eventually also to be presented no less than the following board, full board meeting. Um, and I would like to uh, stress that uh, urgency because of the fact that this is an urgent issue. 
uh, and whether or not, uh, where do we call a special meeting to deal with this for the full board or whether we just do the regularly scheduled meeting. I, I'm, I'm open to it, to, to administration. So if that's an amendment that would be acceptable to make it. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg, acceptable to you. So just to be clear, you want the report on, on these seven items in writing at 90 days, which is right. about November yes. 28th, which might be Thanksgiving, and then a verbal report to come to the board at the first meeting in December. Correct. That's, that's correct. Yes. That's fine. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. okay with the motion maker. Thank you. Anything else, Supervisor Lee? Yeah, I'll keep it short. Um, I think uh, a lot has been said, but the bottom line is that our mental health system is in crisis in our county and far too dire to continue business as usual. We need to unclog these bottlenecks, cut, cut the red tape, and really get this moving. We already know what needs to happen from all the reams of study we have been reading, and we do have funds that are unspent, and we don't have enough mental health professionals to help do some of this work. What we're trying to do today is we're really trying to speed up the process because there's certainly urgency to save lives. The number of lives that uh, Supervisor Ellenberg has mentioned, uh, and the ideas of simply things like same-day detox, as mentioned by some speakers earlier, these are services that's absolutely needed to save our lives. Early today, we talked about the need of getting a Narcan um, and uh, the test kits of meth out there. These are all related issues to what we're dealing with in terms of mental health and also the health issues. And a lot of these issues really takes all of us urgently to solve. And I, I, I can't uh, make it more uh, urgent than our need. And I think 90 days is... Uh, certainly still a long time, but I think at least to give the administration the time to get back to us on how we can speed up these process. When I hear dates of 24 or 2025, what tells me is that it doesn't feel like we are moving fast enough. Uh, and some of these things, I really do think that uh, we really can do more. And I think that's the reason why we're trying to plead our administration and our partners to work together to come up with solutions to try to unclog these. Thank you. Thank you very much, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I want to um, thank the staff and thank all the speakers and, of course, my colleagues for their thoughtful uh, feedback. Um, I, I have two broad questions. Um, and Sherry, this may be a question to you. I know that um, Lee had spoken earlier about how how updates and how reports um, should come to the board. And I think this, and I understand it was an attempt by your staff to really focus the number of reports because you wanna be focused on the work. The challenge that I wanna make sure I understand is how, where you're landing on, on uh, communication. I understand you talked to all of the board and what's your plan um, to keep the board updated? Sure. Sure. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that Dr. Smith has his hand up, so I wanted to just check in to see whether he may want to respond. Sure. Defer to the boss, Dr. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank all of Behavioral Health, everyone who presented, Lisa Kost Ginsburg from the Behavioral Health Care Alliance. Um, they've been doing a huge amount of work to address these issues. And I think um, all of the issues that are brought up in the um, memo uh, from Supervisor uh, Ellenberg and Supervisor Otto Lee were addressed um, in those memo, in those presentations. Um, I point out that we have quarterly responses to the board about progress regarding behavioral health and our next quarterly is due on December 6th. Um, we have multiple reports to the subcommittees um, and particularly to HHC. And when the board is finished uh, discussing, I'd like to give a short response to the memo from the supervisors to recap what's going on. Um, Already? We will do that. Supervisor Chavez, anything else? Yeah, uh, yes, thank you. I, 
just so I understand this, I, I have to say that what I'm overall concerned about is that um, if in fact we are saying this is an emergency, and if in fact we are trying to in real time improve these services, then what I remain concerned about is that that even with the quarterly report outs, that um, you're going to see more and more um, referrals. I, I, I have been thinking about them even as this discussion has been going on because I'm trying to really get my arms around how all of the investments we're making are, are actually being um, utilized with the timeline of those and how we're seeing effectiveness on them. So what, and I understand that the primary committee, this work body of work goes through is Supervisor Simidian's committee. But what I'm wondering and what I would like to see as part of the 90 day report back is, what is the most effective communication tool with the board that, that is distinct and clear about what we're investing in, what the outcomes are, what the waiting lists are, and what are the emerging needs, and that there be a mechanism for us to, to surface the parts of our system that we know, even though we're investing in them, may or may not be effective. Dr. Smith. Well, Vice President Ellenberg. I, I have just a thought or suggestion about that, Supervisor Chavez, but happy to hear from, from staff as well. I would recommend that we do a monthly, uh, hear a monthly report to the full board, uh, just as we did for, for so long with COVID. That way we all hear. Um, I absolutely understand your, your instinct to do more referrals. I've talked about that with Dr. Smith, that when we don't have the full picture and we don't fully understand what we're going, we are all very passionate and tempted to put in our own uh, patches. So I, um, I know Dr. Smith wants to make some comments, but maybe he can address um, that as a possibility as well. Thank you. And then I'll just close with this. Um, I, I just want to share with my colleagues one of the things that I was sharing with um, with uh, Dr. Smith. You know, and I, I, I really feel for our staff um, because I think Sherry and the team are kind of working as fast and as hard as they can and we're pulling you in a lot of different directions. And part of the reason for that is that with all of the conversation we're having at this level, you know, I, um, I see um, in the streets and really even outside our building, you know, a young man pulling out his hair. I was telling Dr. Smith, I saw on, on my way into work the other day, or uh, yesterday, a, you know, a, a person having a joyful conversation with himself while he had blood dripping down the side of his face. And I think that I recognize that we're all dealing with state laws that inhibit our ability to do some of what we think needs to be done. But what I would really like to understand is how, how concretely we are keeping people from just cycling through a system and what, what's the off of the merry-go-round? Like where do they get off and where are they safe? And if we don't have answers for really high need people, then we should just say that and we should be working with the state to help us figure it out. And Colleagues, you know, one of the, the, the things that I'm seeing that I'm most concerned about is the extreme use of meth and other chemically developed um, drugs that I think are causing severe, severe um, issues for folks that I don't think we have a, an easy pl a pl place for them. And I think we have to be okay with having that conversation so that we're better able to invest in the appropriate part of the system. And I, I don't wanna be in a position where I'm, you know, where I'm saying to Sherry, go long and without them having the, even the, even the possibility of helping that person. Like, let's just talk about it. And I am going to be making a request um, through Dr. Smith, Sherry, that you and or some of your senior team um, go to some of the communities that are really heavily impacted and, and to see these patients that are in such high need, because I don't think we have systems in place to even have meaningful conversations with them and they're not fast enough 
right? I think one of the speakers made a really good point when someone is ready to get detox. I mean, we've been talking about medical detox, you know, for years. And, and now I'm at, at the place where I'm, I'm done, like the human suffering is too profound. But the, but, you know, so there's medical detox. And then there, there's just how long it takes us to actually respond. And if we're responding to somebody who's homeless and, and really mentally ill, by the time we get there, they're gone. You know, so what are, you know, and again, I, I want to make sure that um, I, I really want you to hear that I, I am not blaming you guys. I'm not. I just think this is a really hard situation. And I'm really asking for how we can communicate most effectively. What are the barriers? I don't want you to have to hide them from us. That's really what I'm saying is just let us know what they are. And let's be able to tell each other and the public the truth. And then you know, again, I'll just wrap up with this point that the, the governor has come up with this idea around care court. And my biggest fear about care court is we have a new process for people and no placement for them and no significant changes in state law that help us serve them. And again, I, I there's part of care court that makes a lot of sense to me, but then we should have a strategy around care court so that as we use care court, we can explain to the state what changes in real time need to be made um, to allow us to really serve these high need communities. Um, so thank you for doing an extremely hard job, Sherry. I know I ask, we all do, are asking a lot of you, um, but let us know. I mean, we just we just want to be transparent. I think that's what you're hearing from the board. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Supervisor. Dr. Smith. Yes. Um... I had a few more comments. Um, obviously, the board and all of us, including you know all administration and behavioral health, recognize that behavioral health issues and substance issues are a health emergency in our community and across the nation. And a couple of comments about the nature of the emergency. Um, both behavioral health issues and substance abuse are chronic diseases with genetic predisposition and environmental factors that accelerate them. So unlike um, a viral infection or you know, a bacterial infection, the, treating these diseases is multifactorial and long-term. And there's no magic bullet that we've found yet you know, we're doing lots of research as a nation, as a world, to try to find better treatments, better medications, better support. But fundamentally, with a chronic disease, the only way that we can deal with it is by wrapping around multiple interventions. Then when you take the fact that behavioral health and substance abuse issues change your brain and they change the way that you interact with the public and your family makes it even harder because individuals have rights, but their brain has changed based on genetic and environmental factors as well as substance abuse. So, you know, the people who are committed to treatment of behavioral health issues and substance abuse issues are saints. Um, they really have an endless job and they have multiple needs and they have to wrap around services as best they can. And I think we have the best behavioral health system in the state, certainly, and probably in the nation. We invest well over $600 million in behavioral health and we're prepared to invest a lot more. We clearly have problems, but I think, uh, you know, given the fact that behavioral health and substance abuse um, problems have been emergencies for far more than a generation, uh, we're at a precipice where we actually can make a difference. And so I appreciate the board's anxiety and frustration and commitment to improve the lives of behaviorally disabled individuals, and we totally support that. Um, could I go through a little bit of response to the memo? Yes, please go ahead. I thought you were ending there with a, the, with a beautiful speech. Please continue. Nice try. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
really, I just wanted to reinforce what was pretty much already said, but add a few little details that wasn't weren't addressed specifically um, in the presentation, but were addressed in the uh, uh, memo. Can you see this? Yes, we can. Um, so the question about the acute inpatient facility, as the board knows, we did a RFP to build this design and build this facility and our first respondent, which was Excel, uh, did the design, which was quite good, um, but was not prepared to build the facility under the time frame that we thought it needed to be built in. So we went back out and did another RFP just to build the facility using the same design. We did not have any respondents to that RFP. Now, public works law in the state of California therefore allows a government agency after a failed RFP to uh, provoke interest by negotiating with qualified candidates. And we are this week talking with four potential contractors. Um, all four are quite qualified. We'll be able to build the facility uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to get a contract before the board for approval by November, but obviously it'll depend on the uh, negotiations and the cost. What's going on right now is discussion with all four about what their costs would be and what their, more importantly, what their time limit would be. We anticipate um, if everything goes well, that building will be finished in December of 2024. It will then need to be stocked and staffed and be open um, at least in January. But we're trying to push the contractors for an earlier time period uh, than that. Um, in terms of subacute beds, there are multiple questions in the memo. One has to do with the 650 Bascom. This is a building on Bascom that is owned by a uh, by Mr. Swenson's corporation. We lease the, the building. We have negotiated with uh, the Swenson Corporation for tenant improvements in order to create 28 new beds that will be subacute. Um, they're supposed to start construction on Friday, which is three days from now and they anticipate they'll be done by uh, April 2023. Um, and we're moving as fast as we can with that. This will provide 28 subacute beds and um, we're looking to expand another section of the building um, once we've moved some other services out of it. With regard to the workforce gaps, I, I think it was quite well um, explained in the presentation from behavioral health that funding is allocated and we'll be willing to fund more. Um, and the subcommittee is working on presenting us with a proposal. Um, the, most, the greatest difficulty is finding the specialized workers who do this job. Um, nationwide there is a shortage of psychiatrists and mental health specialists um, but i think we probably should schedule another meeting just particularly focused on recruitment and uh, the issues around um, bringing up a workforce uh, in mental health so we'll do that if the board approves in terms of social detox and medical detox, uh, the presentations I think went quite in detail about them. Uh, the ledge file explains them in some detail. Social detox beds are coming on um, line after we've been able to contract for them. Uh, medical detox is really an algorithm which is explained in the transmittal material. Um, and has to do with how individuals who are detoxing um, with serious medical problems can access uh, beds in a hospital. 
Um, the fund balance in MHSA is an important issue, which I think needs to have more discussion and FGOC is a good place for that discussion. MHSA has a lot of rules about what the money can be used for, how it can be used, and more importantly, the community input on the plan. Right now, the community uh, committee is working on a plan that they will recommend to the board. I think before that plan comes to the board, we should have a workshop for the board to give you an outline of what the limitations are and what the advantages are. Um, so we'll do that if the board requests. With regard to enhanced care management and community support issues related to CalAIM, CalAIM is a re-envisioning um, of all of Medi-Cal, including behavioral health. And this issue is being negotiated through the health plans. Um, the state is using health plans, Medi-Cal health plans, in order to implement CalAIM. So although behavioral health and social services and mental, I mean, uh, public health are involved in the ultimate plan, it's all being negotiated through health plan contracts. So we'll schedule in a, a meeting with uh, BHP and health services uh, we've already explained this to the subcommittee of the board, but I think it's probably best to bring it to the full board. So um, those are some answers to some of the questions that are listed in the transmittal, and uh, we'll be happy to provide you with more answers, more, more detail if you need. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. And I think your comments caused, yes, they did. Vice President Ellenberg, then Supervisor Lee. You're muted, Vice President. I think Supervisor Lee popped up before I did. I'm happy to defer. So you don't wish to speak now, Supervisor I do. Lee? I, oh. I do, but I'll speak after uh, Supervisor Lee. You'd prefer to speak after Supervisor Lee. All right, Supervisor Lee. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Smith, for the, uh, the the response. I was helpful to go through one by one, but I just only want to maybe understand a little bit more regarding the, as I mentioned, uh, the bottleneck type issue, right? So, for example, uh, really great news to hear that the 650 bathroom, that they're going to start the uh, renovation uh, by Friday uh, this week, which is good. Uh, just want to check in with you. Is there any possibility to... Uh, 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 work with these uh, folks on the PI to see if there's any way, you know, spend something as big as they are. I know they have a lot of folks working on this. Any way to speed up to to get us to us even as early as February and March next year and so into April? Dr. Smith. Yeah, we um, have asked them to go as fast as they can. Now that they're starting on Friday, we'll be present and pushing as much as we can. Um, it's a little challenging because we don't actually own the building and we're therefore relying upon our uh, landlord um, and the relationship he has with the contractor. We're not paying the contractor directly, we're paying the landlord. So um, we will push as fast as we can to get that done. Um, and, you know, we're also at the same time looking at other sites for step down units and imds that the county could actually own gotcha right now on the uh, second issue you mentioned uh regarding trying to get other uh, board and care uh treatment facilities you, you mentioned that you think we need to schedule another meeting uh, regarding the uh, regarding this i just want to make sure what supervisor of... lee you're you're echoing a bit i don't know quite what might cause that? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, That's is better. It, is it any better? Okay, All right, good. Yes. So, so my question is, uh, uh, in terms of the the you know we the on the memo we discuss about this uh, East Bay vendor right for trying to uh, uh, provide this uh, board and care residential treatment um, on these type of step down facilities. So uh, with the other ones, I just want to check in with you. Uh, what what's What's out there, basically, and 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 any idea that you might be able to come up with 
to see then any, any way we could speed up uh, getting some of these spaces uh, make available. Right, you know, on the slide that uh, Key showed that uh, Sherry talked about um, was the indication that we're trying to contract and having success with contracting with CBOs, mm -hmm. uh, Crestwood, uh, we're working to contract with the Northern County um, CBOs that you're talking about, um, and we're gonna be successful in adding beds at various skill levels. But as you can see from the memo and the graph that he showed you, mm -hmm. um, there's not a whole lot of availability in the community in the entire region. Um, on, so contracting will be important, but it won't solve our problem. Um, and we'll need to build step down units um, and the reason I thought we should have another meeting of the board to talk about it is to let you know what we're thinking from an administrative perspective, um, how we might be able to do that. Um, for example, I mean, there are multiple factors. I'll just pick one example. Um, you heard today that BAP and EPS buildings are really sort of beyond saving. Um, Mm -hmm. They are at a rating called 60%, which means that to rehab them to their current status or previous status would take 60% of their cost. So that's not worth investing in. We should just tear them down and build something there. And we think administratively that the best um, service to put there is a closed locked facility uh, probably dedicated to our Murphy bed, our Murphy um, patients, because these are patients that are under conservatorship, as you know, which is a special conservatorship called a Murphy conservatorship. Um, they're involved in the criminal justice system, but they're severely mentally disabled. Um, so it would be better from a healthcare perspective to have them close to an acute inpatient psych unit rather than in the community far away. Um, and so as was pointed out, we're gonna be coming back to the board with a modification of our um, master plan for the campus, trying to implement or include some of these recommendations that we've made to the board that have changed what you saw previously, um, in placing the emergency room in a different place, putting IMD and Murphy conservatorship beds in a different place, getting rid of uh, BAP and um, Don Lowe. Um, and we also need to include all of the issues that have to do with the new psych hospital. So. I think we need to go through that in some significant detail for the board to give us input and see exactly where we want to go. Right. Yeah, I was over at that last Tuesday and uh, <clears throat> certainly have observed that I believe there were, I think, six individuals that's in the Murphy conservative uh, situation where the, the, the stay that they're staying is certainly much, much longer with about years. Uh, and certainly it's taking a lot more resources than, than what BAP is designed to do, for example. Uh, so, so certainly I think that the closed facility that you mentioned is clearly, clearly needed. Uh, back to your Crestwood, uh, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that the contract there. On the slide, uh, it says uh, 45 estimated beds, right? Because currently we have 55 contracted out. Um, I'm not sure it's a typo, if it's true, but it says the contract with Crestwood will be amended by October, November, 2023. Does, do you mean 2022 over there? I'm just wanna double check. Yeah, this must have been a typo, uh, supervisor, apologies. Okay. Typo, October, November, 22, I'm sorry. Okay, good, all right. Having that, trouble with my mute button. Good. Sure. Yeah, it should be, it should be amended uh, before the end of the year. Okay, great. Right. By doing that, you'll be able to add uh, at least 20 beds by beginning of the year. And then that's why the other 25 uh, will be added uh, by, by now. The other thing is uh, by 20, 
20, June 24 or the June 23? We're talking about the additional 25. Is that typo also or? Jeff, I have to turn over to Key or Darren or Sherry. I don't think it's 23. I mean, I think it's 23. I don't think it's 24. Yeah, let me just pull that up. Thank you. Um, um, we're hearing that it's not a typo based on sort of the sort of a turnover rate um, at um, the facility, but maybe we can sort of confirm that with the uh, provider and sort of get back to you. With the yeah, office. let's know off the agenda. Right, thank you. Because as we know, the uh, the date, you no, know, Gen 23 certainly is good to have the extra 20. Uh, I'm hoping it's six months and not 18 months before we could get the other 25 beds, which will make a huge difference of our need, as we know those are needed right now. Uh, so I just want to uh, ask that as well. Um, uh, going back to the report again, uh, the uh, the the report talked about 200 locks of acute beds as needed, uh, and uh, we have the one million dollar uh, currently being designated in our budget for the pre-construction planning uh, for our own uh, uh, psych hospital or IMD uh, potentially. Uh, and I think this is something that would be very important when we talk about our capital improvement uh, project coming up this uh, uh, September, that this be placed in one of the highest, if not the highest priority uh, to discuss regarding what we are trying to build there. Um, so right. That point, not, yeah. Given the fact that, um, well, I'm presuming the board's gonna take action uh, regarding what is on the board today is 33, but given the fact that we were recommending that we not move ahead with a contract for the new jail, that changes our, our ability to modify the budget when we come to mid-year or even before so that we could put more money into planning for the facility. Um, you know, we'll um, add a huge amount of money, but We'll wait and see what the board wants to do in September, but um, administration will recommend moving that up on the list. Great, that's helpful. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Now on um, the issue of work short workforce shortages, uh, on the memo uh, as stated, written by, um, by, by as well as Ellenberg, uh, talked about the um, $10,000 per qualified students there. And apparently we, we ran out funds because of the 29 folks who did not get it. That relatively speaking with everything we're doing, that seems to be fairly small uh, of requiring the funding to uh, get as many of those uh, uh, applicants to potentially uh, uh, obtain this type of a loan forgiveness through our county uh, resources. Is this something that could be, uh, that you could find the money for? Because there's that $4 million as well that was mentioned. Is oh yeah, cer certainly I'm expecting that the committee that Elisa talked about, which was going is going to suggest allocations, will certainly have that as one of the recommendations, and we certainly will recommend that financially to the board. Obviously, the board will have to take action, but you know it's only twenty nine or right. so individuals, so you know that's not that's very doable. Right. Yeah, I think of everything we talk about today, I think that probably would be one of the lowest hanging fruit that we could attack. So appreciate that. Yeah. Speaking of how important that is. Uh, and then my, my final question regarding the detox beds, uh, something that, uh, as we all know, is so uh, in need because, frankly, I think that the word out there is that it takes at least seven to 14 days to get into detox beds. And usually by that time, the individual might change their mind and not interested, right, as we have seen so often. Uh, and the, the recommendation right now is the 15 adult and five youth uh, social detox beds is great. Uh, question is, is, is any other ways we could do to try to increase at least one of these, if not both of these uh, categories sooner than the uh, July 1st, 2023 dates? Um, from a financial perspective, we certainly could do it. Um, I'll have to turn it over to Sherry to give you some insight into the negotiations. 
Yeah. Um, these are all services that we do through negotiation with CBOs. So Sherry, is there any way to aim higher? Sure. I mean, we certainly um, are planning to um, issue a request uh, for statement of qualification or an RFSQ. That actually um, is a much um, briefer procurement process um, that a vendor, a potential vendor could apply for. So our traditional RFP process, which tends to be much longer and um, would be abbreviated in this process. And our um, plan would be to bring on a vendor as soon as possible. So um, I think it, you know, certainly we will be pushing as hard as we can to, to get that process in as soon as possible to bring in a vendor. Awesome. Great. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sherry. Really looking forward to the uh, uh, quick update on this. Obviously, this is something we needed yesterday and uh, whatever you could do to speed up. So we really appreciate it. And that's all I have for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to bring us back again to the people and I'm going to use South Bascom as an example that that was approved about 14 months ago and and the current uh, estimate is that it's it's still not going to be open for months more and that means that 28 people who could be in those beds where by the way we would have medical coverage are staying in locked facilities or in jail or are at risk of being unhoused so every every time we kind of accept a longer process there are individual people who are really struggling and suffering. And Dr. Smith, I, I hear uh, your vision for uh, the BMC campus. I'm certainly interested in that, but that is years and years and years away, just looking at the, um, the inpatient uh, psych unit, which was approved um, at Supervisor Simidian's direction seven years ago. So happy to hear about long-term big construction plans, but I need to see real urgency and speed on the facilities like South Bascom, like Rubin Board that will decompress those highest intensity places. We, we, we know that that's where some of the biggest bottlenecks are and we need to be able to move people along you know, if they are medically ready, it is also clearly in our financial interest to move them out of locked facilities where there is no Medi-Cal coverage into places that, that we will see some revenue. So I, I don't want the image of the, of the ideal campus to impede us on anything that we can be doing much, much faster. Uh, so yeah. that's, that's just the point that I that I want to make there. Um, Can I interject? Oh, sure, please. Um, that's why I think your idea of having a monthly report back to the board um, is very good idea and we'll do that. Um, because just like the pandemic response, the board understood better, I think, when we were talking to people in real time rather than having just periodic um update so we'll do that thank you and i think it also adds some public accountability and 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 some peer pressure frankly to 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 let us know every single month in public what is happening and the and the final um piece that i just want to note i know we've come back to behavioral health again and again um and sherry is still hanging in there and thank you but i just want to emphasize again the importance of making this a whole of county response that FAF and OBA and BMC and every other alphabetic uh, acronym in our county should have some role or responsibility to making this move forward. Behavioral health for sure can't, can't do everything uh, on their own. And, and again, I wanna really express support for the work that behavioral health is doing and lift up again the the premise that this has to be a whole of county response and thank you so much and so i'll um i'll add formally uh, to incorporate into the motion that um that will the board will start receiving monthly reports on the behavioral health continuum of care thanks and, and is that thank okay you. with the seconder 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you. That's just, that's just what I was going to ask. I uh, appreciate all the passion, the urgency, everything that's done here. I wasn't on the board 14 years ago, but it would have been nice to have that passion and urgency and get a new jail built 14 years ago and excuse the beeping in my background. I can't silence it. I don't think maybe I can. There we go. There's only so much room on my cassette for my answering machine. All right. Um, what I did want to do is ask a quick, a quick question of Sherry. And then we've got a motion in a second. I'm going to be supporting it and we can move on with these items. Sherry, um, about an hour and a half ago, uh, Chris Raboa, the CEO of Rebecca's, brought up the SEC credentialing process and the number of people that he had applying and that couldn't be credentialed yet. Could I please ask you to reach out to him and see if there's anything that we can do? I've been hearing about a shortage of these people and a shortage of that people. And in this situation, it seems to me that we have people wanting to go to work, but we have a credentialing process that's um, perhaps causing some delay. And if it's okay with you and, and your boss, Dr. Smith, if you could reach out to him and see if there's something that can be done to allow these people that want to help out to uh, do so sooner than later. Is sure. that all right? With, is that all right with you, Sherry and Dr. Smith? Yes, we'll certainly reach out. And we have been uh, working very closely with the Behavioral Health Contractors Association on credentialing, but um, certainly we'll reach out to Chris and um, discuss Thank you. steps. I appreciate it. Austin. Thank you. And I am not going to extend this issue any further. I'm going to call for a vote, please. David. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That was items 10, 11, and 26. We handled 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 in consent, under consent, as well as 19, 20, 21. We heard 22 and 23 before the lunch break and 24 as well. David, am I on pace so far? That's what I have in my notes as well, sir. Yes. Thank you. 25 now. We're going to go to 25, which I believe it was Supervisor Simidian asked that they be heard separately. 25A and 25B. Um, because of the way today's meeting has gone, I'm going to ask, I, I agree with being heard separately as we voted on previously, um, but ask that we have one opportunity to speak on 25A and B. So anybody from the public that wishes to speak on these items, please register electronically. Supervisor Simidian, I'm going to turn this over to you. Let me just get my, unless you want to hear from staff first. Let's go to uh, staff first, if we can. All righty. Wasserman, and I want to make sure that we take 25A first and then 25B. Yes. Because I think one was uh, driven primarily by Supervisor Chavez, and then the other, I think, was a uh, joint referral that I did with Supervisor uh, Chavez joining me. Okay, I've got received reports on both of them. Mr. Lorenz, and I'll repeat what I said before, if you've got a brief staff report, please go ahead. Thank you, President Wasserman. And we do have a brief staff report. Uh, Dr. Curtis Ohashi will be joining me on this item as well. There um, is. <clears throat> first of all, I do wanna thank the board for bringing forward this referral and asking for us to discuss this very important topic uh, publicly with your board. Um, just a few comments, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Ohashi to give a, a very brief presentation. Um, I, I think it's, first of all, very important that, that we acknowledge that workplace violence in healthcare is real and it is acute. Um, staff encounter both verbal and physical violence on a regular basis. Um, and the risk of violence and, and the potential for violence exists every day within your healthcare system. Um, and it, I think it's needless to say, but it's important for me to convey that that most healthcare systems today are struggling with this very issue. Um, but as a public healthcare system um, and as a safety net system for our community, we care for many patients that either have no other option or require our level of expertise as a public system. 
uh, we have very compassionate and caring staff. And without the staff, we would be unable to really deliver this level of care for our community and for our patients. Uh, we have extraordinary staff taking care of extraordinary, extraordinary needs of, of our patients. Uh, there is no question that we must provide a working environment along with the training and the tools and the resources to confront these challenges. While we have outlined, and Dr. Hashi will walk, walk you through some of our identified strategies um, around this issue, um, it's important to understand that this is an iterative process that as we go through examining and receiving input, we are constantly evolving in, in re-strategizing around how we can better improve the issues that I've, I've, I've outlined. Um, it does require input from staff and engagement of staff. It does require our effort to work with our labor partners to better understand their needs and make sure that we are doing the very best for our, our employees. Again, they are extraordinary staff doing extraordinary work. And what I'd like to do is now turn it over to Dr. Ohashi and kind of walk through some of the efforts that are underway. And then we're happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Mr. CEO. Thank you, Paul. And good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can somebody confirm that they can see my screen? Not yet. Your screen is black. Hmm. Let's try again. Paul, I might be having some issues with my Zoom, as I mentioned. Are you able to share the PowerPoint? Paul, are you there? Yes. I believe it should be coming up. There you go. Thank okay. you. <clears throat> so I am going to endeavor to do a very brief and high level presentation on our workforce or our workplace violence plan prevention efforts. As Paul mentioned, the healthcare industry and particularly the hospital industry is one of the industries that have the highest rates of workplace violence incidents. And the prevention and reduction of those incidents remain a top priority for the hospital and uh, healthcare and clinic system. Next slide, please. So this slide reflects really the scope of the problem in our three hospitals. Um, this graphic represents the number of reported uh, incidents to Cal OSHA by hospital. So drawing your attention to the legend at the bottom, the monthly averages are 16 incidents for VMC three for O'Connor Hospital, and three for St. Louis, St. Louis Regional Hospital. Next slide, please. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, this graphic just reflects the distribution of behavioral health patients among the various hospitals in our county. Um, please note that behavioral health care patients don't account for all the workplace violence incidents, but they do contribute to some of them. So this gives you a graphic of where county EMS are uh, transporting those patients. And you can see at the very bottom that the enterprise uh, collectively VMC, O'Connor, and St. Louis hospitals account for about 49% of that total volume. Next slide. And so what we did is we have workplace violence plans for our, all of our major um, hospital and clinic sites. Uh, what we did is try to get some naturally occurring categories to um, aggregate some of that effort and those interventions in. Um, as Paul noted, this is a facility-wide effort that also has a bottom-up component, which means that we also take recommendations for our labor partners as well as our line staff. And I'm not going to read through all of them, but you can see under staff training and support, there's a number of training initiatives that are currently being undertaken. Um, some of the initiatives here are being implemented and some of them are under review. Under the category of technology enhancements, there's a number of um, technological initiatives that we're looking at to improve safety at the workplace. Next slide, please. 
And then finally, under security and staffing, there are three primary initiatives as well as a number of initiatives um, in regards to facility enhancements. Next slide. And with that, we're happy to take any questions you may have. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Ohashi, and thank you, Paul. And thank you for providing us all those slides several days ago so that we and our staff could go through them prior to uh, your refreshing just now. We've got that on 25A. I'm gonna to go to public speakers unless Supervisor Lee, you wish to speak before. I'll be happy to listen to public hearing first, thank you. Thank you. David, public speakers, please, for two minutes each, and then we'll turn to supervisors. One moment, please, while we get the timer set. Thank you. Next speaker is Janet Diaz-Perez. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, Board, board of Supervisors. My name is Janet Diaz, president of SCIU, a patient business services clerk for Valley Medical Center, and been with the county for over 20 years. Um, SCIU 521 Valley Physicians and RMPA Union members have experienced a tremendous mental health crisis. Uh, although I appreciate Paul Lorenz recognizing the importance of labor union input on the report already received by, by, uh, from administration, um, for your review, I want to be very clear. The report submitted has zero input of labor organizations. They failed to include us. The report content does have a survey that was uh, submitted or sent actually to county employees. And although that is great, it does not have the personal aspects of the needs of our members as we do. We ask the board that they give a directive for um, labor relations as well as the administration to meet with all of the labor organizations to accept our input and integrate it within the submitted report. Just as important, we feel that management has various responsibilities as managers at, of all levels. One of their main responsibilities is the department operations. However, the only way to sustain operations is by your workforce. You need a workforce in order for the operations to occur. So we ask the board that, it, um, that they ensure Thank that- you, Next speaker is Stephen Harris. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Steve Harris, Chair of Valley Physician Group. Um, I was really pleased to learn of the board's healthcare worker wellness referral. And, you know, after reading VMC administration's rather defensive and, in my view, inadequate response, um, I was going to speak kind of angrily today. Um, first, about how VMC never engaged VPG, even though the referral instructed it to do so. How, in our view, it's kind of cynical to put the onus back onto the employee to go find help when we know about all the limited access to services, like the county's own EAP, and about how VMC missed so many opportunities, like turning down an offer from the VMC Foundation and 1440 Multiversity to host uh, weekend wellness workshops for us for free. But I was lucky enough to attend one of these workshops, and my anger is now tempered with some empathy for our administrators who I know work long hours under great pressure in this broken system that we have. The difference, of course, is they have the authority and responsibility to ask you all for the resources to enact system change. Um, you know, we all have cars and when we have a car problem, we drop off our car with the mechanic and they spend hours diagnosing and treating the problem. We all have bodies, and when we go to the doctor, we get a few minutes. As patients, we feel rushed in and rushed out. So I don't know why VMC administration simply uh, wants to turn up the speed on the patient conveyor belt. We need more time with our patients. We need 
more staff. We need to stop the understaffing with regard to specialty services. And this system and culture change is gonna be hard. It's gonna require additional investment and we're here to work with you on it. Thank you. And that concludes our public speakers. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. We're dealing with just 25A at the moment and uh, it was to receive a report. Did you have any comments you wish to make? <clears throat> yes, I do. I just want to, um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, uh, thank the uh, report uh, as provided from staff. And last week I uh, had a chance to uh, tour the uh, VMC, uh, also the emergency apartment building uh, and spoke with uh, some of the nurses there. And I, first of all, I want to thank so many of them that took the time to speak with me. Uh, needless to say, when we talk about workplace mental health wellness and safety, especially within the VMC, our nurses and our hospital workers and our doctors are some of the most vulnerable employees who are in urgent need of the support. Time and time again, we've heard that there are issues related to staffing shortages and staffing retention. My visit last week has only served to confirm this for myself in talking to our nurses, that they have stretched very, very thin. More than three nurses who have been at the BMC for over two decades in different floors have told me that staffing has never been stretched this thin. Lack of qualified experienced charge nurses, and especially during the night shift. The nursing staffing shortages uh, and also retentions, of course, one of the central issues that must be addressed to improve the mental health of our healthcare workers today. The work that our hospital workers can be mentally and emotionally exhausting, and sometimes, like everybody, they may need a mental health day to themselves to recuperate or recover from all the stress that come with the work. Now that we're coming out of COVID supposedly, I'm heartened to see that in the staff report, we have, for example, the lavender rooms of the VMC for the staff to collect themselves, to take a breather. Uh, but I don't see that yet at the O'Connor in St. Louis. Do you see that there's something like that that potentially will be coming for those hospitals? Question? Yes, uh, through the chair. Um, yes. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Uh, so at O'Connor Hospital, we do have one lavender room for mm -hmm. staff to have some quiet time to themselves. Um, mm -hmm. We are looking to expand that at O'Connor Hospital at additional locations. At St. Louis Hospital, we're a little bit challenged there in terms of space because of the high volume. But I am working with uh, Gloria Delamere said, the hospital executive, to identify a space that staff can have that that quiet space, if you will, to, to reflect. Good. Now, the other issue, of course, is regarding the um, uh, uh, retention. Um, and the story I keep hearing over and over and over again is that uh, many new nurses uh, that working at our hospitals uh, received the training for the first year or two. Uh, and so many of them have actually left right after they got the training. And certainly the amount of investment that we've been getting is not recoverable and we have to start over again. So I would certainly want to mention that as part of the, the, the discussion we have on finding ways to make sure that we do a better job of retention of making sure that we don't lose these uh, uh, well-trained, uh, especially those trained in-house. Excuse me, Supervisor Lee. Yes. Vice President Ellenberg, is his volume low to you as well? It's a little muffly. I've gotten okay. used to it because I thought I was the only one. No, oh, I'm sorry. That, if you could talk up a little more, that'd be great. Thank you. Sure. I, I'll just repeat what I just is basically there's a question on retention, uh, especially of the new nurses who've just been trained by uh, us for one to three years. Uh, so recurring stories I keep hearing. So I'm just trying to raise that issue to make sure that uh, we'll be able to find ways, whether it's through wages, bonus, or whatever uh, benefits that we could provide to make sure that we are competitive with our neighboring um, hospitals, whether it's Kaiser or Stanford, that might be hiring these uh, nurses that we've trained. So I just want to make sure I bring that to your attention uh, to find some strategies to work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Smith, did you wish to comment before Supervisor Chavez? Yeah, I just wanted to address uh, Supervisor Lee's uh, concern. Um, Please do. Yeah, if you actually look at our numbers, our retention numbers look pretty good but that being said we uh, are going to be coming to the board with a proposal to across the board increase the pay for 
clinical nurses. Um, mm -hmm. The proposal is being discussed now at meet and confer, so I can't tell you exactly what it will end up being, right. but what we're proposing is 10% across the board for the clinical nurse ones and twos, 8% for the clinical nurse threes. Um, this will definitely keep us competitive with our surrounding neighbors and uh, you know, that's the good thing to remember. Thank you. Good, I think it's so important to make sure that uh, the folks that we train, obviously, unless they are not happy or unless they have got better offer, they would stay. Right. So uh, from the camaraderie and certainly we have the most passionate uh, and dedicated uh, employees as we have uh, met so many of them. So I really do think that a lot of them are, are not really wanting to leave the organization because of the people, but based on the other factors, the reason why they leave. So I think we really need to uh, uh, make sure that uh, those strategies got implemented. Uh, and finally, I just want to point out um, uh, a statement that was released early this month by uh, some of our a working group's uh, representative concerning the creation of a program that would help support mental health and wellness of the VMC employees. Uh, as our speakers have noted, the joint statement noted that our, our representatives have not been included in the actual, you know, meaningful participation in developing these types of solutions on the, for the mental health. And I think it's so important to engage and include these type of dialogue uh, in order for the effective changes needed with those stakeholders. Uh, <clears throat> and um, and that the other issue is also the EAP has also uh, shown that they had you know, long wait times, scheduling new appointments, and some as long as four to six weeks. Um, and that certainly is a matter of concern. Uh, the report also cites that the emotional PPE project uh, is an additional resource for healthcare staff as an alternative option for mental health support. Um, and so how is this... Um, wonderful free resources. How is they being promoted to staff uh, is my question because I've heard from uh, various uh, 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 workers that the staff are unaware, unaware of these resources and would like to suggest uh, more communication channels to be used like staff meetings, bulletin boards in the staff break rooms, emails, okay. buddies and whatnot. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I think uh, Paul can add, answer the communication question, I'll try to answer the EAP question. The EAP is a you know, countywide service and um, with 22,000 employees, um, we've seen a backup of wait lists. So what we're doing right now is contracting with providers in the community that can provide the service counseling and um, referrals so that we'll have a panoply of counseling uh, opportunities that we can utilize through EAP. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lorenz. Yes, uh, President. So with respect to the communication, Supervisor Lee, we of course provide and put out a number of general announcements to staff about these, these supportive opportunities. Uh, we do also communicate through the various uh, nursing committees um, for which they engage the staff at different levels of the organization. And of course, uh, probably the more important one is that uh, working with the department and unit managers, the expectation is that they communicate this information directly to their teams via huddles and staff meetings. Now, obviously, it sounds as though we haven't reached each and every person within the organization, and, and we will seek to do better in that regard. Thank you, Paul. Supervisor Lee, anything else? No, that's all for now. Thank you very much. All right, returning Supervisor Chavez now for any additional comments on 25A, then we will move to 25B. Thank you. Um, for 25A, I, I just want to make sure that the staff can respond to the following. Um, and, and I apologize, I didn't really see it in the presentation, but I, but I am curious about where we are in the process of right sizing the um uh the the security on the campus oh. on all campuses sorry okay. thank you supervisor so yes um we have done an internal assessment of the required staffing adjustments um for all of our 
facilities that listen to healthcare system. Uh, we are working with the county exec's office on the on the final recommendations relative to uh, a classification uh, that we believe will be able to bring forward a more uh, robust PSO team um, of professionals um, in, in, comp in, in concert with our existing staff. So um, I know that ESA Labor Relations has been meeting and conferring with uh, SEIU. And I do not have a timeline, although I know that they're looking to bring this to the board sooner than later. Thank you. Well, um, so there are a couple of things that I guess, and I will do this through um, President Wasserman to Dr. Smith, because this has an ESA component. Um, one is that I think it's very, very important that as we are moving forward on the security issues, there are kind of two big areas. One, what do we find most effective? I, I saw that you are looking at some strategic uh, uh, changes that Gray Team I think is a very good idea, but but what do we see that's most effective now, um, and what are we trying to affect? So the changes, what I'm going to be interested in is are the changes we're making um, changes that we see will have an improvement, and how 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 are we connecting those changes to the improvements we we expect to see? And I'd really like to see that before. Um, we have significant changes in the in the um, structure, and then second, uh, the right number of people with the right skill set at the right times. Like, how is that really being done? And I do think it's really critical that we're talking in, separately to the the staff that work at the hospitals to get their input as to the ideas that are coming forward. And I know, uh, Dr. Ohashi you mentioned that you were working with the staff. Um, I, I just think, I, I'm just reinforcing that before it comes back to us, I'd really like to see that. And I will just say colleagues that um, the, the, we had been talking about the uh, workplace safety trends really for years. The referral I just looked it up that we brought forward was in at the end of 2019. I recognize COVID put a crimp and all that. I, my, my point is, is that by the time we did a referral, we'd already been having a conversation about it. So I, I just want to make sure that whatever comes back to us is socialized and bought into um, from all sides, or we're going to have a problem. It'll just be one more reorganization without the kind of enthusiasm that we're going to need for every, everybody to buy into it. Um, and then I'll hold off on my, my comments for, you, you don't want us to talk about B, Mike? Uh, and I would ask Supervisor Smitty if he intended us to vote on them separately or talk about them separately. Yeah, I don't see a motion for 25A. Or, I see some direction given. I see Dr. Smith wanting to speak. Then I'm happy to turn to Supervisor Smitty so that we can move 25A along. Supervisor, are you okay with hearing from Dr. Smith first? Uh, yes, but I, I don't have anything to say on 25A. Got it. Uh, and I just, when the time comes for 25B, I'll have some comments and questions. Thank you. That's hope coming in a moment. Dr. Smith. I want to address uh, Supervisor Chavez's concerns. We um, administratively have the same concerns. We want to have the right level of training with the right number of people in the right place at the right time. And that's why we're going to be coming to the board with uh, this recommendation for a new classification, which um, one can think of as sort of fitting in between the current PSOs and deputies, um, <clears throat> more um, authority than the current PSO, but not carrying guns like the deputies. Um, so that will give us a larger bench to uh, pull from to make sure we have the right skill set with the right training at the right time. Also, we're going to be coming to the board um, regarding um, other issues that can promote security like physical structures and um, mechanical and magnetic um, evaluation. So um, we're we'll be in front of you with those things next next month. Thank you. Anything else, Supervisor Chavez? Uh, just on just to follow up, um, Dr. Smith, I think that the other thing that we want to I want to better understand is 
from a morale perspective, how are we handling the leadership, you know, the changes in leadership, frankly, with between the DSA and the PSOs and the new training that you're talking about? And I would just ask that, um, that at least when that comes back to us, that the strategy for how relationships get built will be really important because I do know, um, I'm not, I don't know that we have this problem here, but I know that between badged and non-badged staff and other other places that that, that um, respect and that collaboration is gonna be critical. And I think sometimes the communication can get lost, you know, when you have two, two different kinds of ranks. So I'd want to make sure that's very explicitly addressed in whatever is presented to the board. Right, we, we do have that problem and we'll be explicit. Thanks, Dr. Swift. Thank you, uh, President Wasserman. Absolutely. I think we have a lot of good suggestions, some direction. David, there was no motion, correct? That's I, correct. I will make the motion with the recommended request on a- um, I'll second. Motion by Chavez, second by Lee. No other hands raised. Vote please, David. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes, thank, thank you. you. We'll move on to 25B, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, colleagues and staff and public. I um, I brought this referral uh, to our board and Supervisor Chavez, forgive me, I, I believe you were my uh, co-colleague on this one. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes. Right, okay, I didn't think I made that up. And uh, my goal at the time uh, through the chair was I would define it as narrow, but very important, at least in my assessment. And what I said at the time was, and I'm gonna repeat it, cause I, I fear that we've, we've sort of gotten, um, uh, we're, we're talking about so many important issues that I, I, I wanna make sure this one doesn't get lost. I think we all know and agree, I don't think there's any sort of dissent, maybe I'm wrong, but, I think we all know and agree that uh, our organization of 22,000 people was incredibly stressed. And I mean that, you know, in the dictionary sense of the word, not the colloquial sense of the word, by uh, the challenges of the pandemic. And that challenge and the impact it has had on our staff, um, is a long way from gone. It's it's a, a weight that people continue to carry around with them. Uh, and it has an impact both on how well we're able to do our jobs and serve as a county and serve the public broadly. But I also worry about it, quite frankly, just in terms of the very human toll it takes on some significant portion of that 22,000 folks. Now, when we did the referral, I specifically called out and asked for a report back from administration on what kind of mental health impacts we felt the folks in our healthcare system uh, were, were experiencing. And, and more to the point, what could we do to address those impacts? And, you know, I, I'm not going to get into the weeds about who uh, who's where in the org chart or where in the hierarchical pyramid and um, you know the distinctions between the BMC uh, team and the public health and so on and so forth and I was very explicit at the time Mr. Chair and colleagues about saying I knew that these mental health impacts were not limited to our healthcare staff that you know they were borne by folks in virtually every corner of our organization. But I wanted to start with folks in the healthcare staff, broadly uh, considered, and, and say, what are we dealing with and what can we do about it? So I want to, that's why I appreciated the willingness of colleagues today to not let this issue get subsumed in the larger discussion, which we just had, which is a very important discussion and obviously related, but distinct and separate in my view. So um, 
I, I, you know, very directly want to say, I don't want this to be part of a larger push and shove around another set of issues. Uh, I don't want it to get lost because it, it is perhaps not as tangible or immediately recognizable in the eyes of some. I think what I'd like to do, Mr. Chair, is sort of turn to Mr. Lorenz and say, Mr. Lorenz, thank you for your efforts, but I, I would appreciate it if you would just take a minute or two and tell our board your assessment. Uh, and if there are other staff members who should do the same, I'm happy to be encouraged in that direction. But I'd like Mr. Lorenz to start by saying, what's your assessment of the toll that the pandemic broadly and all of its you know, consequences has taken on our healthcare workforce? What are we doing to help them cope with that? And what more can we or should we be doing if we had the resources and direction from the board to do it? I hope that's a relatively clear and defined set of concerns and queries. Queries clearly defined. Mr. Lorenz. Thank you, uh, President and, and Supervisor Samidian. So let me uh, kind of hit those points one by one. So the toll that it has taken on the workforce is significant. I don't think there's any doubt in the minds of everyone within this healthcare organization, in particular, the managers uh, that are dealing with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and I'm speaking of the fact that if you think about the healthcare organization and how large and diverse we are as a healthcare provider, uh, the scope of services and the level of care that we provide to the community is not only large in scope, but it has a dramatic impact on the overall health of our community. The staff understand that obligation and that level of expectation that's placed upon them. Uh, they not only understand it from the service to each individual patient, but as an organization. Um, and that's why I want to point out that many people work here in this public system because of our ability to impact the health of the community, and they take it very seriously. The reality is that, as you well know, prior to the pandemic, your healthcare system grew. We acquired two hospitals, O'Connor and St. Louis Hospital. And we added to this incredible system to further expand our reach and service to the community. And we all know why we did it as an organization, as an account, as a county, because the needs in this community are great. Um, so not only have we not only worked through the integration of this healthcare system to further expand services, but on the heels of that, we have dealt with COVID. And I would tell you that the staff within this organization have done an, an exceptional job. I think you see it day in and day out, um, but I think more so you see it in terms of its impact on the community as a whole. And I get back to the very point that I was making earlier is that every single individual in this organization, a doctor, a nurse, an EVS worker, a dietitian, take that obligation very seriously. And that um, is coupled with the fact that not only do they take that obligation service to the patient seriously, they have a family to take care of. And so that balancing of work, family is a struggle. I mean, obviously you don't just see that in healthcare, but you see that in general. But in healthcare, they are dealing with people in terms of saving lives and, and really, really determining what their future will be like as they care for these individuals. Whether it be a BAP, an EPS in terms of dealing with psychiatric issues or on the floor dealing with the trauma. I mean, these are pretty significant issues that our employees are dealing with. So to your question about the impact, it is significant. Um, with respect to your, your sec second question is, what do we do about it? 
you know, um, let me start by saying that we as an organization, as leadership, have started feeling that pressure from prior to the acquisition, actually going back all the way to the Affordable Care Act. The, the reality is that if we are going to be in healthcare as a public system, we have to understand that the expectations that are placed on this system are significant and great. And the delivery on those expectations truly do have a tremendous impact on the community. Um, and that's why we're here. And you have a very resilient workforce. The question is, how do you build resiliency? How do you ensure that people understand the work that they do each and every day is valued? And that we don't let a moment pass by where we have that opportunity to support them. But everything we do in, in how we go about dealing with these issues is not only incremental, um, but it's iterative, meaning that we learn each and every day of what we need to do differently and how we need to go about it each and every day. And it happens and it has to happen at every level of the organization. You know, it's not going to just happen in the, at the executive level. Um, we need to develop a culture where everyone feels that they have the power and the ability to affect how people feel within the organization. It's just not our labor partners. It's actually the, the nurses that are on the front line. It's the EVS workers. It's actually the employees that work in our patient billing services. You know, today people may not realize this, but you know, th there is a lot of expectation placed on our patient billing staff in order to deliver on the financial success of the organization in order for us to deliver the care. So it's everyone within the organization at all levels of the organization that have to be engaged. The Diamond Project, which we outline in our report, gives us the structure to begin that process. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that um, that I understand today everything that we need to address the, the first two points, um, and nor do I pretend to sit here and say that what we've outlined of what we need to do is the end all. Um, but I will say to you that we have no problem coming to the county executive and having a very honest and direct conversation about what we need to do. The adjustment in the nursing compensation that Dr. Smith spoke to, that's extremely important for a number of reasons, but that's only one part of the solution that we're trying to, to address. Um, and you know, I can go down the list of, of issues that we're trying to, to address that are more immediate, that I think will have a dramatic impact on morale, including negotiations, et cetera. Um, but there's not one point of a strategy or activity that is going to solve this, this challenge. And again, to the last point, Supervisor, which was your third point, is that we will come to your board with a requests or support needed in order to advance the system and, and support the workforce. We will always do that. Your board this past year, at mid-year prior to the review of other departmental budgets, approved 600 positions, 600 positions. Your board has committed over $1 billion in capital improvement projects uh, for not just facilities, but equipment, et cetera. These are significant investments, but those alone are not going to address the challenge that we have before us. Um, so I don't know. I believe I've answered your three points, um, but I yep. but I wanted to turn it back over to, to the president and to your board. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, through the chair. Thank you, Ms. Lorenz. Really helpful. Uh, before I uh, yield the floor here uh, through the chair to other colleagues, I guess, Mr. Lorenz, I'm I'm wondering if we could pick a month when we could have you come to HHC and talk a little more um, specifically, you know, a little more granularity, if there is such a word, uh, about 
here are specific supports that we can and should be either expanding because they already exist or providing uh, if they don't already exist uh, to bolster the mental health of our healthcare workforce. Uh, because I, I absolutely agree with you. I don't want this to be misunderstood that um, a, a lot of this is about the culture of the organization. A lot of it is uh, iterative, but I, I think um, even as we're sort of looking at these larger systemic issues that you have outlined, I, I think there are very tangible, very specific things we can do that may not change the culture of the organization in a week, a month, a year, or three, or five, but that may be a lifeline to somebody who's really struggling and up against it uh, as they go to work every day. And, um, you know, I know you know this, so I'm saying it in part to make sure we're all on the same page, but I, 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 uh, I always am troubled when I hear folks say that, you know, our, our organization didn't talk to the employee groups, not as a man, matter of labor management, but because, and you made this point, I thought very well, you, you got to talk to individual people and they got to feel heard. And, you know, I know sometimes in my own very small shop, it, it's incumbent on me just to provide some acknowledgement that I know that there's some pain out there and that it's a matter of concern. It doesn't mean I'm going to have a solution today or tomorrow or next week any more than you're going to have a solution for the great numbers of folks who struggled so hard. But I got to believe it's a little bit of help uh, to acknowledge it, to see it and speak it and acknowledge it with the people who work with and for us. And um, that's the start, you know, that's the start. But uh, if I were to ask you to pick a month when we could have a more precise conversation about we need to do these two, three, four, five things uh, at the committee level, uh, what's a time when that could be real? Not when you'd feel under the gun, not when we would have all put the issue on the shelf, but when we could say, this is what we really do need to do to make sure that anybody who's hurting uh, has some, some help when and where they need it. Mr. Lorenz. Supervisor Simidine, um, I, I believe that we can return to your board in January with a comprehensive response and approach to the issues that are before us. I do want to say, though, that in the interceding time period, we are going to continue to engage with the staff and do a better job in communicating and working with our labor partners, because clearly we have some work there to do. Um, so that we can continue to move forward on certain initiatives that, that we know um, will make a difference. So I don't want to give the impression that if we report back in January that the work is at a standstill. Um, if your board would like us to come back sooner um, and or provide uh, periodic reports as part of my operations report to either the Health and Hospital Committee or uh, at another committee, I'm I'm more than willing to do that. But um, I think, uh, given the level of engagement that we're looking at, um, and the comprehensive type of uh, effort that we need to undertake, um, I would feel comfortable in January. Um, Thank you. I'm gonna, through the chair, Mr. Renz, what I'm going to do is wait to hear from my colleagues. Uh, I don't have. A, conclusion right this moment as to whether or not we should ask you to come back to the full board with that or come to the committee or come to the committee and then the full board. Uh, maybe that the comments or questions from my colleagues help clarify that. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm not so much talking about 
systemic change, frankly, because I know what a big, big lift that is. I'm talking about, you know, if somebody needs to talk to a therapist uh, and they need it now, you know, are, are we really able to respond in real time uh, sufficiently and satisfactorily? And, and if not, what's it going to take to get us there? And I just picked that as one example. So please don't, you know, uh, feel you have to latch on to that. But I just, I think there's some very tangible things that um, can sometimes be helpful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lorenz, if I may add in to what Supervisor Smidian said, if any employee wants to see a psychiatrist, can they not see a psychiatrist now? We will do everything possible to facilitate that uh, support for that employee. Um, and I, 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 yes. And their insurance would cover it. Well, I mean, not only do they have that option, but we will also provide that support outside of their health insurance coverage to ensure that they get started and have the appropriate support they need. Great, because I and agree then, with what you said, and I agree with what Supervisor Smidian said about the employees being stressed, health and hospital people being extremely stressed and needing immediate attention. Supervisor Smidian, any closing comments? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I took the hint on closing, by the way. Uh, oh. No, I, I mean that in a good way, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I, I think, you know, the, the follow-up question is, and then if those systems are in place, do they have adequate resources and do they actually work? You know, I, I've, I, I, you know, I've got a healthcare provider and, you know, I pick up the phone or, you know, I try to do it online and I'm told, yeah, we're absolutely happy to see you get back to us, you know, in a month when we have a slot. All right, well, for someone who's in crisis, that, oh. that's not gonna work. So part of the hard conversation is, you know, are we able to make these systems work? Are the resources real or are they in print and paper, but not actually, you know, accessible, as I say, in the moment of crisis? I'll, I'll wrap it there, thank you. Gotcha. Thank you. Sue Reza Chavez, then Vice President Ellenberg. Yes, thank you, um, Paul. Thank you for the report out. And um, Supervisor Simidian, thank you for really synthesizing the, the outcome that you were looking for. Um, I, you know, I, I will say this at the risk of drawing more ire from the Hospital Council of Northern California. And I say that because, um, you know, well, I'll just leave it at that as, as I'm in an election and, and have seen uh, them spending money in it. So one of the concerns that I have is that when someone goes to pick up the phone for their healthcare provider, that for the most part, most of our folks here are covered either by Kaiser or by, um, I, uh, I forgot the third, part of the US, other group that we have, or by Valley Medical Center, you know, by, by BHP. And, and Kaiser, as you know, like all of us, is really struggling to have enough healthcare providers that provide these services to our, our folks. And so I want to just hit on what Supervisor Simidian said, is that I think that from an access to services, we, we, we have to acknowledge that we have a problem in the entire system. And so one question that I have is recognizing that challenge, what alternatives do we have for our employees? And it, it, you know, in, in a very real way. And well, let me stop and just ask Paul, do you have a strategy for that? So there are a number of different layers here. So first of all, when we have an incident in the hospital or in the clinics, uh, there's immediate intervention provided to staff. We have group debriefings, counseling support, and then we also offer individual support to the employees. Now, and, and the, the, that support is immediate to Supervisor Simeon's question and, and the President's question. You know, we, we feel obligated that we provide that immediate support to the employee to ensure that they have 
the support and, and the care that they need um, because they're at a, at a, at a critical point. Um, and we have not only utilized EAP, but, but more so because of the, their impact it is that we, we're working very closely with the Bill Wilson Center. Um, and we are looking beyond that to ensure that, that we have several layers so that during those situations, they have the, we have the appropriate resources available. The second part of this is the ongoing needs of our staff, because in, at any given point in time, outside of a crisis moment or incident, an employee may need that support. Um, and although we've, again, relied on EFP, we, we know that's not sufficient. And so two things, one, the county, as Dr. Smith is looking for additional options, but we are also you know, looking for additional options to support the employees outside of their insurance coverage, because we feel we have an obligation to support our staff. Um, and although we may dovetail in terms of, of, of their insurance coverage that they may, they may in fact have Kaiser, et cetera, um, our goal is to make sure that there is that continuation and ongoing support they need so that they're, they're not left in a void, if you will. Um, that is our ultimate goal and in, in what we are working on at this, at, as we speak. So I, I think um, I think for all of us who have been um, dealing with the high need of our communities right now, we know that we're all going to the very same well and putting a straw in it. And I so what that means to me is that um, a couple things. And one is that um, you know as we think about an investment we've already made in our recovery center that I would like to very much encourage the staff, if we're going to be making significant investments that we're looking at the, the recovery center, which by the way, I believe is already contracting with Bill Wilson Center. So I just wanna make sure we're, we're really being very cognizant of, of what resources we're gonna make available under what circumstances and, and how we're gonna utilize them. So we're leveraging our own resources and assets as, employ, as an employer um, with that of VTA and other large organizations. So that, that's one thing that I wanna just put out there. The, the, and so I'd really like it when you come back is to better understand how we're leveraging our own resources. Second, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, just to go back to Kaiser for a moment, I, I know they're struggling too. I know they're trying to hire people. So I, I'm worried about us sending people to e, EAP and Kaiser. And then, you know, Paul, I heard what you said about kind of taking care of this in-house, but but what happens in the immediate and then how we're supporting people long-term are, are both important and on occasion distinct. And so the only point I was gonna raise is that if we are um, investing in our own uh, infrastructure, one of the questions I would have is to look to our healthcare partners to determine whether or not um, we should be restructuring our agreements so that we're better able to spend resources in another in another way if we can't get the resources we need from the people we're already paying to do it. And again, it's not a criticism because honestly, they're all doing what we're doing, which is trying to hire it like crazy. But if we have the ability to respond in a more healthful way, then I would want to not pay twice for a service that that we're already providing. Understood, and, you know, and I think on this particular topic, we're, uh, I think we're happy, well, I know we're happy to return to, uh, an off agenda response, written response to, to the board to explain what we are doing and undertaking to ensure that there are no gaps in, in meeting the needs of our staff on this particular issue. Well, and I, and I guess what I would also say, um, Paul, is that, you know, and this isn't uh, solely for you, but really through ESA um, and through Dr. Smith's office, I do think we need to look at our current contracts and just determine again, we're spending an awful lot of money on resources that we may or may not be able to access. And I just would wanna make sure that, that the staff is following up on that. Um, thank you. And then the last thing that I, I did wanna say is I, I do wanna reiterate one point that Supervisor Simidian raised, and that is that, um, you know, really to make sure that 
the kinds of discussions we're having with our staff are deep and meaningful so that we are really able to address people's needs. Because what I worry about is that we're going to come up with programs or responses. And if it's not really what the employees are asking us for, then then it's that it may be seen not as an olive branch, but more as a, you know, a distraction and maybe not seen as meaningful as as you and the senior staff intended to be. So I'll just encourage that those conversations continue to happen. And I did see the the outreach in the um, the list of, of outreach. But again, I, I do want to say that we might have to get a little deeper into the staff to make sure that we're we are in fact being responsive. And what I didn't necessarily see here were the the bargaining units that are frankly getting the, the feedback from their employees, right? They're getting it in real time from their own employees. So, so thank you very much. Vice President Lundberg. Thank you. And thank you, Paul, um, for, for sharing, for sharing your thoughts so, so eloquently. And uh, I particularly appreciate the, the ownership of, of the fact that it was really a misstep to not engage with our labor groups um, in in proposing a system and to just lift up supervisor chavez's comment that if we are truly doing this work for them we need to hear what they want rather than deciding what what we think um, is appropriate and and i appreciate so much the tone that you're taking what i I'm not seeing is a is a similar tone, frankly, from from ESA, and I think that the um, the flyer that came out saying we've got services, go contract with your insurer, uh, really not only missed the mark in not acknowledging um, uh, the needs in a meaningful way, but in being so blithe to to suggest that that's how we provide services. Well, you've got this benefit, so so go use it. Um, I, I think was, uh, well, I know because they came to, you know, to all of us to, to say that that really was a hurtful way uh, of, of sharing information and to supervisor Samidian, um, you know, calling your provider may not result in, in an appointment for, for weeks and weeks. And uh, he asked also, Supervisor Smidian was asking for specific suggestions um, that might be implemented. One specific recommendation that I heard directly from RNPA was the addition of an on-site mental health worker at VMC to handle immediate uh, mental health crises for health system workers at the large campuses. Not what you referred to as incidents, which God forbid could be a suicide or another horrible mass event that, that impacts a lot of people, but for individual um, crises, M much in the way I'm looking to have mental health services on every school campus, there should be at least one designated person that you can go to um, you know, pretty much immediately or close to immediately when there's a need. Um, I'm interested also um, when, when you're reporting back to us, uh, January, uh, concerned me a little bit because the needs are so immediate. I hear that you'll be working until then, and that's just the report back. Um, but I do think it, it's it's really important to engage quickly. I'm interested in what the wait times are for employees uh, to meet with an employee resource resource group counselor, and and that's directed to to ESA, in fact, rather than uh, rather than to you, Paul. Um, and I'm going to. Going to make what is likely a very bold suggestion and not entirely certain how it will be received but you know what what i understand is that mental health has much to do with working conditions and again i have concerns um i've, I've had concerns for years over the way our labor uh, groups engage effectively with with our bargaining units um, and so the request that I'd like to make is that that we could get a report analyzing the feasibility of moving labor relations from ESA to the Office of County Council. And, and that would be, uh, Supervisor Smitting, if you made a motion already, I would add that to it. If there's no motion yet, I'd start with that and then have you add whatever you want to add. 
I think uh, mm -hmm. super, Supervisor, uh, through the chair, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, I think what I would do is ask Mr. Williams if there's any reason we can't have two motions uh, on the same item, which is uh, B at this point. Uh, I'll just offer a motion, uh, which I'd like to keep clean, because as okay. I said, this is such a large, complicated sure. challenge that I, I just, I think what I'd like to do, Ms. Lorenz, how about if we ask you to come to Health and Hospital to check in in December with a report to the full board in January. Does that work for you? Yes, sir, it does. All right, Thank you. let's let's do that. That's my motion is uh, B, receive report and provide that direction. And then um, I'm certainly open to uh, another motion before we move okay. on from that item. I don't believe there's any parliamentary uh, impediment to having two motions on uh, same item uh, if they're uh, relevant. And um, I would certainly think this one was relevant. So there is not, you need a second. I'm, I'm happy to second that. And, okay. and I would make a, a separate um, but concurrent motion uh, for, uh, for a feasibility report regarding moving labor relations from ESA to the office of the county council and would ask for a second. Let's take, well, I'll wait for the second. If there's a second, then I'll, well, I want to take separate votes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm happy to second it, that Cindy. Thank you. Okay, so let's do Supervisor Simidian's motion first. Mr. Williams, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I, I was just going to comment first that it's fine to have two separate motions. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you know, I think that the implications and issues around uh, the second piece are really far far um, different from kind of the scope of this item. So, um, you know, I think that probably is better addressed as a separate item because that's, that's a broader structural issue uh, that that goes well beyond anything even with this just item. that. Then, then, then what I'll do is withdraw the motion and bring it back as a referral. Thank you. Supervisor Leader, do you wish to make a comment before we voted on Supervisor Simidian's motion? No, I think, uh, first of all, I want to say thank uh, 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 Paul for your very heartfelt uh, comments and it really showed uh, uh, how much you care about our system and what you've really tried to do uh, on the issues that we're facing. I hope you understand when we raised those issues and comments earlier, it's not directed to you by any stretch of imagination. This is really about a symptom of what we need to work on and, you know, we, we learned it and, and we'll try to find ways to solve it. So. I just want to make sure, you know, we really appreciate your good work yourself, Paul. I just want to make sure you hear that from me, uh, number one. Okay. Second of all, uh, I, I do want to say that the, with the emergency visit, the EER visit that I, I looked at, there's some very significant um, uh, concerns about the security and safety uh, of the ER, not just for staff, but, you know, for even the patients at the waiting room and how we could uh, strengthen that, whether with uh, some type of metal detector device and uh, or uh, strengthening the plexiglass or something that might potentially even have to be bulletproof. Uh, again, I mean, it's something that I think needs to be studied. So I would like to ask if this is something that is uh, appropriate, if I would make a motion uh, separately from, from what's on table on uh, uh, having this brought back to us. Probably if this should be, because of security related uh, um, uh, county council, should this become coming back to us in a closed session because of security issues? So that I just want to make sure that uh, we are addressing them. Mr. Williams. Yes, the specific issues around security can come back in closed session and we can work with um, the appropriate folks in administration to, to tee that up, depending on what exactly the, the different elements are. There's obviously pieces that you know don't necessarily raise um, the need to return to closed session, but the, those that do uh, can be brought through that mechanism. Thank you. And James, do, does this need to be emotional or can I just ask staff and direct staff to work on this? James, yeah, I think that's the pleasure of the board. I think it's fine, it's fine for it to be a motion to have staff return return back with those pieces. Right. I'll go ahead and make that motion if I can second. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion by Lee. Do I have a second by a second supervisor? Excuse me. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. I believe yes. we I believe we have a motion on the floor. Yes, your motion which motion should be voted on first and then once that motion has been voted on 
there will be no motion on the floor and it would be very timely to hear from my colleague, Supervisor Lee. Uh, he could make his motion, get a second, and we could take that one discreetly and separately. I'm thank uh, you. I'm pretty sure that Mr. Williams will vouch for my parliamentary bona fides on that one. That's that's absolutely fine. I was going to do motion number one and motion number two. Supervisor Chavez, do you have a hand raised regarding the motion number one by Simidian? Mine was on motion number two. Thank you. We're going to do motion number one. Simidian seconded, I believe, by Ellenberg. Is that correct, Vice President? That's correct. Thank you. Roll call, please vote, David, if you're still there. I am here, sir. Supervisor okay. Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Now we go back to 25B, motion number two, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. I guess I could uh, basically re restated that motion earlier, but just to uh, have the issue regarding the securities uh, makers for the uh, emergency department to be brought back to closed session. Thank you. And we have a second by Supervisor, was it Smidian? Yes. No. Supervisor oh. Chavez? You... Yes, that's fine. Okay, and then your comments, please. I, I actually was going to comment on Supervisor Ellenberg's recommendation. So I apologize. I thought hers was going to be number two, and then this would be number three. So go ahead. So there is no second for Supervisor? No, no I'm seconding it. There I'm is a second. Any yeah. discussion? No discussion. David, roll, roll call vote again. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. You're muted, Vice President. Sorry, yes. Thank you. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank now you. Now we're going to go to 25B, vote number three. Is that what I'm understanding? Vice President Ellenberg, did you have a motion? No, James's recommendation was that it was beyond the scope of this item and not agendized. So I'm going to okay. bring it back later. Thank you. So we'll bring it back later or closed. Good enough. Supervisor Chavez, are you? Oh, yes, just on that. On yes. the subject matter, colleagues, um, we did ask for a report. So during um, budget, I asked for information on the same subject. Um, and so what I what I was just going to suggest is that the staff, um, when this comes back to us, the staff can attach the report they gave to ESA that frankly was so non response. I mean, not responsive. It just it, we were so far apart that I wanted to come back with another motion. So anyway, but I did want to just make staff, or, I mean, my colleagues aware of that, ask staff to circulate that to the board so you'd have the last item, way they responded to it. Thank you. Thank you. So we do not have another motion. I believe this item is finished. Does everyone agree? Good. That was 25B. We handled 26 with 10 and 11 earlier. We had uh, decided under consent to hear 27 and 28 together. I'm going to go out on a limb and make a motion to approve 27 and 28. And on 28, which we'll introduce, open it to the public, waive the, re the reading, et cetera, et cetera, if I have a second. I'll second. Chavez. Uh, 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 uh. Second. Second. We're going to have discussion in just a moment. Okay. Supervisor Chavez or Lee? Who is it that seconded? It was Otto. Seconded. Supervisor Lee, thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. I'm now opening it up to discussion. Supervisor Smidian. Well, I, I would, uh, I'd, I'd like to hear from the public first about how they feel about the ordinance that has uh, been prepared in response to earlier discussions, and then I would be happy to weigh in, sir. Thank you. We now have two members of the public wishing to speak. David, if you'll open the door. Uh, what period of time would you like to give the speakers, Mr. President? It looks like the number is increasing a little bit. Yes, it is. Let's do two minutes. Okay, one moment, please, while we get the timer up. Next speaker is Blythe Young. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, Supervisors. My name is Blythe Young. I'm the Community Advocacy Director for the American Heart Association here in the Bay Area. And I just want to thank you for moving forward um, with a draft to strengthen Santa Clara County's already strong tobacco retail license ordinance. Um, your enforcement efforts really do show um, that you're leading the way in the Bay Area. And I 
really support the work that you're doing. Um, and I think it'll go a long way to making sure that your flavored tobacco policy is implemented to the fullest and there's teeth behind your ordinance. And I know you have a lot of folks behind you. I'm sure you're going to be hearing many more comments this afternoon in support. So thank you again um, and look forward to seeing this pass. Thank you. And for all those waiting, we have a motion to approve and a second thus far. Go Next. ahead, David. Thank you. Next speaker is Tanya P. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Tanya Payapuli. I'm Deputy Executive Director at Breathe California, your local lung health leader since 1911. First, I want to thank you for your decision to come back and reconsider strengthening the enforcement actions for tobacco sale in Santa Clara County. We support all the listed recommendations with stricter penalties and especially adding the requirement that this bis businesses display their signage, notifying public about their suspension to underage sales. This will actually add additional pressure for compliance. So two reasons for you to act now. One is vaping rates are going back up with kids going back to school. Two, the industry is always coming back with newer products. And we recently heard about nicotine gummies that are more enticing than ever. So smoking and vaping, they're addicting, but quitting is harder. So we are running out of time to stop this cycle of addiction. Please consider doing this now as soon as possible. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Jade Chow. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear yes, me? Yes, go ahead. Jade. Can you, yes, can you guys yes. hear me? Good afternoon, supervisors and President Wasserman. My name is Jade Chow. I am a parent of two teens and former council president of the Palo Alto Council of PTAs. I have been before you to speak on behalf of parents, teachers, and teens. We urge you to adopt stricter penalties and enforcement of repeat offender shops who continue to violate the law and put our kids at tremendous risk of nicotine addiction and a lifetime of ill health. Tobacco retail shops geographically close to our middle and high schools continue to violate the law by selling to our kids. This is not okay with us. We, the parents of the PTA, aim to self-educate, advocate for kids, and convene a community breakfast on Friday, October 28th. Thank you, Supervisors Ellenberg, Chavez, Samidian, Lee, Wasserman, for your work on this and all your support for our kids. Thank you. Thank Next you. Next speaker is Erwin Morton. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Am I on? Yes, yes. go ahead. Thank you. My name is Erwin Morton from Palo Alto PTA Council. I want to thank the supervisors and staff for prioritizing this issue and for significantly strengthening the penalties. Under the original ordinance, the penalties, even for flagrant and repeated violations, were just a slap on the wrist, a minor cost of doing business. When the cost of doing business improperly is losing your license to do business at all, that concentrates the mind wonderfully. One area for possible improvement. In B11, 588, and 589, the proposed ordinance specifies penalties, quote, not to exceed, end quote, a specific dollar amount or suspension time. This allows administrators and judges to consider extenuating circumstances. But this ordinance is about the sale of products you are not allowed to sell at all. There is no legitimate reason to have them on site. The actions prohibited are so clear cut that I cannot imagine what extenuating circumstances are possible. You cannot violate the ordinance inadvertently. So I encourage the supervisors to specify precise financial and licensure penalties rather than not to exceed. Again, thank you so much, all of you, for working to protect our community's kids. Thank you. Next speaker is Walter Wilson. You have two minutes to speak. Please. It's not clear to me what we will do for somebody selling nitrous oxide. Hi, Supervisor Chavez. Um, Nicole Cox from our tobacco program is on. She uh, may be able to address your question. Nicole, Great, thank you. On. Thank you, Dr. Cody. Um, thanks, uh, Supervisor Chavez. So. Um, as we go out to conduct these inspections, um, the inspectors are planning to note 
uh, which retailers are selling nitrous oxide offering for sale. And then um, because you mentioned, we do have some challenges in terms of our local agencies not being authorized as, as an enforcement agent, uh, for, and as an enforcement agent for nitrous oxide um, state laws. So the plan is to uh, work to obtain as much information as possible during those visits um, to be able to measure um, whether they are in compliance with state law uh, for if they are selling um, nitrous oxide, um, how are they documenting um, those sales and whether or not they're providing the required educational material to customers. Um, so the goal is to collect baseline information. Um, we can't compel the, uh, the store uh, employees to provide that if they refuse. Um, however, our, our plan was to document all of that information and then if we suspect that there may be violations occurring, there are stated um, state agencies that are responsible for um, enforcement of the state law that we could then refer um, those specific uh, circumstances to for, for them to further investigate um, from an enforcement standpoint. So Nicole, um, may I make a, just a request? What I would like to see is very concretely what's the you know, and you can do this in an off agenda report, but just very concretely, once we've done the education, we're documenting all that information, where does it go? And then how do we follow up to make sure someone's following up on this? And one thing I, I'll just point out that um, one of my colleagues uh, that I work with here uh, saw a, uh, a restaurant supply store selling this, had no idea there were any requirements at all. And I get it, it's, it these are new laws. But I want to very concretely understand who are we explaining this to after we've done that and we've 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 alerted them they may or may not be following the law. And then where is it getting reported and then I want to make sure we're tracking the education, because if, in fact, we need to make some changes to state law. I would want to know what we should be advocating for so off agenda if there's just a like here's what happens here's here's how we're handling it here's who directly who it goes to and then. Um, also, I would want to better understand if there's a, a tool for us to annually get an update on what's before us, both in terms of the, you know, how many um, businesses are being educated, how many are being impacted by the, the um, ordinance, and then the same on this particular issue, so that it's all part of one report, because that, that would be the only way for us to assess effectiveness. And Supervisor, if I may, through the chair, um, just yes. ask a follow up clarifying question. When you talk about the annual report, are you including a report on the nitrous oxide information as well as the tobacco? Absolutely. Uh, okay. Yes, because I'm presuming that these these are going to happen concurrently anyway. And they so are at least for this first one, we had agreed to do a baseline uh, as part of the annual inspection process. And then I, yes, and then I would love the board to get an update on it because, again, I, I wouldn't know how we would assess its effectiveness. And the other thing I want to better understand is then, therefore, how do we follow up with the state on the complaints or um, violations of law that, that may not be apparent? I mean, you know, there would be no way other than us going to them and saying, give us information. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you, by the way, for the good work. You always, you guys rock it on this stuff. Thank you. Way to rock, Nicole. I like it. <laughs> All right, Supervisor Simidian, this is your motion. I seconded it. Do you have further comments? And then it looks like Supervisor Lee has some additional comments. I, I do, and and thank you. I I would uh, I would like to claim ownership of the motion in part because um, it's been an interest of significant concern uh, among my constituents, and um, I I'm. Uh, one thing we know for sure, uh, if I don't get hit by a truck, is that I'll still be here next year uh, to follow up on this. So uh, that's the plan. Uh, I do want to uh, move approval, but I want to ask some quick questions and see if we can make some progress on a couple of lingering issues. First, uh, through the chair, Supervisor Chavez, my inclination would be to ask that we get just sort of a, an update on nitrous oxide uh, at um, both health and hospital and children and families six months after the effective date, just to check in, not, I just I mean, yes. think that will sort of focus our attention. So if that uh, makes sense to my colleagues, I'd like to incorporate that into the motion 
So staff knows that that's an expectation. Uh, and I'm happy to do that with your consent, Mr. Wasserman. Yes, I agree. And Supervisor Chavez, I'm looking to see if I get a double, I get a double thumbs up. Thank you. Then the next issue is, um, you know, there's reference in the, and thank you to the staff, by the way, the uh, ordinance is very responsive to the requests that were made uh, at the last board meeting when we discussed this. Um, the, the theory, and, and this goes back to something I said in the prior item, is that there will be really three inspections, a couple of decoy inspections every year, plus at least one uh, regular inspection, I guess, from environmental health. But let me just ask staff, uh, it's my understanding that we're not really getting three inspections every year. Are we getting three inspections every year? And what would it take to up our game on inspections? Is it that local law enforcement doesn't feel they have the resource? What's What's the status and what's the step we could take to up our game? Nicole. Yeah, so and as you as you said, environmental health is conducting an annual inspection that's happening every year. Um, the challenges have been with the performing the decoy operations, uh, as noted in our current ordinance, that's required twice a year per for each retailer. Um, and I would say the the main challenge has been um, the the fact that that role is assigned to law enforcement agencies, the, the county sheriff um, for unincorporated stores, and in, with our partnership city, the city of Cupertino, uh, and then the the Los Gatos Montesorino Town Police Department and Palo Alto Police Department. And um, the challenge has really been with staffing capacity to prioritize and take that on to the level of two per year. And so we have seen um, variation in, in departments and, and agencies ability to meet that demand. Um, we in the public health department have uh, sought grants to be able to provide funding resources to those agencies um, where we have a current grant and have made those offers. We're currently actually funding the county sheriff and uh, the town of Los Gatos Montesorino Police Department and have made offers to Palo Alto Police Department uh, how, however, those have um, not been accepted due to, uh, at the time, staffing challenges. Um, so in regards to the solution, I think that's where um, in our report back, we feel like we need some additional time to really look at a potentially a different model um, where, uh, you know, we, we don't know exactly what that would entail, but are, is there potentially another agency or a community partner that we could be working with uh, that may or may not have those same staffing challenges. And so we, we really just need a little bit of time uh, both to implement uh, the proposed changes um, before you today, if those are adopted as well as, um, you know, to explore maybe other models we could be looking at um, implementing um, in a more sustainable way. Um, if Mr. Wass, thank you. That was very helpful. It was also very tactful, by the way. Uh, so uh, kudos to you for that. Uh, and Mr. Wasserman, uh, with your consent, I'd like to add further direction that at that six month time frame that uh, I uh, offered up earlier, we get a, an initial report back just sort of about options for uh, increased enforcement. And uh, that we direct staff to pursue options for increased enforcement so that that is not just an academic exercise on their part, but that they can say our board of supervisors has told us they want us to step up enforcement. So, Mr. Wasserman, if you agree about I'd like to add that to the motion, please. I think you are saying yes, even though you're muted, sir. Thank you. I'm saying yes, I agree with I'm going to take a silent or or a, or an oral yes. Thank you for that. And I'll just I just want to say before I go into the third and final point, I, I, you know I, I think we hope and expect that most of the vendors are law abiding and compliant. But I think um, one of my colleagues said at a prior meeting, if you're you know if you're determined to be non compliant, knowing that you know you're going to get at most one visit a year from somebody. It is almost an invitation to be a scoff law. That that's that's not effective, uh, you know. The, the, both literally and figuratively, it means there isn't a cop on the beat, and um, I think that's an invitation to uh, violation uh, for those who are inclined. And then the the last piece, and let me go to 
uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Williams and his county council team, uh, and and that is, um, there was this uh, question. Hi, Mr. Rossi. There was this question uh, about or issue raised about uh, the imposing the maximum fine, and I I know there's a, a a balance to be struck between making sure that people have some discretion and that fines and penalties. Uh, are more likely to be upheld if they're challenged, if there was some discretion so that, you know, uh, the circumstances and the context can be evaluated. But the specific point that was made was about products that are simply prohibited for sale uh, and that shouldn't, according to the speaker at least, shouldn't even be in the store because they are prohibited. Uh, Mr. Williams or Mr. Rossi, if you're the uh, designated hitter here, um, it, would it be possible to amend the ordinance so that uh, we just said uh, the products that were, uh, I think this is a minor amendment, that products that were, uh, you know, prohibited by state law, the maximum penalty would apply? Sure. Thank you, Supervisor Smitty. I can answer that. So, as you point out, the ordinance can be drafted to either allow for discretion or mandate a specific fine. Um, ordinances and statutes typically provide for discretion and not to exceed language um, because circumstances arise when a, a reduction fine may be appropriate. Um, and discretion also allows for the county to negotiate settlements that avoid resource intensive litigation. That being said, the amendment that you propose um, is, is, certainly, um, is certainly achievable. Um, I, I can give if, if if you'd like. I can give an example of a of a situation where discretion would be would be appropriate. But um, actually, what I would prefer through the chair, Mr. Rossi, is an example of where discretion would not be necessary would not be necessary because it was flat out prohibited and it shouldn't be in the store in the first place. So, can you give us an example uh, of something where? such and such a product isn't supposed to be there in the first place. So let's just say, if you got it, you're going to get dinged. Right. I would defer to the subject matter experts for, for, you know, the specific type of product. I would say that vape products would be specifically prohibited. Um, tobacco based vape products would be specifically prohibited um, and flavored products would be specifically prohibited. Uh, and I've seen uh, Nicole's nodding her head, but I think she may have even even other examples. Well, um, let me ask Ms. Cox then, if I may, through the chair, since Mr. Rossi took an artful punt there, I thought, uh, and I mean that in a good way, Mr. Rossi. Uh, Ms. Cox, those are all products that uh, our ordinance prohibits having for sale, yes? Correct. And Mr. Rossi and Ms. Cox together, if I may, then how about if we said the maximum penalty will apply for anything after the first offense. Uh, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm trying to be fair-minded here. I, I take the point that maybe on the first offense, somebody can, with a straight face, say, I didn't know, fair enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but after that first offense, when there's been a fine, I, I don't see any reason why we can't say the maximum penalty would apply it for any subsequent offense. Mr. Rossi, can we, Make that work, Ms. Cox. If it causes your heartburn, say so and tell us why. Tell me why. Um, but otherwise, I, I kind of feel like, you know, we should be clear. Please answer. Well, one of the examples that, that I was going to give Supervisor Smidian was, um, as one of the public speakers stated, this is an ever-evolving market um, that new products are coming online all the time. As a result, there could be some instances where a retailer may unwittingly sell a prohibited product, one that's so new to the market that it's not expressly banned. And that would, I, I imagine, be an interest where or an instance where discretion would be justified. I'm going to I'm going to try and bring this to a close, Mr. Wasserman, because you've been generous uh, with time and simply ask Mr. Wasserman, if you're amenable, that the um, that the the potential for um, imposing as a matter of course the maximum fine for anything subsequent to a first offense, meaning after a first offense, 
uh, come back to us in that six month report uh, and we'll take a look at it. I don't wanna do it on the fly and do a half-baked job, but I, I think you're getting a sense that um, there's a, a serious, at least on my part, there's a serious interest in pursuing that. So I'll, I'll add that to my list of things to talk about in six months in both committees, if you're amenable, Mr. Wasser. Supervisor Committee, and you're still, your intent is still to adopt this first reading today, correct? Yes, which is why thank I don't you. want to muddy it up with anything else. Thank you. No more muddying. I agree with you. All right. Thank you. Supervisor Lee and Vice President Ellenberg, what more would you like to add to this? First of all, I want to thank staff for a very good report and for something that is truly needed in our community to protect our residents and our kids especially. So I just want to say thank you for the great work putting all this together. Uh, and also the comments from uh, Supervisor Chavez regarding the um, the Knox issue. Um, I do have a couple of questions just matter of uh, uh, clarifying for the audience possibly is uh, the, in terms of jurisdiction, I mean, there was a lot of discussion about it, but from the president's point of view, if my local store we know is in violation, who should they be reporting to? Should it be the local police station? Michael? Well, I would say it depends on, on the specific kind of violation. Generally, it's the, the local law enforcement agencies that are conducting uh, decoy operations for underage sales. Um, and if it's uh, if there's more nuance to it, if it's a flavored product or a vaping product, that's generally under the purview of the Department of, of Environmental Health. I also see that Ms. Cox is, has joined us again. Yeah, I would say uh, to the community that our Department of Environmental Health uh, can has a, a way for on their website for complaints to be filed and is the main agency to to connect with about concerns around violations or or questions. So you're and talking I, about the county's department county. of environmental health, right? Because the cities, this is not in the city, it's the county's purview. So uh, just to make it clear for the public would be if it's relating to flavored uh, product that's come to the county. Uh, and if it's uh, other underage stuff that that's just the way the city might be the ones that be enforcing. That's that's correct. Okay, and in that sense, if they go to the wrong place, for example, they go to the police station to complain about the uh, the flavored issue, is this something that uh, that uh, we make sure our police uh, department will be able to refer them to us? Yeah, so we're working really closely um, with all of the city partners to make sure that there's clear lines of, of referrals and communications and constantly working on strengthening, um, you know, those relationships and and also making information uh, publicly, more publicly available on cities websites and on county websites. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, the report doesn't go in detail about the online sale or these third party deliveries. Uh, is there anything we could do on the monitoring these type of activities? Yeah, if, if I could just chime in on a couple points, just to clarify a few things. Yes. One is, I, I just wanted to make sure for, for the public's awareness, the, the specific additional requirements, of course, in this ordinance uh, over and above state law only apply to the unincorporated parts of the county and then any specific cities that choose on their own to adopt identical provisions. But I did want that to be clear because this Thank ordinance's you. provisions themselves don't apply in the other cities. Um, and then with respect to the your most recent question, Supervisor Lee, we did provide an off agenda memo. I think it was probably distributed when this item first came up so we can recirculate that, but specifically related to the, the issues around online and mail order um, sales. Thank you. you? And, Thank you. And Supervisor Lee, if you don't mind, I see a hand up by Rhonda. Hi, supervisors. I'm sorry to uh, interject in here, but I, I believe that there may be a procedural challenge um, in the request related to the motion around the timeline of six months. Supervisor Sinidian, I think that there is a process that we must undergo with cities that makes the six month period very, very difficult. So I think if I could ask uh, someone, uh, Michael, or Nicole or Rochelle uh, to chime in and just explain that a little bit, why I think that the six month period might be a little bit difficult to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. 
I can chime in. Um, I think this was related to uh, Supervisor Simidian's request uh, to look at the second violation um, fines in six months. Just a sort of context for that. Um, after the county approves any changes to the ordinance, we do have to work with our partnership cities to go back and update their, you know, if they choose their city municipal codes to be in alignment with the county. So just sort of a note on um, context, if we're thinking about future ordinance changes, you know, in six months again, um, that it's also going to require going back uh, to the cities for updating. And that does, you know, create a lot of a lot of work, both from the county and the city's um, perspective. Just, okay, so, just wanted so to make that clear. In. Through the chair, just on that point, I understand the limitations of the six month report back, but still think it would be helpful. I, I realize that it may not be quote actionable in the sense that staff is concerned about appreciate Ms. McClendon Brown telling us, you know, that there are some limits, uh, but I want to keep our eyes focused on this and I want the board to be fully engaged. And if we wait a year, then uh, we'll be starting from scratch all over again with a uh, new board composition, so on and so forth. So I'd like to keep the six months there, understanding the limits of the six months. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, did you finish? Yes, I have. Thank you. Yes, sir. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. Uh to staff for the ordinance and, and to all of my colleagues for the thoughtful conversation. Um, I, I appreciate the zealousness around protecting kids. That's certainly always my instinct too. But I, I wanna be careful about the, the punitive measures that we are talking about and how quickly um, uh, they will be enforced because I'm concerned about inequitable enforcement and what shops in what neighborhoods by what owners um, may be enforced much more aggressively and rigorously than others. And I don't know how we protect against that. And, and certainly if it's law enforcement's uh, decision, it's a little bit out of our hands. But when we're thinking about how aggressive to be and how quickly to to impose maximum fines. I, I just want to keep in mind um, the potential for, for really inequitable enforcement here and what small business owners are perhaps um, punished dispro disproportionately. And that's all, just a, all right. that observation to consider. Thank you. We have a motion, we have a second. We're now ready to take the vote and then as far as the introduction, the waiving, the reading, the preliminary, et cetera, um, that would all need to be done after our vote. Supervisor Smitty, are you up for the? Are you up for this? You ready? Ready to go. Thank you, David. Roll call vote, please. For yes, James. James, do we have to do these separately? No, you can take twenty-seven and twenty-eight together in one motion. Okay, What's thank my you. motion, sir. Thank you. Go ahead, David. Mr. President, just to clarify for the minutes, the motion was made by Supervisor Simidian and seconded by you. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Thank you. We'll do the roll call vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. And James, I apologize for remember, for forgetting this portion here, but um, we just approved it. And as far as waiving the, re the reading, the preliminary adoption, which is today, saying the final adoption will be on September 13th, is all that in the record already or is more needed? Yes, you don't need to read any of that. I'll, Thank I'll, you. I'll, that's all part of the action. Thank you. As part of the public agenda, we are done with that. 29 and 30 and 31 were handled previously. We now turn to item 32 which is the military equipment funding acquisition and use policy. Do we have a member of the sheriff's department here that wishes to make a brief report? I'm looking, I don't see any, I do now see the sheriff. I see the sheriff's office and back in the room. There we go, zoom in, zoom in. Wonderful, Sheriff Smith, welcome. Do you have a brief report you wish to make before we 
hear from the public and take a vote. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and members of the board. Uh, we do not have any presentation today. All right. We're here to answer any questions, uh, should there be any. Thank you. I appreciate that. We have one member of the public. David, will you please let them in for two minutes? All right. One moment, please, while we get the timer up. Next speaker is Andrew Siegler. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Andrew Siegler. I'm a member of Surge and Sacred Heart, and I'm a registered and active voter and taxpayer in Santa Clara County District 2. I urge the board to engage with the military equipment list on an item by item basis and reject the military equipment usage policy today, the policy ordinance today. The board's proposed reconvening on this issue six months after ordinance adoption does not satisfy the public interest and civil rights ethos behind AB 481. Military equipment poses real harm to communities, particularly those of color. Studies show that they fail to reduce crime and attacks on police, but that they do increase the amount of violence communities face at the hands of police. The data around the use of force incidents that the board wants to collect could involve the death or injury of real members of our community. The difference between being deliberate now and reconvening in six months could literally be the difference between life and death. And the board should not treat those two options as equivalent. Again, engage with the military equipment list on an item by item basis and reject the military equipment usage policy ordinance today. Thank you very much for your time. I can see my time. Thank you. Next speaker is Lamberti. I am unmuting you. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. My name is Via Lamberti and I am a Stanford University student. I also urge the board to engage with the military equipment list on an item by item basis and reject the military equipment use policy ordinance today. Um, AB 481 was designed to promote public safety and police transparency. The public simply has not had enough time to meaningfully engage with the full scope of military equipment and context in which they may be used. The military equipment use policy references at least 105 different types of equipment and nearly a dozen general orders and policies across 160 plus pages. The relevant policies and general orders bearing on the military equipment use policy were only provided in time for the August 16th Board of Supervisors meeting. Uh, specifically as a Stanford student, I'm concerned about the uh, 30, 312 AR-15s within the Sheriff's Office inventory, particularly the 32 in SUDPS's possession. SUDPS has a documented history of racist policing practices, including disproportionately stopping, citing, and arresting Black and Latino vehicle operators. Its jurisdiction extended into Portola Valley, Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, and Palo Alto. Yet these residents have absolutely no input in the scope of their operations and no way to hold these officers accountable. Black and brown community members on and off Stanford's campus are at a greater risk of harm when such military equipment is in SUDPS's possession. The board's preliminary adoption of the ordinance has gone against the heart of AB 481. We urge the board to take seriously these principles of AB 481, engage with the military equipment list on an item by item basis and reject the military equipment use policy ordinance today. I cede the rest of my time. Thank you. Next speaker is Catherine Hedges. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Um, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Hedges. I am a registered voter in District 2 and a member of Surge. And like the other speakers, I urge the board to engage with the military equipment list on an item by item basis and reject the military use policy ordinance today. Under AB 41, Section 7071, Part A, this board cannot approve the military equipment use policy unless it determines that each piece of military equipment is necessary because there is no reasonable alternative. It is not enough for the board to ask Mr. Janico whether any piece of equipment stands out as problematic or to defer to assessments from the sheriff's office. The board must determine for itself that each piece of equipment is necessary with no reasonable alternatives. It is also unacceptable to do a blanket acceptance and reconvene in six months. As Andrew pointed out, military equipment poses real harm to communities, particularly those of color and we can't wait six months to figure this out. Um, the data around forth, use of force incidents that the board wants to collect could involve the death or injury of real members of our community. The difference between being deliberate now and reconvening in six months could literally be the difference in life and death for people in our community 
and the board should not treat those two options as equivalent. Thank you very much. I see my time. And that concludes our public speakers. Thank you very much. Supervisor Lee. Uh, yes, I am uh, willing to go ahead and make a motion if there's no more uh, speaker or no more. No, nope, um, go right ahead. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and move the, to adopt the uh, ordinance uh, as stated in item number 32 with uh, the six months uh, report back, uh, number one. And then second thing is um, I would also like to uh, include, as we mentioned last meeting, uh, regarding a uh, report to the board would be necessary within uh, 30 days of use. If that okay. incident result in a significant body harm or we were used in the mass demonstration assembly setting. Thank you. I'll second your motion. Anything else? Um, oh, yes. One more thing I do want to mention. For the six-month check-in, I do want to uh, ask uh, the sheriff's office, uh, just like cleaning the, 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 your storage, uh, I think it would be good to know that if these are uh, uh, military equipment that they found not, not needed, uh, this is something that they could let us know, and we could also delete those off the list as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge that one of the things that we asked for was some feedback from uh, the OCLEM folks, the CCLEM folks, and I wanted to make sure that that if there was any additional uh, information that Walter wanted to give, he could do that now. Thank you, Walter, are you on? His hand is raised, I will unmute him. I have thank just promoted you. him thank to you. analyst. Go, go ahead, Walter, responding to Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, so yeah, we had an opportunity to um, actually weigh in on the uh, very questions that the Previous people just asked about looking at these items on a on a <clears throat> item by item basis. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I just want to share with you uh, where we are, the Office of the Sheriff Military Equipment Policy, and this input was provided by members of the CCLEM committee. On August twenty third, twenty twenty two, the CCLEM held a, a special meeting to consider the Office of the Sheriff Military Equipment Use Policy. During the meeting, CCLEM commissioners in attendance discuss their views on military equipment use policy and the equipment possessed by the sheriff's office. And some commissioners shared feedback obtained from members of the community. CCLEM also received public comment from Jess Guy, um, identified by CCLEM chairperson Walter Wilson as a weapons expert. And uh, he's very familiar with um, law enforcement here as well as um, the sheriff's department who we had some conversations with about the list. Uh, CCLM did not take any action to make recommendations to the board regarding specific types of military equipment or proposed modifications as a group. Instead, a majority of the committee voted to forward to the Board of Supervisors a packet, uh, written input from individual CCLM members, as well as um, any written input from Mr. Guy, which he did a report, which I hope you guys know. And his report went line by line for every single piece of equipment that's on the list. And primarily because for me, I didn't know what all these things did. And quite frankly, I don't think any of you did either, to be honest with you. And, um, you know, my conversation with uh, Mr. Guy, uh, once he did his report, I went line by line by for each one of these pieces of equipment. In addition to that, the, the concerns that he had, I also spoke with uh, Captain Amori, <clears throat> excuse me, from the sheriff's office. And um, some of the things that, that he told me helped me better understand why the sheriff needed some of these some of these things and so i wrote a, i wrote my report to the board of supervisors and i it says i extensively researched the issue in the community generally most people are surprised and even concerned that the sheriff and local law enforcement agencies have stockpiles of this type of equipment stored here in our communities for potential use against citizens as such i've expressed opposition to outright approval of the military styles weapons <clears throat> as provided by the sheriff's department I recommended the Board of Supervisors agree that the CCLEM would like to examine and define the use of each weapon listed individuals. The ultimate goal is to identify weapons listed that the CCLEM deems dangerous, although not intended to be under normal use, unnecessary overkill, should be retired or no longer used. I've reached out the weapons expert, Jess Guy, to assist me in understanding <clears throat> the scope and depth of the weapons listed and to give his professional opinion 
of lethal versus non-lethal and everything in between. Just Guy's background includes uh, San Jose State master's degree in criminal justice, uh, Lincoln Law School, 28 years of special ATF agent, 14 years of resident agent in charge of the ATF in San Jose, five years team leader, ATF special response team, San Francisco, 15 years of criminal defense working for the public defender's office, <clears throat> five years San Jose Justice Department, semi-retired consulting and working with firearms matter, and California and federal certified firearms instructors, among others. I also spoke, as I said, with Captain Amore regarding the use of some of those weapons in question. Now, the, the report that's submitted that's in front of you really gives a different perspective, a very real perspective anyway, from um, uh, our weapons expert in terms of how these weapons are used, when they're used, <clears throat> and, and, uh, and how they're used and what their purposes are. What I discovered was that <clears throat> rubber bullet type projectiles semi-solid and solid projectiles were the most likely to inadvertently or purposely, depending on their use, cause serious injuries and harm. Used improperly, this could be the case with all the projectiles, period. For example, according to the manufacturer, the speed heat 40 millimeter round is designed for outdoor use and has fire producing capability. It is not intended for barricade penetration and it says directly, do not fire directly at, at personnel as serious injury or death may result. The, uh, one of the other things that stood out was the, the launchers that are used to launch these projectiles or grenades or other things. <clears throat> Black powder launchers are more powerful and dangerous than compressed air launchers. Therefore, it is highly recommended to utilize the compressed air launchers where possible. And still, according to training and not directly at people, but aiming low, the very multiple munitions launch platforms should be minimized to streamline their training and uses because there's so many that they have on their list. And, and these are recommendations I make. And so these are also the same recommendations of, um, of, um, of, our, of Jeff, Jeff, Jeff's guide. Furthermore, according to Captain Amori, <clears throat> when on the list of inventory, one of the things that concerned our weapons expert was the, the things were there, but there was zero listed inventory. And uh, Captain Amori explained to me that some of these things are expired products out of inventory, not reordered because of this pending order, giving permission to, to purchase a new product or end of cycle and no longer being used. I can see that the biggest danger in the use of projectiles is the use of projectiles in the direction of people. Multiple types of smoke and chemical grenades in the arsenal are major concerns in this category. First of all, there are multiple grenades with different colors, 12 different types of tear gas and irritants on the list. Why not standardize on one color to reduce costs? As it turns out, according to Capitol Murray, though, <clears throat> though smoke grenades have different colors with similar uses, each has a very specific use for them in terms of, um, in terms of how they use them and what they do. Um, therefore, the multiple color grenades are needed as life-saving measures because they use them also for communication purposes. Yeah. All devices that generate smoke are burning and could, but are highly unlikely to cause fires. Additionally, the compressed air launchers could propel a grenade up to 75 feet, much less powerful than black powder launchers, but still capable of delivering powerful chemical irritants to eyes, nose, and chest. And so if they have to use launchers, we would definitely prefer they use the compressed air. Reining in and streamlining and limited the use of all types of projectiles will go a long way to saving lives, reducing injuries, and reducing escalation. But at the end of the day, to borrow a phrase from Captain Amore, who reported out to us a couple of meetings ago, uh, and he was uh, recently involved in apprehending an armed suspect without fatal outcome, time and space saves lives. And that's the um, that's the leadership that they used in order to save this person's life at Valley Medical Center, time and space from an armed suspect who wound up getting treatment instead of being killed by uh, the sheriff department. So in the end, we know that regardless of whatever weapons are available, military or not, it comes down to the leadership of law enforcement on the scene and how they handle the situation. The other thing I wanna point out is that um, Ron Hansen, a, a prominent member of our committee, went line by line for each item. And effectively, he and um, uh, Christine Clifford said that everything that's, um, that, that's fatal, that can cause fatal harm to individuals are things that they want taken off the list. And that includes the uh, AR-15s and others. But, but you see, 
you know, this 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 issue is such a complex issue that even us on the same committee are not going to agree 100% with with everything in terms of how we how we see this because it is a very complex matter. But we do still we still would like for the um, uh, sheriff department to take our recommendations into consideration and have the board also make that part of the the motion that they take into consideration to um, to to look at some of our recommendations here. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Uh, Supervisor Chavez's hand is down. Supervisor Lee, your hand is up. Yeah, I, I just want to, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, the member of CCLAM, uh, 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 Walter Wilson Chair and, and the various members, and along with OCLAM as well, that spoke on this issue last uh, month, uh, last meeting, if you recall, uh, regarding the uh, development of how this all happens. Um, this all came from the Assembly Bill 41 that was passed by the legislature, basically give the power of the supervisors or board of supervisors on various counties to have the power of the oversight of the military equipment. Prior to that, there really wasn't a, a solid uh, 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 oversight in that. So that's why this ordinance has been developed. And uh, and this the adoption of it actually provides the oversight uh, of the inventory of the items uh, and reporting of the usage uh, and, you know, regarding, you know, future potential funding acquisition and use all those things will now have an oversight being built in. And that's why it's so important that we have to, uh, that, that I'm moving forward to adopt the ordinance. By adopting ordinance does not necessarily mean that we agree with every piece of military equipment. If you want to dispute which equipment you don't want, that's a separate discussion and we could bring it back to the board in the future regarding which piece of equipment that is not appropriate to have. Uh, I just want to make that very clear. So this ordinance actually strengthened the ability for civilian oversight uh, of these equipment. So I think that's why it's important to be uh, adopted. I just want to make that very clear and the reason why I make the motion. Thank you. Thank you. And as a seconder, I agree. Supervisor Simidian. You're muted, sir. Thank you. To the rest of us. Oh, I just... Uh want to um, remind uh, and in some cases perhaps share for the first time that um, we our board uh, took these issues up um, long ago uh, independent of state legislation and um, I, I wanted first of all to say there is a Uh, page after page after page in our um, binders, uh, for those who are still using binders or online, for those who are going digitally, I'm smiling at my colleague, Ms. Ellenberg, uh, of um, uh, military equipment list in Appendix A and B and C and so on. Uh, but long ago, Supervisor Lee, I'm sure remembers the painstaking uh, line by line uh, analysis we did in the health and hospital committee. I'm looking at the agenda for June 24th from 2021. And we had, uh, before we had the authorization or direction from the state, we had taken this issue up on our own because the board was concerned about it, wanted to make sure we were um, on top of this issue. Uh, we got some pushback candidly from the sheriff at the time, uh, pursuant to section 25303 of the government code. Uh, but Supervisor Lee, I will, I am sure, remembers going through this, these colored pages with color coded indications of different kinds of uh, weaponry. And, um, you know, I, I remember asking very specific questions about what kinds of projectiles were associated with what kinds of weaponry. Uh, so I just I did want I, I didn't want people to think we didn't have information before us in our packets today. We do literally a year and a half ago, uh, at least at the committee level, we were marching through that uh, in painstaking detail. And I just want to close by saying I I think uh, among the important takeaways from what we're hearing from the community is um, that this isn't a one and done. Once we take whatever action we take today, the work continues. And 
I, you know, I, I'm, I just say the notion of revisiting in six months isn't to suggest we should do anything other than the most rigorous of jobs today. Quite the opposite, in my judgment, is to say, notwithstanding the fact that we have put this on a uh, open and public agenda now uh, twice, uh, rather than the usual once on the public agenda and once on consent, um, we want to make sure that we stay on top of it and look at it again uh, in a relatively short order. Um, I think the last thing I would say, Mr. Chairman, on this is, look, we can look at the list and make uh, our own best judgments, but there are a whole host of other questions which uh, our board, uh, with the help of OIR group and OCLEM and CCLEM need to address, which is, all right, it's not enough just to look at the list and to make judgments about what should or shouldn't be available. Do we have, does the county sheriff have, does the sheriff's department have, good policies and procedures on the books. That's why we had the conversation about whether or not the general order was or wasn't gonna be uh, subject to change uh, at the discretion of the sheriff or whether or not that would require engagement by the board. So it's not just the weapons, it's the policies and procedures governing their use. And then the next question in my mind is, has the training been provided to make sure that the policies and procedures have some weight. They're not just something uh, gathering dust uh, or digital dust, as the case may be, depending on where they're located. So it's it's we're not done today. Uh, we we can't be. We shouldn't be. Uh, but I did want to provide that assurance and also say it's not just about the weaponry. It's about uh, the policies and procedures in place and the training that makes that real. Uh, and um, I'll let it go with that. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Smithian. Uh, Vice President Ellenberg, additional comments? Sure, very briefly. Uh, Walter, I want to express my appreciation and gratitude to you and CCLEM for the seriousness with which um, you, you approach the task that we all assigned to you. Uh, at our previous board meeting, uh, of course, I was hoping for a specific uh, list of recommendations um, approved by the, the committee, but I understand the difficulty. Um, and, and, and it is this difficulty and my my fundamental uh, problem with with the military grade equipments. So in, in spite of the great report, Walter, that, that you did, in spite of the, the really good uh, collaboration that um, the sheriff engaged in with OIR, uh, I'm going to remain an abstention on this as, as uh, was my intent at the first reading. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to call for a roll call vote, David. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Abstain. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We handled 33 on consent. We now move to item 34. And knowing that my colleagues have read the report and in the interest of trying to save some time, I'd like to hear from public comment, and then I have prepared remarks to say. Dr. Smith, your hand. Um, I just would like to talk after public comment and after your motion, which thank I you. thank I'm you very much. I need to talk to. Thank you, David. Speakers, please. One moment, please. Thank you. Next speaker is Alice Kaufman. Um, let's change the time to two minutes. two minutes. Is that correct? All right, yes. one moment. Thank you. Next speaker is Alice Kaufman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, President Wasserman and Supervisors. This is Alice Kaufman, uh, Policy and Advocacy Director for Green Foothills. I'm Speaking about the uh, suggestion in the staff report that uh, the county consider non-renewal of Williamson Act contracts in order to generate revenue for the fire services, um, Greenfield is urging the county not to consider that as a way of generating revenue. This would be a counterproductive measure. Williamson Act contracts are a key tool in preventing pr uh, loss of farmland to development. Farmland serves as a buffer to protect communities from wildfire. If farmland is converted to development, not only does that reduce the buffer zone, but it will put this new development in harm's way. 
the Santa Clara Valley Agricultural Plan highlighted the need to protect our remaining agricultural land. We've already lost thousands of acres of productive farmland. We can't afford to lose any more. Using non-renewal of Williams Act contracts to generate revenue would be going in the exact opposite direction from where we should be going. It would be a huge step backwards in the effort to create and maintain a local sustainable food system that benefits communities both environmentally and in terms of public health. Please remove the non-renewal of Williamson Act contracts from the list of potential revenue generating strategies. Thank you. Next speaker is Jim Acker. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Jim Acker, and I am a commissioner for the South Santa Clara County Fire District. I know that you have a great deal of information before you today in regards to this issue, and I would like to emphasize two important points within that information. Number one, and most importantly, this issue should be considered with a sense of urgency and should be settled today. If nothing is done by next year, we will be spending from our reserve funds. Number two, as published in the report that you have been provided, the ongoing dollar amount that is needed to get the fire district back to a point where it should be is approximately four and a half million dollars. This amount of money is certainly not unreasonable considering that this district is the largest fire district within our county and continues to meet its response goals at a fraction of the cost of other districts. While four and a half million dollars is certainly not a small amount of money, it is an absolute bargain for what is being provided. I thank you all for your consideration, the men and women of the district and the citizens they serve all appreciate your continued support. Thank you, Mr. Acker. The next speaker is uh, Galaxy A13 5G. You have been unmuted. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. This is Sharon Luna from the San Martin Neighborhood Alliance Association. Sorry. Um, I would like to express um, concern as far as anything to reduce on the um, South County Fire Department. We are a, a growing area and we need that fire support. Um, I've listened to the meetings all day today and $4 million is seems a, a drop in the bucket compared to what is being spent for issues that continue to go on and on. I appreciate this fire support that we have in our South County area, especially in San Martin. And I would like you to approve um, increasing funding um, for $4 million. I would also like to caution you as far as reducing the Williamson Act, because this is very important. Um, we are an agricultural community. The board has uh, stated as far as, you know, keeping agriculture agricultural in our area and we need to have that support thank you very much next speaker is mike gill you have two minutes to speak please go ahead hi my name is mike gill i'm a firefighter here with battalion seven uh fire district with cal fire and morgan hill city uh we just would ask that you would approve the uh the budget uh we cover several areas including the outskirts of santa cruz county uh, Gilroy area up to North Morgan Hill City areas, and uh, the staffing is very important to us and to serve our community. And I feel like it'd be a continued asset to serve the public, and it wouldn't extend any other fire departments within um, the fire district if we stay open. For instance, Gilroy City would be extending their time to reach our areas, and so will Morgan Hill City. Um, we'll take several more times to get to our area. So I appreciate your time and thank you. Next speaker is John Byrne. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, my name is John Byrne. I represent the firefighters for Cal Fire in the Bay Area. Uh, we work really hard year round and we've been doing the best we can to serve the public and uh, with our regional fire protection and with our boundary drops that we have um, in the area with San Jose, Gilroy Fire, um, with Morgan Hill City contract in the South County. Uh, we provide the best fire protection we can um, at a very reasonable price and we're just not able to get to where we need to and we really we're really honored to serve here and any support would really go a long way for us thank you next speaker is mark landgraf you have two minutes to speak please go ahead thank you good afternoon 
President Wasserman, Supervisors, Mark Landgraf with the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. We're in very strong support of the intent of this item to ensure that emergency and fire services in South County remain adequate and sustainable. One of the strategies mentioned in the report that's being considered regarding reducing renewals of Williamson Act agreements, however, is something that we advise strongly against um, for considering this as a revenue generating strategy. Agricultural lands, row crop, as well as range land already provide significant climate resilience to our communities, especially as a buffer from wildfire for residential areas. Well-managed range lands did exactly that during the 2016 Loma fire, where grazed lands help protect Morgan Hill from fire spreading into developed areas. Farm and range lands also provide many other ecosystem services like helping to spread and slow floodwaters during storm events to reduce risks to downstream communities. Ag lands also help recharge our underground aquifers during big storm events to buffer us from drought. We need to focus on preserving not less farm and rangeland, but more, as stated in the Santa Clara Valley Ag Plan adopted by the county in 2018. Reducing renewals of Williamson Act contracts would make it very difficult for many farmers and ranchers to maintain sustainable operations in the county. Protection of farm and ranch land, if done through conservation easements or outright purchase of lands, is expensive. Williamson Act contracts are a very cost-effective way for the county to meet its agricultural protection goals in a way that also benefits the farmers and ranchers who operate under extremely difficult financial conditions. The Open Space Authority stands ready to assist the county in identifying outside sources of funding to help meet wildfire resilience goals. The state has allocated record amount of funding to community wildfire resilience through a variety of grant programs. We'd be happy to help the county identify those. Thank you very much for opportunity to comment. Thank and you. that concludes our public speakers. Thank you, Dave. And as I mentioned before, I have prepared comments. And then Dr. Smith, I'll turn to you. Unfortunately, this report is not quite as responsive to my referral as I would have liked. We need a solution. There is no time for further study. South County Fire must renegotiate its contract with Cal Fire before it expires June 30th, 2023. To delay taking action today is not the right thing to do. Fire protection is a core function of county government and one of the first things that should be funded in the budget. It is our responsibility as a board to fix this problem now. Let's look at why we're having this discussion. Our board has made it a priority to support ag and preserve open space in South County, which benefits the entire county. But we must also acknowledge that our land use policies protecting these lands have financially hamstrung the fire district. On page two of the ledge file, the report references the 2021 South County District five-year financial plan, which identifies the categories of need for the district. What was omitted from the report concluded the minimum amount of revenues needed to ensure operations at present levels is 4.5 million. Because the whole county benefits from the preservation of these lands, it is appropriate to allocate 4.5 million in Prop 172 public safety sales tax funds to ensure that the South County Fire District has sustainable resources. What better way is there to spend public safety sales tax funds than on public safety? That is the solution I propose the board adopt today. Therefore, my motion is the following. One, direct administration to return to the September 27th meeting with an item to allocate 4.5 million in public safety sales tax monies to the SSCC FD. Direct administration and council to return to the board at the latest by December 6th meeting with A, a report on the feasibility of one, increased development impact fees, and two, potential ballot measures. B, a plan to implement a joint agency strategic planning team to evaluate cooperative service opportunities between the SSCCFD and the cities of Morgan Hill and Gilroy including a review of current staffing model, and C, a report evaluating implementation of fee-for-service reimbursement model. Note, this report should include CAL FIRE's input, since they are the administrative staff to the SSCCFD, and three, direct administration to monitor the status 
of SB 450? And should it be signed into law and returned to the board with updates as the legislation is implemented and information about availability of grant funding is known? That is my motion and I respectfully ask for a second. And I'm happy to second uh, Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you, Supervisor Smitty. And with that, I'll turn to Dr. Smith. I um, <clears throat> wanted to make clear to the board that um, Prop 172 money is equivalent to general fund. It's not allocated specifically in our budget to any particular um, part of the service of public safety. So um, we certainly would not recommend subsidizing the South County fire with general fund monies. But if the board wants to do that, when we come back with a recommendation, we'll have to come back with a recommendation to cut four and a half million dollars out of the general fund. It'll take a four fifths majority vote to do that. One would recommend from the administration that because the current budget is balanced for South County fire, um, and there is no immediate harm uh, to the budget that we should consider it during the mid-year realignment, at which time it's likely we'll have uh, other funding sources or significant um, savings in other departments. Um, so that would be the typical time to make decisions about the general fund budget. Thank you. Before I respond, I'll turn to Supervisor Simidian and Vice President Allen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I gotta say, I, I respectfully take exception to the uh, characterization of these funds as general fund dollars. They're not. I mean, that's, that's why it's called Proposition 172, and that's why it's called Public Safety Sales Tax. And, you know, in anticipation of this conversation, I, you know, I scurried around and came up with the government code section 30052B1 that specifically defines public safety services for the purposes of the proposition, quote, as including, but not limited to, sheriff's police fire protection, specifically called out, county district attorneys, county corrections, and ocean lifeguards. Um, public safety services does not include courts, uh, end quote. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my point in reading that, Mr. Chairman, is that's what this money is for. It's, yeah. it's specifically for public safety and specifically for uh, fire protection. And, uh, you know, we, we would actually be using the money for what it is specifically called out for in both the proposition and the implementing statute. Um, you know, if that means there's some backfill, so be it. But I do think it's a uh, it's a misnomer to characterize it as anything other than what it is, which is public safety sales tax that's supposed to be dedicated to the public safety sales tax. It is a, you know, uh, I mean, I'm pausing here because, you know, we get $270 million in public safety sales tax uh, this year alone. Uh, and that's because there was a 9% increase uh, from last year. I mean, we got $22 million more this year alone in public safety sales tax, which we're supposed to spend on public safety. And, you know, Mr. Wasserman's suggesting, and I agree that four and a half million out of that $22 million increase uh, would be appropriate. We, I mean, we, we spend money for things that we have to, um, you know, 125 million over two years for travel nurses at VMC because we need them to get the job done. And, you know, just today, 19 million uh, for the 11% raise for correctional peace officers because we need them and we know we're not competitive. And, you know, uh, I think it was item 90 that uh, we pulled from consent where we're spending four million already for landscape services, uh, and we're talking about another couple million. So I'm asking myself, you know, 
landscape services uh, or fire protection and using public safety money for public safety for fire protection, I, I think it would be the first time in 30 years that we felt the uh, need to do it because this uh, Prop 172 has been on the books, I think, since 92, 93, somewhere back around there. Um, so I, I think it's the appropriate use of revenue. And by the way, it's consistent with the action we took as the you know governing board uh, for the fire, the central fire, just you know uh, uh, within the last couple of months, when we said, oh no, if there's going to be development in the Moffat Field area, it should be covered by the development at the Moffat Field area. We didn't, you know, want to move money around then either. And I just I think we need to say in this case, as you did, Mr. Chairman. If the reason they don't have any property tax revenue down in South County is because of general plan decisions, zoning decisions, and Williamson Act decisions that we made, then let's own that and put our public safety sales tax money where our mouth is when we say we want to preserve the unique characteristics of the South County. And by the way, I, I share your view that there isn't a snowball's chance in hell we're going to want to uh, eliminate the Williamson Act uh, commitment that our county has embedded. Thank you. I'll ask for an I vote as well on this one. Thank you. Yes, we're, we encourage ag land and ag land is worth less than developed land. So the dollars aren't there. Vice President Ellenberg. I'd actually like to hear, I think Dr. Smith had a, a response to uh, Supervisor Smithian. And if that's the case, I'd like to hear that first. If not, I'll share my comments. Dr. Smith. Um, well, respectfully disagree. The entire budget of the district attorney, the sheriff, the custody, and pretrial um, and probation um, is virtually all general fund. So, therefore, if you want a budget balanced, which we have to have in order to take general fund monies and put them into the fire district, you have to cut four and a half million out of the general fund. That's just budget balancing, you know, there's no question about it. And that's why I think it should be done during the mid-year when you have the opportunity to look at new revenues. Thank you. I I do not wish to leave this down to six months before they're basically out of money. I know we find dollars for other desires and wishes, whatever pots or reserves they're in. So I certainly want to find this money to continue fire protection for the largest swath of land in Santa Clara County. Through the chair, I know we have colleagues waiting, but since okay. Ms. Ellenberg uh, it gave the county executive the opportunity to rebut, I'd like the opportunity to rebut the rebuttal. If this if we're going to have a back and forth, I'd like to be able to finish the debate. That makes sense. And uh, you know, colleagues, excuse me, but Dr. Smith, uh, I, the eleven percent for correctional officers today that you didn't that was nineteen million dollars. You didn't think we should wait till mid year to take care of that, Dr. Smith? That's that's nineteen million dollars. That's four or five times what we're talking about. That's true, but that's also coming from the general fund. So, so, so in other yeah. words, we can we can yes, make that have. decision. We can make that decision when we think it's important, and we don't have to wait till mid year, which is what we did at staff's recommendation earlier today. Okay. I just want some intellectual consistency. Okay. Well, what I want to explain to you is that the money that you voted for to give to the correctional officers came out of the money that you've already allocated to um, object one in those offices. You have not allocated money to the fire district. So therefore, it would have to come out of something that you already allocated in the budget. I'm sorry to be you know, strict about it, but that's the way it is. Oh, it's not so, strict. It's simply intellectually disingenuous to say that we have to do it in one case, but we don't have to do it in another. Dr. Smith, I've been balancing budgets for 40 years, as you know. I have been a key proponent of the notion that if we spend money one place, we can't spend it another place. But you know, this is really an $11.5 billion budget. 
to suggest that four and a half million dollars is a deal breaker when it is budget dust, relatively speaking, and it is a use of funds from a proposition and a public safety sales tax specifically identified in law for this purpose. I, I, I'm sorry, I just don't think that's a credible argument. All I'm saying is we'll have to take four and a half million out of something else. Fair enough. Okay. Vice President Ellenberg. Uh, thank you so much. I, I appreciate the, the conversation. Um, I, I have a, a, a few a few issues and perhaps some questions. Uh, number one, I just want to put out there that one of the reasons that we are doing this and in this situation is that our board voted against consolidating the fire districts. So part of the understanding, at least to me, was that if they wanted to remain separate, they would also be self-funding. The four and a half million dollars is a number that has been estimated by the district, but I would certainly want our administration to vet that number and um, and 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 provide some evidence that that is actually uh, the right amount. I know that they they are balanced this year. I know they don't want to move into their reserve, um, but but again, I want to be be careful and know what we're spending, especially if we are looking at something that's ongoing. I doubt this is a, if we go down this path, that it's not a one-time um, a one -time, a deposit of, of funds. So I'm not prepared to start it to, to, to support this today because I don't feel that I have uh, sufficient evidence that the amount is right um, where the obligation comes from. I would also, again, think that we should, if we're going to go down this path, we should be looking again at the possibility of, um, what is that word, of, of consolidating the fire districts, which would make this a lot clearer and cleaner uh, for me. So uh, that's that's where I am today, and I appreciate the, the time. Thank you. Thank you. Before I turn to Supervisor Lee, the temperature starting Thursday in Morgan Hill, 98, 96, 101, 103, 106 on Labor Day, 102, 96 degrees. And That's a seven day average. Yeah. And I can go to Gilroy next, but- Supervisor Wasserman, if you're making- I'm sorry, Vice President, if I may just finish. And then I'm happy to go back yes, to you. Course. This is fire protection that needs to happen. The four and a half million dollar number came from a very, very, very thin, what's the minimum we can get by to do? And fire is real, global warming is real, people die, crops are, crops are burned. We need to support fire in Santa Clara County. Vice President Ellenberg. I appreciate that. I have no argument with the fact that fire danger is very, very high and that it absolutely has to be something that it, it, we have to have a well-funded response. I am noting that our administration should also understand and defend the four and a half million dollar request. We should be clear about whether this is a one-time support and if it is not and it's a proposed ongoing then i would want to add to the motion a reconsideration of consolidation uh because i i, I don't think I, I don't think we should have it both ways uh and and with regard to the general the general fund dollars um of course every time we spend money somewhere it, it would have to be backfilled uh, by general funds so that's that that is the the reality i am I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. And Prop 172 public safety sales tax funds cannot be ongoing. They have to be allocated each year. This my motion is simply to allocate that amount for the next year as we look for other alternatives. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. 
Thank you, um, President Lawson. Um, yeah, this one is, uh, uh, first of all, I want to say that there is uh, absolutely no question that we are not going to look at uh, ways of saving money in terms of decreasing the service or staffing level. Uh, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the temperature is very, very high, uh, the global, uh, uh, the climate change that we're dealing with, the risk of wildfire by far is much higher now than than ever. And so uh, if anything, I would think we probably need to increase uh, services uh, as we progress in this type of a, a situation. So, uh, so first I, I want to make sure that I'm absolutely supportive of making sure that the funding is there to make sure our South County, anywhere in our county, uh, is safe uh, and be preventative against any type of a, a fire incident in the future. Uh, I am interested to ask a little bit more questions regarding the various strategy has been proposed uh, by the administration, for example, like the fee for service reimbursement, um, the cost sharing agreements and the ballot and bond measures uh, as uh, uh, and the development impact fees, some of these to see if we could look at it as if not all the funds coming from general fund 172, we could just try to patch all these together to make it work. So uh, uh, my ask to maybe, uh, right, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Dr. Smith, uh, your comment on, on these individual fees. Uh, I mean, there's some estimate uh, dollar amount that goes along with it. And I just want to have a, a short discussion on that. And, and also uh, in terms of the urgency, if the funding is not given now, the funds is still there, but will run out in two years is what I read in the report in 2024, is that correct? Um, first of all, um, Mr. President, I heard a different thing from you just now about the allocation. You said the allocation would be for next year. Is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about the current fiscal year? I've got to read in here, I believe, what was planned by the fire district. And hopefully Jim Acker is still on and he can answer that. But just for the record, if I may, is Supervisor Chavez gone? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I'm not At seeing- At least I don't see her. Yeah, I'm not seeing her in the room, Mr. President. Okay, thank you. Could you please let, David, could you please let Mr. Jim Acker back on so yes. that he can answer Dr. Smith's question? He has been unmuted. Uh, Jim, whenever you're ready, you can, you can speak. I am available for question. Thank you. I believe it's next year. Mr. Acker, I was looking for the funding, this four and a half million being asked to be effective July 1st of next year. Is that correct? Yes, sir, it is. Thank you. So then it would be in our budget next fiscal year, Dr. Smith. Mr. Acker, could you please stay on in case there's any other questions? Okay, well, yes. that changes the picture completely. Um, that means it would be considered during the May um, recommended budget and the June uh, budget uh, hearings. And um, that would be an appropriate time period to consider it. Okay, so thank you. I, I thought initially what you were saying, at least from the way I understood it, was you wanted to allocate the money now, so, which would be this current fiscal year. Yes, what I don't want to do is I don't want to wait till May or June of next year to tell the fire district you have money to support fire protection in South County. What I'm trying to do now is get a commitment for those dollars. And yes, it would be in the next, our next fiscal year and the fire district's next fiscal year. Okay, well, that's a different, different, uh, perception than what I had. So to go sure. back to Supervisor Smidian, um, if that's the plan, um, there's no problem with needing to take out four and a half million because that would be, if the board votes for this, that would be something that we would build into the recommended budget. Yes, and through the chair in response to the county executive's uh, direction, my um, my point earlier, and forgive me if I didn't make it clearly, was Dr. Smith, we, and I remember Supervisor Ellenberg uh, struggling with 
the direction from administration that you know the the May budget uh, conversation wasn't the time for making final budget decisions in June. And so then the question is, well, if we, you know, if we if we can't do it in the last week of June and we can't really do it in May, it, you know, I think it's incumbent on us then as board members to direct the administration to craft a budget that that allocates those funds. So I think what Mr. Wasserman's motion was and what I was intending to second was that uh, you know, we, yes, we want to try all of these other solutions, except for the Williamson Act, but then a four and a half million dollar uh, budget uh, allocation, um, getting direction from our board today, which presumably if you got the direction you would follow to present a budget allocation to us that had four and a half million dollars from the public safety sales tax for the upcoming year. and. To Mr. Wasserman's point, you know, we wait until May or June. That's not going to work in terms of fire safety for South County. I, I believe Cal Fire is negotiating a, a two-year contract even as we speak and is, you know, very close right. to getting that that signed. So how the heck they're gonna be able to put a two-year contract in place and ensure fire safety going forward right. if they don't know whether the money's there? I do not know. That's why it's a direction to put it in the budget. Well, right. And I guess I was confused when there was a direction to come back in November with an allocation because um, you can't allocate for next year in November, but you can certainly as a board um, make the commitment that it's going to be in the recommended budget. If you tell me to put it in the recommended budget, I'll put it in the recommended budget. Thank you. Mr. But it's Williams? different than allocating it now. <laughs> Mr. Williams, you have an additional comment? I was just about to make the point that the county executive just made, which is legally the appropriation uh, doesn't occur until the budget. So this would just be direction to administration to then bring a budget that would actually be adopted by the board, not until May or June, because you can't appropriate outside of the current fiscal year. So the motion then is to direct administration to put this into the 23-24 budget. That is sufficient? James? Jeff? That is sufficient. That's sufficient. Thank you. Second, uh, Supervisor Smitty, is that all right with you? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. Thank you. I just go back to my questions because obviously we are trying to fund the district. I think we are all in agreement that this funding needs to be provided. South County question is how uh, and I certainly do believe that uh, this being discussed at the main budget uh, next year makes a lot of sense. Uh, but for the ideas that's been proposed uh, by the administration, the fee for service and reimbursement, uh, the cost sharing agreement, uh, even ballot bond measures, and also the uh, increased development impact fees, all those apparently require some type of a discussion uh, before this can happen. Can can I add that to the motion as the, to ask the administration to proceed on these areas? I, I don't want to mess with the Williamson Act, like like you mentioned, Mr. President Wasserman. Nobody's going to touch that one, so I certainly am not. Uh, if those could be uh, added uh, as something that they could come back to us, Supervisor Lee, if you yes. could, if you could for me repeat what it was. Sure. That you want yeah. you wanted added on. Right. Yeah. So the four things, the four strategies as identified in our staff report were number one, fee for service reimbursement. Number two, cost sharing agreements with the South County cities like Morgan Hill and Gilroy. Number three is a uh, potential bond measure. And number four is the uh, uh, development impact fee. So uh, I would like to, to uh, ask the, the staff to go back and look into uh, the feasibility uh, and, now, and the, the, the analysis of these uh, strategies so that when this comes back to us for our uh, uh, full uh, evaluation next year, uh, we have a better understanding where it's at and what those are actually feasible uh, ways to help pay for all this. Thank you. Thank you. That is fine. I just want to end up with direction from the board that four and a half million will be there um, yes. for their budget in the 23-24 year. Supervisor Simidian. Sorry, that's from earlier, I apologize. No problem, Vice President Ellenberg. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, for the record, Supervisor Chavez had a hard stop, so she needed to leave. David, roll call vote, please, of the four members. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Uh, Supervisor Chavez is not in the room. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Going to abstain. President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So that passes three zero one. Uh, Mr. President, oh, my apologies. Never mind. There was a hand up from one of the staff members, but it looks like uh, it looks like one of uh, Supervisor Chavez's staff members had their hands up, but it looks okay. like it has been lowered. Never mind. My apologies. Okay, so that person does not wish to speak at this time. They do not. Okay, okay thank you. We now move on. David, correct me if I'm wrong. To 35 and 36, hearing them together, and that is the final agenda item. That is what I have in my notes as well. Yes. Thank you. And let me move to 35. Supervisor uh, Wasserman, are we going to take this item uh, combined? I can't recall. Forget yes, we are. 35 and 36 will be heard together. And anybody wishing to speak, you can speak about 35 and 36 at the same time. Uh, Mr. Williams. Item number 35 is an ordinance and 36 is a board policy in response to a referral from Supervisor Simidian uh, related to um, privacy issues. Uh, we're happy to answer questions. And I know that Supervisor Simidian had some minor uh, modifications to the resolution, which we had an opportunity to review and which have been posted to the agenda and look fine. Wonderful. Uh, so I'll Thank leave you. it at that for now. Thank you. We have no public speaker, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. Can you I? Like uh, what I would like to do is take action today on just the resolution uh, on the policy matter, which is the policy on the county's privacy office. This was Exhibit A on item number 36, I believe. And you should all have received, colleagues, a redlined copy with some minor rearrangement of language as Mr. Williams uh, just referenced. I want to move approval of that revised language and ask that uh, at our next meeting, the ordinance come back. And Mr. Williams, the, uh, the, the changes I wanna suggest in the ordinance are relatively modest, but because it's an ordinance, I didn't want to try and do it on the fly today. So if you can bear with me, colleagues, I will find the uh, direction that I want to include in my motion. Um, Mr. Williams, uh, the, um, the direction would be to return with a uh, slightly revised ordinance that mentions the privacy office uh, in the findings and in the requirements uh, for county departments. Uh, and I understand the desire not to embed the formal term privacy office as a, uh, an ordinance mandated operation, but I think referencing its existence, there's no mention of it at all in the ordinance, which I think does it a disservice does uh, us a disservice. So I would like to see in the findings something along the lines of, you know, and whereas in, in an effort to ensure the privacy protection uh, the board has created or the county has created a privacy office, and then in the requirements for county departments, some kind of direction that to the extent necessary and appropriate, <laughs> county departments shall confer with the uh, uh, privacy office and or, you know, its successor agencies, however constituted, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, finally, let me just say thank you uh, and give a little shout out. I very much appreciated uh, the language that spoke to the compelling privacy issues around reproductive rights that are contained in the document. I'm glad to see those there. But just those two additions in the resolution, uh, excuse me, in the ordinance, uh, would be my direction if I can get a second for that direction to come back with those two uh, minor changes and then to take action today on the policy regarding uh, county privacy office. 
a second. Oh, you had three seconds there. I think Supervisor Lee got in first. Anything else, Supervisor Smidian? That's it. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, would have been a happy second uh, as well. I want to thank staff for the response to Supervisor Smidian's referral and, and, and uh, as he did call out particularly the addition of the new section in the privacy ordinance uh, related to reproductive health care. Uh, the actions that our county continues to take at the local level to protect access to those services and protection of, of that type of information um, is, is really significant. And uh, just want to call that out with appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Yeah, first, I just want to say also thank you for this uh, very uh, well written report. Um, this information is certainly very helpful for us to understand what we have in place. Uh, and I do have a, a few comments and, uh, and a follow up question. The, the report highlights the board's policy in the role of the privacy officer. As supervisors, we are always concerned when collecting information from the community and protecting this information. Um, recently, uh, Supervisor Allenberg and myself have requested the information on the database that all officers could opt into. Um, what type of impact would this have and will some of these safeguards be in place if we move forward on that, uh, on that uh, request? Is there an answer? This um, is Lisa Harrison, uh, Supervisors, Lead Deputy County Council. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Lisa. Um, the um, ordinance applies to county departments, uh, not directly to board offices. I believe, Supervisor Lee, are you asking about a constituent relationship management system? Yeah, it's, yeah exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so the ordinance applies to uh, county departments, not the board. Not to, okay, all right. Thank you very much. And that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Smith. No, go ahead and go vote. Ahead. I just, I just want to say something after you're done voting. Okay, no other questions. We'll take a roll call vote, please, Dave. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez is absent. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. Thank you. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'll we'll finish that with our clerk, Dr. Smith. I just want to make it clear the action you took on the previous item does not require us to come back in November or December. It's completed and we'll address it with the recommended budget in May. I, I would say yes to that. You just need to review. I believe Supervisor Lee uh, confirmed looking at the three or four other alternatives. You can bring those back in May as well. But at the end of the day, the direction from the boards that four and a half million would come somewhere from next year's budget, but the fire district can count on that. Do you concur, Dr. Smith? Yes, I just didn't want the November and December um, action to be confused in your correct. original motion. Correct. Thank you. Yes, that is, you are correct. That ends those two items. Dave, we had nothing removed from consent. So we're at adjournment unless any supervisor has any other comment he or she wishes to make. Seeing none, I'm going to say have a good evening, everyone, and uh, quite a feisty agenda today. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Recording stopped. Thank you all for attending. And with that, this meeting room will be closed.